Fudge and Felonies, Frosted Misfortunes Book 2 Written by Lisa Seifert Narrated by Trista Shea Chapter 1 There were two things that my Abyssinian cat, Lucky, loved more than anything. One was playing fetch with his little red fuzzy ball, and the other was chasing red string and mincing it with his razor kitty claws. Unfortunately for Brittany Westerhide, my high school nemesis and Clover Creek's resident mean girl, the red ribbons she so elaborately incorporated into her hair very closely resembled the red shoelaces he so loved attacking. Letting out a loud shriek, she started shaking her head, as if he would simply fall off. But the extra movement only made Lucky dig in deeper. Get this flea-infested rat off me! She screamed, her once perfectly quaffed blonde curls, now a miserable mess of tangles. Will you take over the line? I asked my best friend Ruby, who was working inside the frosted cupcake truck and helping me out. She gave me the thumbs up as she made her way from the frosting table in the back to the window up front. I jumped out of the truck and ran over to Brittany. She was fifth in line for a stuffed cupcake from my truck at the Blueberry Bay County Fair, and fairly close. Come here, little guy, I said, pulling out a red shoelace from my pocket and dangling it alluringly in front of Lucky. The only thing he loved more than stationary red string was moving red string. I picked up some of the ribbon strands that fell out of Brittany's hair and waved them in front of Lucky. Taking the bait, he leapt into my arms. Brittany did her best to recover from Lucky's unintended efforts to sabotage her hair, but it looked pretty hopeless. Her braids were no longer braided, her curls were no longer curly, and the glittery red ribbons looked like they would never be untangled. He shouldn't even be here. What is a food vendor's cat doing inside her food truck? Asked Brittany. That violates so many health codes. What are red glitter ribbons doing in a grown woman's hair? I asked, trying to shake off the glitter that now covered my arms. That violates so many fashion rules. Brittany Westerhide and I were the same age. We graduated from Clover Creek High School together over ten years ago, where she ceaselessly endeavored to make my life miserable. Until just recently, I was safely hidden from her mean girl clutches on the other side of the country in San Diego, California. I'd almost forgotten how unpleasant it was to be around her. I didn't mean to be rude, but she somehow managed to bring out the snark in me. Do you know nothing? They're the Clover Creek High School colors. They asked the beauty pageant contestant finalists to include something red in their ensemble for the photos. She said, pulling up her phone and showing me an Instagram post of her and other women wearing red and white clothes and accessories. I guess not. I didn't even know Clover Creek was big enough to hold beauty pageants. I said, throwing my hands up in defense of further insults. It wasn't. Not until Marcus Palmer decided to sponsor one this year, said Brittany. Who's that? I asked. Was he the mayor? A full three months had passed since I returned to Clover Creek, but I'd been too busy with first trying to prove my innocence as a murder suspect and then staging a grand reopening of the Frosted Bakery that I hardly had a chance to watch the news. I also avoided social media like the plague. Brittany held up a fancy smartwatch gadget and said, Hello? Palmer Tech smartwatches? Still no clue. Like I wanted a watch I had to charge every night? My watch should work for me, not the other way around. I shrugged my shoulders and threw my palms up in defeat yet again. Oh my gosh, you really do know nothing. Marcus Palmer is only the biggest tech billionaire in the entire world, she said flashing me her phone. The picture she pulled up was of an incredibly hot guy that looked more like a supermodel than a boring businessman. For some reason, I assumed everyone who made billions had to be boring. Clearly, I was wrong. Whoa, is he single? I blurted out. Right. 
because a man sponsoring a beauty pageant wants to date an out of shape woman who bakes desserts and serves them from the back of a truck for a living, said Brittany, satirically emphasizing the word beauty. I heard your own fiancé turn out to be a no-show at your wedding. I deserved that after I pretty much asked her to insult me with my last outburst. If I bothered to worry that people might have stopped talking about my prior wedding humiliation in San Diego, I was now assured that it was still very much alive. That was in January. It was now April. Surely it had to eventually become old news. Restraining my first impulse to let Lucky loose on her again, I smiled instead and offered her a free cupcake to compensate for her run-in with the cat. I had no idea where the kill-them-with-kindness advice originated, but that seemed to do the trick. Brittany immediately perked up and picked out a dozen cupcakes more than the single free one I initially offered. I didn't bother charging her for the extras. The lost revenue was well worth being free of her negative aura. I quickly boxed them up for her, eager for her to leave as soon as humanly possible. She picked up her cupcake box to go, but turned around to add one more insult. You know, Ava, the best revenge after a man dumps you is to look good. You might want to try a little harder to improve your body shape, makeup, hair, and those awful clothes. Was this friendly gal pal advice? I thought the best revenge was living a happy life, I asked. Don't be ridiculous. It's all in the looks. That's all men care about. You need to stop listening to Ruby. She'll only bring you down to her loser level. She said, throwing a snide look towards my best friend. Ruby was busy manning the ever-growing cupcake line, so I hoped she hadn't heard Brittany's comment. I might have gotten annoyed if I hadn't known Brittany since kindergarten. That was the reason she had no friends. She really thought her words of wisdom were helpful. Thank you for your sage advice, I said mockingly, although Brittany misinterpreted my jest as a real compliment. Her entire demeanor changed. Do you really think so? I've been practicing so I can take over as head pageant coach next year when Katarina quits and moves back to Russia. I could work here in Clover Creek or possibly somewhere altogether new. The pageant committee flies coaches all over the world, she said looking up at the sky and possibly envisioning herself going first class or in a private jet to a new pageant location. What does being a pageant coach entail? I asked, trying harder to be nice. My pageant coach always says you need to eliminate the competition by any means necessary, so that's what you help contestants do. You point out all of their flaws with laser-like precision so they can start eliminating them. Like, instead of saying you're annoying, I would explain that you lack the art of small talk, have nothing of interest to share with others, and are of little consequence because your best friend, Ruby, is just as boring as you are. You know, things that you could try to work on and fix. Oh, I see. Well, thank you for that helpful list of flaws I need to correct. I said, with as much sincerity as I could muster. You're very welcome. I'm a total shoe-in for the Miss Congeniality Award in this pageant. She said, smiling to herself. I guessed delusion came in all forms. Maybe when you deliver your helpful advice, you could sandwich it between compliments and say something nice, then deliver your words of wisdom and finish it off with something positive or hopeful. I suggested even though getting advice from me was probably the last thing she wanted. People like Brittany wanted to hear compliments exclusively, but she sounded really sincere and excited about becoming a pageant coach. Bored now, she said, making a fake and exaggerated yawning noise, which, despite knowing better, I allowed to annoy me. On the plus side, this time she actually did leave. Just when I thought Brittany couldn't outdo herself in the mean girl department, she did. She managed to insult both me and my best friend, and did it completely unprovoked. It was like high school all over again. 
Maybe after another decade, she'd finally grow up. As if on cue, my loyal BFF Ruby jumped over and gave me one of her famous Hardison family bear hugs. The kind that makes you feel truly loved and suffocated, both at the same time. A huge lungful of air helped carry me through. Another trick I learned. Thought you might need one of those after having to talk to Brittany Westerhide, Ruby said. What did she say? Not much. Mostly chastised me for the lucky attack on her hair. I said. Nothing good could come out of relaying my Brittany conversation back to Ruby. Brittany was mean to me all through high school, but especially cruel when it came to Ruby. She never admitted it, but I think Brittany was the source of the bulk of Ruby's conversations with her therapist. But she didn't mention anything about me? I thought I saw her looking over at me in the truck. She asked. Before I had to think of another evasive tactic, I was saved by a loudspeaker announcing that the fireworks show would be starting soon down by the wharf. I just need a few minutes to clean up the truck after I make it through this last batch of customers walking over from the Ferris wheel, and then we can head out to watch the fireworks, I said, ignoring her last Brittany question. Okay, sure, she said. I grabbed a towel to wipe off the glitter, but it stuck to me like glue. Switching to a dishwashing brush, I tried to scrub it off, which kind of helped, but not really. It looked like I would be glittered up the rest of the night. Lucky came to the same conclusion. He was still attempting to clean himself, but remained a glittery red kitty despite his persistent licking. Did you know that Clover Creek now hosts beauty pageants? I asked Ruby while a couple decided what cupcakes to buy. Yes, I'd been working closely with its founder, Marcus Palmer, on ensuring the event and the contestants, she said. He's actually waiting in line right now for a cupcake. Ruby pointed to a tall man at the back of the line with broad shoulders, who was wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses. He had on a pair of khakis, a heather gray t-shirt and tennis shoes. Nice guy was written all over him. He looked more like the boy next door than a super billionaire genius. Not that I could possibly know what a super billionaire genius might look like. But I imagined something more aligned with silk cravats, a mahogany walking cane, and an English butler standing next to him as an accessory. By the time he got to the front of the line, we were pretty much out of everything. My county fair cupcake sales quadrupled what they normally were on any given weekend back at the bakery in town square. Once word spread that I stuffed them with pudding, vanilla, candy, caramel, and Nutella, I was pretty much sold out by early afternoon each day. I hired extra bakers to make a double batch, since today was the last day, and unnecessarily worried they wouldn't all sell. Marcus was the last customer, and I was down to two cupcakes. Ruby ran out of the truck and hugged Marcus before she introduced me. This is my super talented bestie, Ava Decker. She's the one that makes those amazing stuffed cupcakes I was telling you about. Hi, I'm Marcus, and I've heard so much about your cupcakes. Not just from Ruby, but pretty much everyone in town raves about them. I can't wait to try one, he said, shaking my hand. I wasn't sure if it was because he was a billionaire or the Hollywood smile that flashed across his face, but I felt a little spark go through me when our hands touched. It was like the perfect handshake, friendly but confident, firm and strong, but not overpowering and painful. Why was I overanalyzing a friendly handshake? Ruby cleared her throat when I said nothing. I think he's waiting for you to sell him a cupcake, she said suddenly looking down at her phone and pretending she needed to take a call before she walked away. Right. I was actually just about to close so Ruby and I could go watch the fireworks. I only have two cupcakes left. A salted caramel stuffed vanilla cupcake or a molten chocolate lava cupcake. Which one will it be? I asked. He looked over his shoulder and saw there was no one else waiting in line. Everyone had already headed for the wharf area to get a good spot to watch the fireworks. Obviously both, 
he said. Great, I said, packaging them up in a cream-colored frosted box with some napkins. I'm not sure what came over me, but I took one of Lucky's red satin ribbons and tied it around the box with a big bow like one of those old-timey parcels. I wanted it to look prettier for him. Or maybe I wanted me to look prettier. After he took the box, he started to hand me a $20 bill, but I deflected. It's on the house, I said. I felt silly treating someone so rich to something as trivial as two cupcakes, but he seemed to appreciate it and graciously thanked me. What brought you to Clover Creek? I was born here, he said. Me too. I don't remember going to school with a Marcus Palmer, and there's only one school district in all of Clover Creek. I replied. I thought I knew everyone in Clover Creek. All right, maybe not everyone, but anyone as good-looking as Marcus would definitely have been someone I wouldn't forget. My parents died in a car accident when my sister and I were pretty young, and we moved to live with my aunt in Silicon Valley, he said. I've always wanted to move back here. Oh, I'm so sorry. That must have been really tough. How do you like Clover Creek so far? I asked. I had been to Silicon Valley once for a wedding. It seemed way more modern and hip than Clover Creek. I love it. Everyone has been so nice and welcoming. I'm excited about small town living, he said. That was new. The only reason I could imagine for relocation from somewhere as fancy as Silicon Valley to Clover Creek was because you wanted to run away from something. Like the ultimate bridal rejection and subsequent humiliation. The concept of moving here for the fun of it seemed unfathomable. I heard you're sponsoring the beauty pageant, I said, hoping he would clarify his motivation. Most billionaires bought sports teams when they became rich instead of sponsoring small-town beauty pageants. It's for my little sister. She's on a mission to become the next Miss America, like our mother, who was born and raised here in Clover Creek. So here is where my little sister wants to be crowned, he explained. Of all the things he could have said, I was definitely not expecting that answer. Having a former Miss America as a mom justified his supermodel good looks. It also elucidated why following in her mother's footsteps would be so important to his sister. They both sounded like genuinely nice people who just wanted to reach out to their parents in spirit. I really needed to reassess my billionaire stereotypes. But I guessed this was what happened when you knew no real-life billionaires to shatter them. That's cool. Is she here now? I asked, looking around. My sister's pageant coach is pretty strict and insists she do pageant prep stuff all night. Do you care if I tag along with you and Ruby to watch the fireworks? He asked, gesturing widely with his cupcake box from the truck to the wharf, where the fireworks show was already starting. Of course not, that would be great, I said, hoping I wasn't beaming with the world's dorkiest schoolgirl crush smile. He barely knew me. Maybe he was only here to see Ruby and I should have let the two of them attend the fireworks show alone. While I was pondering whether or not Marcus's invitation was a sign of flirting with me or Ruby or neither of us, Lucky interpreted Marcus's ribbon-waving gesture as a sign that Marcus wanted to play with him. Using my shoulder as a launching pad, Lucky pounced on Marcus with all four pounds of his little kitty body which you'd think wasn't a whole lot. But he left a huge slash across Marcus's t-shirt where he landed before relaunching himself to snag the box ribbon. I'm so sorry, I said, running out of the truck to retrieve Lucky and save Marcus's t-shirt and shoulders from further kitty damage. Lucky, get back here right now. Completely ignoring me, Lucky dug his claws into Marcus's forearm using it as his new base of operations and gnawing on the red ribbon. Aw, the little guy just wants the string, he said, untying it and flinging it around for the cat. That was the total opposite of what I thought he would say or how he'd react. 
Most of the local townspeople tolerated Lucky and his crazy puppy-like antics, but a huge beware of cat sign was dutifully posted on the front door of Frosted, warning anyone who entered. Newcomers were a little put off to discover that Frosted doubled as a cat cafe, where Lucky and other four-legged furry friends were allowed to roam freely. But most were definitely annoyed when Lucky tipped over one of their lattes or stepped into a cupcake mid-bite. None were happy when he ruined their clothes. I set a separate fund aside for Lucky mishaps. Your shirt, I said, pointing to the gaping rip that revealed some pretty muscular deltoids. The decimated t-shirt was made from a super thin material, probably by some expensive designer that I'd now have to reimburse him for. I will totally replace that. Lucky goes crazy over playing fetch. I have about 10,000 more of these back in our warehouse, he said, pointing to his company logo on the sleeve. It was a watch with a techie-looking gadget drawn around it. Oh, gotcha, I said, nodding my head yes, although in reality, I had no idea what his company did. The first time I saw his logo was on the watch Brittany showed me, but pretending I did recognize it, seemed like the polite thing to do. Brittany reacted like I was an alien when I told her I never heard of Marcus Palmer. Not that he seemed to have such a huge ego that he'd be offended to learn I never heard of him or his company. But I also didn't want to appear like I was pretending not to know he was rich. That might make it seem like I was trying too hard to be his pal. Wow, I was way beyond overthinking this whole thing. I made a mental note to research Marcus Palmer and his company later. Plus, I love cats, especially the ones that play fetch, he said, throwing the ribbon out into the field for Lucky to retrieve. Are you sure? I asked. This was actually good. Hopefully Lucky would get so tired out from playing fetch, he'd sit quietly for the fireworks show. I forgot to bring his leash but he'd been pretty good about learning how to heal lately. Kind of. Positive. He smiled back, throwing the string again a few times. I like the matching red glitter on you and Lucky. I didn't know you were in the pageant, he said, pointing to my arms. Oh, that was an accident. Hopefully some heavy-duty exfoliating scrub can remove it later tonight, I said, trying to wipe my arms on my jeans. Ha! Take that, Brittany Westerhide. Marcus Palmer thought I was a beauty pageant contestant. I held my head a little higher, pulled my shoulders back, and put on my most dazzling smile. I'm going to lock up and then we can go. Could you watch Lucky for me? I'll be really fast. He gave me the thumbs up and resumed playing fetch with the cat. I checked the back of the cupcake truck for Ruby but she was nowhere to be seen. Was she really on the phone? Since we were clearly sold out, it didn't take me long to clean up the truck and lock it down for the night. Ten minutes later, still no Ruby, so I texted her to hurry up and come back stat. Ruby finally reappeared, but she came from a totally new direction. I guessed she really wanted to make sure Marcus and I had plenty of time to get to know each other. Are we ready? she asked. Yes, and Marcus is going to join us, I said, my voice involuntarily rising a couple octaves. Great, Ruby replied, acting surprised, even though I knew that was her master plan all along. It was an unusually warm day for April in Clover Creek, Maine. Ruby was wearing a bright blue sundress with a fuzzy cardigan on top. It matched her dazzling blue eyes and black hair perfectly. I suddenly felt underdressed. Choosing function over fashion, I had on my most comfortable pair of jeans, sneakers, and a cream-colored Frosted Company t-shirt. Since Ruby volunteered to help me out in the cupcake truck, I told her she could wear whatever she wanted. Come on, Lucky, I said, giving the heel command. It was dark out, but I assumed his nighttime cat vision allowed him to see my hand. 
Lucky fell into line and we headed off towards the wharf. By the time we arrived, it was pretty tightly packed and there were no open spots. I don't see any spots in the main area, do you? asked Marcus. I leapt up onto the railing separating the boardwalk from the wharf area to get a better look. Careful, said Marcus, coming behind me. It's fine. Ruby and I used to be cheerleaders. We're used to perching on top of human pyramids all the time, I said, throwing my leg out into a small stag leap to demonstrate. Unfortunately, a bicyclist chose that very moment to roll by at warp speed, knocking me off balance. I let out a small scream, my arms flailing like a windmill. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the worst. But a strong pair of arms cradled me just when I thought I was going to eat it on the concrete below. Oh no, said Ruby. Lucky, come back. Apparently, Brittany wasn't the only one with red ribbon school spirit. The bicycle that zoomed past had a long string of red tassels trailing behind it. As trained, Lucky took off like a cheetah after it. Before I had a chance to thank Marcus for saving me from a million broken bones, he set me down and we all took off after Lucky. Lucky, heal! I screamed, but to no avail. The cat was on a mission. We tried yelling for the cyclist to stop, but when he looked back and saw three people and a cat chasing him, he doubled down and went faster instead. I couldn't really fault him. I would have done the same. Thankfully, one of the red bike tassels got caught on a tree branch as he turned a corner, and Lucky paused to attack it. Out of breath, we were all sucking in air and holding our sides when we finally caught up to the cat. As if on cue, Lucky ran up to Marcus and brought him the red tassel, which he dropped at his feet. Good kitty, he said, kneeling down and patting his head. On the plus side... This looks like a great spot for watching the fireworks, I said, still out of breath. I looked up at the sky where we now had a clear view and plenty of space. Great, said Ruby. Marcus and I will go back and get the blankets we dropped when we ran after Lucky and meet you back here. Sounds good, I said as they took off, giving them a thumbs up. Unlike Ruby and her daily morning jogs, that was my cardio for the week. I gave her a silent thank you for doing the extra cardio by offering to get the blankets. Little Kitty Claus scratched my ankle, but I ignored him. I was checking the grass for any rocks before we spread our blanket out. Upon not getting instant recognition, Lucky dug in and crawled up my legs to my chest with yet another red ribbon. I was about to throw it for him, until it sparkled under the moonlight, and I stopped. This one had glitter like the ones Brittany was wearing before. Oh, Lucky, not more glitter, I said, pocketing the culprit before it left more glitter on my already shimmering arms. Annoyed, he jumped off, ran behind the tree, and came back with another red glitter ribbon. Where are you getting these? I asked, retracing Lucky's steps behind the tree. I only saw her from behind, but it was obviously Brittany. She was sitting down and leaning against the tree. Her hair still hadn't recovered from her last run-in with Lucky, as she apparently unceremoniously dumped all twelve of the cupcakes I'd given her onto the ground. Such a waste. I could have sold those to someone much more deserving. I stalked my way over to confront her. No more Miss Nice Girl pushover. Did you take all the cupcakes out of sheer spite? I asked, seeing only one bite gone from one cupcake. You didn't even try the other eleven flavors you insisted on taking. When she didn't respond, I could feel myself getting angrier as I clomped my way closer to her. Hey, I'm talking to you, I said, giving her shoulder a good shove. Her body fell over like a sack of potatoes. No. Please don't be dead, I urgently begged the universe in my mind. I dreaded my need to know the answer, but I still walked around and pulled out my phone flashlight. 
When the light shone on her face, it was obvious. Staring back at me were Brittany's lifeless eyes. One of her beloved red glitter ribbons was tied around her neck, but not like a cute necklace, more like a murder by strangulation way. I was totally freaking out, but I somehow still managed to check for her pulse just in case. Nothing. Chapter 2 I never expected Ruby to start jumping up and down with glee, but the distraught look on her face was completely out of character for someone whose arch-nemesis was just killed. Are you okay? It can be weird seeing a dead body for the first time, I said, putting my arm around her shoulder. Not that I was a pro at it, but this was my third time, and I was still in shock. It's not that. I mean, it's awful that she's dead. But I always thought we'd make up someday and become best friends like those teen movies where the bad guy turns out to have a heart of gold. I thought maybe we'd become neighbors and go out for coffee together after PTA meetings, she said. Now that can never happen. She'll always be the bad guy. Oh, Ruby and her rom-com movies that transformed the bad guy into a good guy by the end. She believed in happily ever afters for everyone, even mean girls like Brittany. Well, I'm sure that would have happened in another 20, 30, or 40 years from now if she were still alive, I replied. I supposed anything was possible, even if Hollywood hadn't written the script. I opened up my jacket to check on Lucky. He'd fallen asleep in his little kitty Bjorn that was strapped to my chest. He popped his head out and I reached in to rub his face. Why don't you check on Aunt Ruby? I whispered into his ear. I bet she could use some kitty kisses. I had no idea if he could understand me, but I pointed at Ruby as I sent my best subliminal messages to his tiny kitty brain. Lucky put out his paw and stroked Ruby's arm until she reached out to hold him. He crawled from the Bjorn into her arms. He rubbed his warm head against her neck and started to purr. Good kitty, I said, giving him another scratch on his neck. Marcus hung up his phone and came over, draping a warm fuzzy blanket across my shoulders and another one over Ruby and Lucky. Thanks. Did you find your sister? Is she okay? I asked. I doubted Brittany's death was pageant-related, but who knew? Marcus's first concern was tracking his sister down to make sure she was safe. Yes, she and all the other pageant contestants are safely back at their homes. Their pageant coach, Katerina, is pretty strict about making sure they all left right away. My driver is dropping my sister off right now before coming back to get us, he said. Or we could take my helicopter. Whichever you prefer. Oh, that's so sweet of you. But Ruby and I can call a ride, Cher. I said. Was that the proper protocol? I never met anyone with their own chauffeur. And for sure, the option of taking a private helicopter never once crossed my mind. It was probably right up there with borrowing someone's personal butler. All of which I had zero experience with. Please, it would make me feel so much better knowing that you both got home safely, he explained. I shrugged my shoulders. It would be pretty difficult to get a ride share from this location anyway. And besides, I was still a little shook up about the whole thing. Okay, well let me check and see if the police need anything else from us before we go, I said to Marcus, Ruby and Lucky. Which one? The car or the helicopter? asked Marcus, taking out his phone and preparing to dial. The car will be more than sufficient, but thank you for offering your private helicopter, I said. Let's add that to the list of things I never thought I'd say to someone, right after the discovery of my third dead body in one year. After we found Brittany's body, we flagged down a police officer working the fireworks event. There was now a small sea of uniformed officers, paramedics, and crime scene investigators gathered around us. We'd all given our official statements to the police already, but a detective had yet to show up to the crime scene. 
I walked over to one of the crime scene investigators and asked, Should we provide impressions of our shoe prints so you can compare them to the other foot traffic in the area? He beamed his flashlight in my face, nearly blinding me. Lady, are you crazy? Hundreds of people have trampled in and out of this area to get to the fireworks show, not to mention wheelchairs and strollers. He moved his light over to the area nearby, showing the drag marks. And it's grass, not soft mud. Sounds like you've been watching too much TV. That last part was true. When it came to mystery shows and movies, I was a bona fide aficionado of them all. And he did have a good point. Grass couldn't retain shoe prints, but I felt helpless just standing there doing nothing. Didn't finding a body make it my responsibility to ensure that the killer was caught? It's okay. She's just an overly active and concerned citizen, said a voice I recognized too well. Officer Wesley Lockwood had arrived at the crime scene, but remained on the other side of the yellow caution tape, so I went up to him. I hadn't seen much of him since the last murder investigation I somehow got myself entangled in. It had been at least two months since I last saw or heard from him, but he still looked as handsome and super buff as ever. Wesley was a die-hard fitness fanatic who never consumed sugar, which was the only thing on the menu at Frosted. Hey you, I said with a warm smile. It was nice to see a familiar face. What is it with you and your habit of always stumbling upon murder victims? He asked. I'm pretty sure three times in one year do not qualify as a habit, I said. Otherwise, if that were the case, I could call myself a marathon runner in training for the three times I let Ruby coerce me into joining her on a morning jog. Actually, Lucky is the one that found her. Lucky? He asked. My cat? The one that you gave me, I reminded him. Wesley tricked me into taking this stray cat by pretending it would go to the pound and be put down if I didn't adopt it right on the spot. Oh, that's right. Your cat that you call an emotional support animal so that you can bring him with you everywhere you go, he said, using air quotes for the words emotional support animal. First of all, it's official. He's registered as one, and I have to. He has separation anxiety. He gets scared when he's alone in the house all by himself. I replied, and I had the ravaged furniture to prove it. I even had to get special double locks installed. The little guy could open doors and escape whenever I left him alone at home. I'm pretty sure that's not the intention of emotional support animals, he said. Well, it should be. Pets needed just as much emotional support as people, if not more. I was about to point that out when I saw the medics carrying Brittany's body away right in front of me. My eyes never left the white sheet that covered her. It made me sad, despite knowing she wasn't the world's greatest person. I told Wesley the rest of what happened and how we came across her body. Can someone corroborate your story? Wesley asked. Uh, yeah, I was with Ruby and Marcus, I said, pointing at them. He nodded. I was definitely not a murder suspect this time. Thank goodness. Meeting Wesley and adopting Lucky were the only silver linings to that incident, which I'd never wish upon anyone. I guessed Marcus really was famous, because Wesley didn't even probe me for his last name or ask who he was. Aren't you going to take some notes? I asked, when he simply nodded his head. He always had his handy black pleather notepad and blue felt-tip pen with him. Maybe he was too tired to remember. He seemed fatigued, even though he'd just arrived on the scene. It's not my case, he said, as if he were reading my mind. That was odd. But you're the only detective in all of Clover Creek. I argued. The town was growing, but not fast enough to justify the budget for two detectives. We also had an extremely low crime rate. Clover Creek was a relatively quiet, safe place to live and raise a family in. Everyone knew everyone else or their associates. 
conflict of interest, he said. I was actually on my way here to meet her. Oh, for information on another case? I asked. I hadn't heard of another murder, but he served as the detective for all of Blueberry Bay, which included many towns, not just Clover Creek. Wesley looked down at the ground, kicked a couple pebbles, and buried his hands into the front pockets of his jeans. For a date. Yikes! I did my best to squash the mortified look of horror on my face and just replied with, Oh, I didn't know you were dating someone. Not that it's any of my business or that you can't date anyone without me knowing. I just, um, wow, so Brittany? I never would have put the two of you together. But then again, I'm not a matchmaker, so what do I know? That's your grandmother. She's the matchmaker. Is she the one that set the two of you up? Wow, why couldn't I stop talking like a crazy, jealous person? We'd never even gone out on a single date, and here I was acting like he owed me an explanation, or a heads up or something. I guessed I always expected to resume our previous flirtation, once Wesley settled into his new detective role, and I had frosted more established. But I guessed I was wrong. Any tiny bit of guilt I might have felt for flirting with Marcus Palmer instantly evaporated in that second. Clearly, there were no lingering feelings on Wesley's part, none at all for me. It just sort of happened, he said. I couldn't believe he'd be interested in someone as vapid and shallow as Brittany. Not that I claimed any dibs at all on him, but still. I sensed an unspoken chemistry between us after he helped clear me of murder. Maybe that's how all murder suspects felt after they were exonerated. On the plus side, this answered the question of any future what-ifs concerning Officer Wesley Lockwood that I'd been holding on to. Anyone who could possibly be attracted to someone as mean-spirited and self-centered as Brittany was not the guy for me. She was beautiful on the outside, but I couldn't believe he'd completely overlook everything that was on the inside. Well, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sure this is a huge shock. Is there anything I can do for you? I asked after taking a deep breath and finally getting over myself and my silly police officer crush. Thanks, but we only started seeing each other a couple months ago. He said, as if that would make it less awful to lose someone. Well, I'm here if you need someone to talk to. I said with a heartfelt smile. His choice in women aside, Wesley was still a nice guy who was there for me when I needed him. Get yourself checked out. You look terrible, he said, making a poor attempt of a joke to try and lighten the mood. I sighed and gave a weak half laugh. One of the other police officers spotted him and reminded Wesley that he wasn't allowed to be here and risked being arrested for contaminating the crime scene. I can vouch for him. I was with Wesley the whole time. He never once moved from his spot behind the yellow tape, I said. And who are you? asked the officer. It's fine. I was just leaving, said Wesley. Go straight to the station to give your statement on video. I'll meet you there when I'm done here, said the officer. Whoa, is that the detective in charge? I asked. I don't know. I've never seen him before, and they're not telling me anything, said Wesley. Go, called out the officer, looking at Wesley and pointing toward the street. I smiled and waved goodbye to Wesley. He slumped his shoulders down and slowly sauntered away. I had no idea if Wesley was a crier or how serious his relationship with Brittany was, but it looked like he might be a murder suspect. And if that were the case... He would need my help to clear his name and solve this. I walked up to one of the medical examiners as they were about to close the ambulance where Brittany's body lay. Do you happen to know when she was killed? I asked. If I hadn't bothered to clean the cupcake truck or did it a little faster, maybe we could have stumbled onto Brittany's spot a bit sooner. I'd prefer her annoying insults any day over discovering her murdered body. I can't really speak about an ongoing investigation, 
he said, looking uncomfortable. Of course, but I was the one who found her, and I kept thinking, if only had gotten here a little sooner, maybe she'd still be alive. I said, perhaps I could have saved her. That was partially true. More likely, I'd simply suggest to Brittany that we both run away from the killer, rather than trying to fend them off. Wesley never made good on his former promise two months ago to give me self-defense lessons. Based on how Brittany met her demise, maybe he never gave any lessons to her either. The medical examiner softened his look and gave me a small pat on the shoulder. It was at least an hour before you found her. Chapter 3 The best part about inheriting a huge mansion from your dead boss, aside from the obvious benefit of simply inheriting a huge mansion, was the security fence and locked gate that came with it. Gone were the days of surprise media attacks from Tessa at Channel 5 News in Bangor by knocking on my front door. Now she had to ask me to be allowed inside, which was exactly what she was trying to do this morning. The answer is no. I announced to the intercom. No, you didn't find Brittany Westerhide's body last night at the wharf? Or no, you don't want to know what I found out about your ex? She asked. Goodbye, Tessa, I said, flipping the intercom switch off so I could finish my morning vanilla lavender latte in peace. My first month back in Clover Creek was spent being constantly accused of murder on live TV by Tessa and her surprise Channel 5 camera crew out of Bangor, so I didn't feel the least bit of guilt about ignoring her. The one time she offered to do something nice, i.e. covering Frosted's grand reopening, she surprised me by claiming to have gossip about my ex, Ben. I closed the door on that dead end a long time ago, specifically the day he failed to join me at the altar in San Diego and sent his mother to tell me he couldn't make it. This house, the bakery, and all of the people in Clover Creek, Maine, were my new fresh start. Ben was no more than a relic from the past, and that's where I wanted him to stay. Let me guess, Tessa wants to interview you about finding Brittany's body so she can accuse you of murdering her on national TV? Ruby came bounding down the stairs at the tail end of my Tessa brush-off. Yes, we were grown adult women who liked to have sleepovers when we got scared, like after watching a horror movie or finding a dead body. Luckily, my mansion was so huge that Ruby had her own designated permanent guest room. The former owner wore the exact same size as Ruby, too, so she not only benefited from a permanent guest room, but also an entire designer label wardrobe, matching shoes, purses, and other accessories. It was a great outcome since I was a good seven inches taller than Ruby, and everything would have gone to the donation box otherwise. Of course, that and the whole Ben thing, I said. Tessa had been trying to rehash that awful day with me ever since I met her. Her new show was a cross between the crime blotter and a tabloid magazine. Aren't you even the least bit curious about why Ben didn't show up at the church? asked Ruby. She pulled her Vitamixer out and started chopping up vegetables to throw in with her signature spirulina mix. Trying to recruit me into drinking spirulina smoothies with her was something I cleverly tried to avoid. I quickly pulled out an Asiago cheese bagel from the fridge and threw it in the toaster as I saw her about to offer to mix a smoothie for me. I know why he didn't show up, I said. You do? She asked, pausing mid-chop on a celery stalk. Ben is the most indecisive man I ever met. It took him a decade to propose, and at the last minute, he was probably worried that something better might come along, if only he had waited a little longer. I explained. Ben never cheated or had a wandering eye, but he didn't have to. His overbearing, nosy mother did that for him always pointing out other women she personally determined were a better fit than I was. Coming to the church that day to embarrass me by announcing in front of the entire room that her son wouldn't be showing up was probably the happiest moment of her life. 
In the three months since that awful day, I bet she was still reveling in the afterglow of seeing the mortified look on my face. You're just guessing, said Ruby, dismissing my very accurate and most likely correct assumption. True, but he did send me a text before I changed my number, I said. You never told me that. What did it say? She asked. I pulled my bagel out of the toaster and smeared it with chive cream cheese before taking a bite. I don't know what happened. Can we talk? I said, reiterating the words I couldn't seem to get out of my head. How does he not know what happened? I flew six hours across the country for that wedding. All he had to do was drive six minutes up the street, said Ruby, resuming her vegetable chopping with renewed frenzy. She was probably thinking about all the frequent flyer miles she had to cash in for that plane ticket, not to mention the non-returnable bridesmaid dress still hanging in her closet. Tell me about it, I said, taking a now annoyed bite out of my bagel. That was exactly why I didn't want to talk about anything related to Ben. I was getting all worked up about the ten years of my life I wasted on him and the indelible memory of his mother's smug look of satisfaction when she saw me crying at the church. There weren't enough therapy sessions in the world to help me get over that, so I opted to simply forget the whole thing and pretend it never happened. I still feel guilty over all the money everyone wasted traveling to that wedding, not to mention their gifts that I return, which were probably non-returnable once people received them. What are you supposed to do with yet another toaster? I made good use out of mine, said Ruby, pointing to the Vitamixer in front of her. Do you want me to make you a spirulina smoothie too? I tried to restrain the visible shudder that went through me at the thought of liquefying celery stalks and other healthy but sour-tasting greens, but I was a second too late. I thought you loved my spirulina smoothies. She said, looking offended. I do! I exclaimed, even though I didn't. I was just thinking about Ben when you said that. Not your deliciously nutritious, mouth-watering spirulina smoothies. I was saved from further elaboration by Lucky's appearance. He came bounding down the stairs two at a time and crawled his way up my legs, springing onto my shoulder like a parrot, his latest favorite position. Hello, Mr. Sleepyhead, I cooed while rubbing his cute little kitty face. Did that early morning reporter wake you up, too, by pleading for admission through the intercom? I pulled out a carton of lactose-free milk from the fridge and poured it into a small bowl for him on the counter. The purring started immediately. Ruby went over and gave him a quick morning pet before resuming her Ben interrogation. At this point, she was more curious than I was. Great, I'll make you a smoothie, said Ruby, throwing her chopped vegetables into the blender. But I already have a bagel, I said, quickly taking another bite. It's fine, no one ever died from eating too many vegetables, she said with a smile. I had no argument for that, so I simply smiled and replied with, Great, can't wait. Back to Ben. Don't you want to know where he got all the money to make that anonymous donation to the Swiss boarding school? It had to be a lot for them to stop contesting the will, so that you could keep both Frosted and this house free and clear. She said, going back to the fridge to gather more vegetables to chop. I liked to think of the anonymous donation as divine intervention, rather than Ben intervention. This house in the bakery were originally donated to my boss's Swiss boarding school alma mater in a different version of her will. The Swiss boarding school was suing me for their right to both properties until an anonymous donation arrived at their school. They assumed I made the donation and swiftly dropped the lawsuit. I decided looking into it would only mean more trouble, but I guessed Tessa didn't share my same concern and did some digging of her own. Even if he did... Who cares? He left me with a massively huge wedding debt for all the high-end luxury items he insisted we splurge on with my credit card. 
including that Honeymoon World cruise, which my parents are still enjoying. I said, Why not pay me back for all of those expenses? I'd gladly take his money, since I'd be paying off the debt forever. Oh, right. Maybe tell that to Tessa next time she surprises you with her camera crew and Mike, first thing in the morning. Maybe your bank account will receive an unexpected anonymous donation as well, said Ruby. I could feel her trying to think of a happy side to that dilemma. I thought about selling this house, but I loved it too much to do that, and there wasn't a chance in the world I was going to sell Frosted. Being a pastry chef was my dream job. Ben's mother destroyed that dream for me back in San Diego, where I spent the last ten years of my life right after leaving high school. Ben forced me to quit my first baking job because his mother didn't approve of him dating a baker. Just the thought of how naive and super eager I was to please Ben and his manipulative, controlling mother made me sad for all the years I'd already lost. Absolutely not. Plus, no more man drama for me. I'm officially done with dating, flirting, or even slightly crushing on anyone. I'm Owen too in the male selection department. Did you know that Wesley was dating Brittany? I couldn't believe I'd forgotten to tell Ruby last night, but I was utterly exhausted after we finally made it home. Between waking up at the crack of dawn to bake extra cupcake batches for the fair and then standing around until well after midnight at the wharf, I crashed as soon as we walked into the house. No way! She said, her eyes practically bulging out of their sockets. Are you sure? Quite sure. He admitted it himself. I said, as I relayed everything Wesley told me last night. So much for my future career as a matchmaker. I never would have put those two together. She replied. Well, you know what they say. Opposites attract. I said, wanting to hold on to my previous belief that Wesley was a good guy. Well, you know what they also say. The third time's the charm. So I'm not going to let you give up on men and dating just because of two bad apples, said Ruby, always looking for the romantic silver lining in every situation. I supposed that was one way to view it. What about the rule of three? If bad things have already happened twice, they will most likely happen a third time, I countered. I tried to be positive in most situations, but after learning about the wesley Brittany romance, and finding her dead body, I didn't really feel like my normally jubilant self today. The spirulina smoothie Ruby just slid across the counter towards me, instantly invoked my gag reflex, which I covered up by clearing my throat and replying with, Mmm, yummy! What about the saying, good things come in threes? Ruby asked, throwing back her spirulina smoothie in three big gulps. All right, that phrase doesn't really apply to this situation or make any sense here, so I'm reverting back to my first phrase. Third time's the charm. Ben was your first. Wesley kinda coulda been your second. Which makes Marcus Palmer your perfectly charming number three. So why don't you date him if he's so great? You met him first, I said. He's not really my type, she said. What's not your type? The super-rich billionaire type? The incredibly handsome, good-looking type? Or the fact that he's a genius? I suppose all those traits take priority on your do-not-date list? I asked, taking a small sip of the spirulina smoothie before immediately gulping down a hefty bite of my bagel. Clients are strictly off-limits. Plus, he was so totally flirting with you yesterday, said Ruby. You should spend more time trying to get to know him better. Didn't you like him? Yes, right up until I found the dead body, and my mind zoned out on any type of romance. Before I could reply, my phone rang. It was Wesley. I flashed the phone caller ID screen to Ruby, who silently mouthed the word, What? as if Wesley could hear her. Hello? I said, holding the phone up to both my ear and Ruby's so she could listen in. I just wanted to call and make sure you and Ruby got home okay last night, he said. Thanks. She's actually here with me now, 
we had a sleepover at my place, I said. How about you? How late were you at the station? I just left, he said. Otherwise I would have called you sooner. It was already 10 a.m. I couldn't believe he'd been up all night. Did they find out who killed Brittany? I asked. That had to be his top concern. They're looking into other leads, but right now, I'm their top suspect. Oh no! So what you're saying is that you want me to help you solve this case, like I did when I was accused of killing my boss? I asked. Ruby leaned back and shook her head no. Wesley duplicated her reaction and said, No, that's not what I was saying. Not at all. I winked at Ruby. Right. You were just calling to check and see how I was doing. I was, said Wesley. Perfect. I'll hit up the Clover Creek pageant rehearsals this morning and see what I can find out. I said, hanging up before Wesley could protest any more. Ruby crossed her arms while shaking her head no and gave me her most disapproving face. What? You told me to get to know Marcus better. What better way to do that than for him to give me a tour of the beauty pageant he is sponsoring? I asked, while pulling out the ingredients for my famous chocolate-frosted cookie dough stuffed cupcakes. Chapter 4 Knock, knock, I said, walking into the pageant headquarters office, also known as Clover Creek High School's auditorium. It was the only place in town with a stage. Marcus said he had some errands to run but would meet up with me later this afternoon, so I was on my own for the time being. He also said the contestants were in the middle of rehearsing for the talent portion of the contest, so I could slip inside and say hello to them backstage. I brought cupcakes from Frosted, I announced to the room. My presence was welcomed with the world's most contemptuous look of disdain coming from a petite blonde with super long pointy nails, which she brought up to her mouth to shush me. The stern, disapproving look immediately intimidated me into silence, not unlike my last time here ten years ago as a student. I mouthed the word, sorry, before I tiptoed over to the backstage area. Lucky's separation anxiety guaranteed his incessant presence with me, or a cat sitter 24-7, and this morning was no exception. He let out an angry hiss as soon as we entered the auditorium. He only reacted that strongly when he smelled certain odors, and the perfume in here was so strong it drenched the entire room. He buried his face and curled into a ball, burrowing deep inside the bottom of the Kitty Viorn strap. I pulled my jacket over it to give him some extra perfume-blocking protection. Lucky's hiss resulted in another round of shushes from the long-nailed blonde, and I quickly fled backstage. I figured I could set up a cupcake table in the dressing room and chat with the contestants while they ate. But when they all declined my offer, I turned to Lucky for kitty cuteness assistance. However, he was still in hissing mode from the unavoidable perfume. I couldn't blame him. It was pretty pervasive. If I couldn't get them to eat or ooh and ah over Lucky, I couldn't get them to talk. Getting the Heisman was definitely not an auspicious start to sparking a casual conversation. The first woman shook her head no and said she hadn't eaten a dessert since she was ten, and that was only because she didn't know any better. The second woman was eyeing the cupcakes with obvious disdain, so I tried a new approach and said, I'm so sorry about Brittany. I brought some comfort food. Condolence, cupcakes. I'm sure you're all very upset. I am very upset, she replied, without changing her facial expression in the slightest. So upset that I haven't been able to eat a single thing since I found out. I looked for interior signs of sadness, but only received that same blank, uncaring stare. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just leave this here in case you change your mind. Placing the cupcake on her dressing room table, I looked closer for clues that she was grieving over Brittany's death and found nothing. Not even a falsely discarded tissue. Something told my inner spidey sense 
that no one here was very upset over Brittany's recent demise. Contestant number three was standing near the stage entrance, waiting to go on. I walked over and gave it another try, but was promptly dismissed with another expressionless no. Are you sure? I asked the fourth and last contestant sitting backstage when she turned down my cupcake offer. They're my number one bestseller in the bakery right now. The chocolate frosted cookie dough stuffed cupcakes sell out by noon every day. She shook her head no and said, Are you crazy? That would totally topple my carb limit. But you could always make up for today's carb intake by reducing it tomorrow. I suggested. I meant my carb limit for the week, not the day. She said, like I was an extraterrestrial. The person singing on stage came back and tagged her out. The singer had amazingly shiny light brown hair with golden highlights perfectly blended in. She was even thinner than the carb intake control girl, so I smiled but didn't even bother to offer her a cupcake. Are those stuffed cupcakes from Frosted? She asked, making a beeline straight toward me. Yes, they are. Would you like one? I asked, standing up and selecting one for her along with a frosted embossed napkin. Without a reply, she grabbed it and took a huge bite. Mmm, these are so good. I've been dying to try a stuffed cupcake from that place ever since I got into town, she said, suddenly stopping mid-bite and looking around nervously. Is Katarina watching? Who's Katarina? I asked. Our very strict and very scary pageant coach, she said. You all have the same pageant coach? I thought each person was responsible for finding their own coach, I said. I knew practically nothing about pageants or how they worked, but that didn't seem very sporting if each contestant got the same advice from the same person. Yeah, normally, but pageant headquarters appoints a coach for any girls that fail to find one on their own, which is everyone here. This contest was thrown together so quickly they were lucky to get any contestants willing to participate. This year's inaugural Clover Creek Beauty Pageant is an exhibition pageant, so it's more on the friendly side than the competitive side, she said with a smile more fitting of Miss Congeniality than Brittany's evil mean girl smile. And is your pageant coach a petite blonde woman with long pointy nails? I asked. She nodded, her eyes wide as saucers while holding her breath. Eating cupcakes does not align with her philosophy of eliminating the competition by any means necessary, which includes the avoidance of all sugar, flour, and anything white from your diet. I looked over her shoulder to where Katerina was torturing the woman on stage with what I imagined was a verbal smackdown. You're totally safe. She's busy with someone else right now, I said. Releasing an audible exhale, she finished off the rest of the cupcake in two quick bites. Can I have another one? Yes, of course. Take as many as you like. The coast is still clear, I said, checking on Katerina before handing her another one, which she quickly inhaled. They don't seem very popular around here. It's not their fault. We're all afraid of Katerina. My brother had some of these the other day and kept raving about them all morning, she said. Are you Lila? I asked. Yes, how did you know? Do I know you? Sorry, I can't see anything anymore without my glasses, she said, pulling them out of her bag and putting them on. I should really get contacts. We've never met. I'm Ava Decker, I said, extending my hand to her. I own Frosted, and I met your brother Marcus last night at the fireworks display. Wow, then you're the one who found Brittany's body? She replied, shaking my hand. That instantly perked up the other three pageant contestants, who were previously ignoring me. They rolled their dressing room chairs closer to us. Is it true? I heard she was strangled, asked one of them. I wasn't sure what parts of the investigation were public knowledge and which ones were still secret, 
I didn't want to divulge any information in case any of them were the killer. I'm not sure. The medical examiner did say she was killed at 8 p.m. last night. Were any of you in contact with her around that time? I asked, hoping to establish alibis for each of them. We had already spread out our blankets on the wharf for the fireworks show hours before that. We had to come early in order to get a premium spot, said Lila. All of you? I asked. The other women nodded their heads in agreement. Could one of them have slipped away briefly to use the bathroom and quietly killed Brittany before returning to the group, thereby solidifying her alibi? Katerina made us all turn our phones into the police so they could check the GPS history to confirm our whereabouts last night, said Lila, as if reading my mind. Don't they need a warrant to get that kind of information? I asked. I would know. So many suspects on the last case could have been instantly cleared if we'd had access to their GPS history. Normally, the Katerina said innocent pageant girls had nothing to hide and would never hesitate to help a police investigation," said Lila. But Brittany wasn't with you. Did you purposely not invite her? I asked. That definitely would have been my prerogative if I were organizing a friendly get-together. Of course, I thought pageant girls were all forced to be nice to each other, at least for outside appearances, which the county fireworks gathering would have been. It was actually her idea that we all go together. She went out to get fruit salads for us, but she never came back, said Lila. My stuffed cupcakes have been mistaken for lots of different pastries like tarts, muffins, and even mini pies. But they were never called a fruit salad. Perhaps Brittany was indulging some secret appetite. But then again, Lila had just inhaled two cupcakes in front of everyone without giving it a second thought. More likely, Brittany took the cupcakes back with her to try to sabotage everyone's diets or weekly carb intake limits. Everyone, that is, except Lila, who clearly won the lottery for fast metabolism and excellent genetics. Did you see her leave to meet up with anyone? I asked. They all shook their heads no. We're all really upset about her death, said Lila. The other women nodded their heads in confirmation but didn't change their expressions at all. Not to be rude, but none of you seemed too upset, I said. Oh, that's because we all had Botox injections yesterday. One of the pageant sponsors gave them to us for free. Sad, happy, surprised, bored. It all looks the same for the first 48 hours, said Lila. My super keen spidey sense of reading facial expressions was thwarted by Botox. I distinctly remembered Brittany's pained look of revulsion when I asked if Marcus Palmer were single. Not a chance she had Botox done. Did Brittany opt not to get Botox? I asked. She overslept and missed her appointment, or so she said. Katerina was livid. It was painful to watch, said Lila. Wasn't Katerina her mentor? I asked. It was a weird mentorship. The two of them were always going at it, said one of the other contestants. Of course they were. It was Brittany. Leave it to her to be mean to the person helping her. And skipping Botox was probably part of some diabolical master plan to force everyone else to get a bad Botox job and lose the pageant while she remained au naturel. You're all super beautiful and talented. I said, listening to the other contestant singing in the background. I can't put my eyeliner on without it ending up on my forehead, especially when I try that wing effect. I painfully recalled my effort to follow the eyeliner wing tutorial on YouTube with less than stellar results. I can help you with that. I invented this new winged liner brush that practically does it for you, said Lila picking up a circular device and flicking it on. She instructed me to close my eyes while she placed it on my right eye and then pressed it into my orbital bone before pulling it off. Okay, all done. You can look, she said. 
I opened my eyes and looked in the mirror at the absolutely perfect line enhancing my right eye. Wow, that's very impressive, I said. And you did it so fast. You line it up with your brow bone and it senses the contour of your eyelid, she said, holding it up to her own eye and pressing a button. And ta-da, it does the work for you. Here, you try it, she said, handing the device over. Um, I'm not really qualified to operate one of these, I said, returning it back to her. I promise it's foolproof. Just line it up with your brow bone here at the top and then press this button, she said, doing it on her other eye. It seemed easy and much better than I did on my own. All right, here goes, I said. What was the worst that could happen? She'd just have to use some makeup remover and redo it for me. I tilted my head back and closed my left eye before swooshing it across and expecting the worst. But instead, it resulted in a perfect twin to the eye on the right side. Wow, that was like magic. Right? Asked Lila, jumping up and down in her unmasked excitement. With tons of new color palettes, brushes, and formulas flooding the market every day, the actual application of makeup hasn't changed since it was invented. You need a skilled hand to do everything. My products do all the hard work for you. These would be great if they actually existed. Now I knew how Marcus became a tech billionaire genius. It was in his DNA. The Palmers were modern-day Thomas Edison's. It's amazing. I wish this was around when I was in high school, I said. Here, let me give you a total makeover, and I can show you my other inventions, she said, reaching into her makeup bucket and pulling different contraptions out. Um, I don't know. I don't really have any beauty pageant makeup-worthy events to attend today, or any time ever, I said. I was more familiar with sweat-inducing events like baking cupcakes next to a super-hot oven that just melts makeup. Katerina says every day is a good day to look beauty pageant ready. You never know when opportunity might come your way, said Lila. That sounded like a lot of work to do on a daily basis. And most days, nothing came my way. My nights were mainly spent alone on the couch under a blanket with Lucky in the Hallmark Mystery Channel. Did someone say makeover? Asked the contestant who just finished singing on stage. I love doing makeovers. On the plus side, I did want to talk to the contestants a little longer to find out what they knew about Brittany. And I could always use more help in the makeup department, so I agreed. Lucky spent the entire makeover hiding in his kitty Bjorn. He came out every few minutes to check the air quality but the perfume scent was still redolent. He hissed before he went back into hiding. A couple hours later, I learned pretty much everything there was to know about the contestants. They were not only the nicest women on the planet, but also saints. Apparently, becoming pageant-worthy required a ton of community service, not only at soup kitchens, but also nursing homes and animal shelters. There wasn't a single place in need that one of these women didn't volunteer their time in serving. The only exception was Brittany. When they finally allowed me to take a look at their collaboration, I didn't even recognize myself. The last time I had my makeup professionally done was for my wedding, and I later destroyed every single photo I could find of that day. Is that really me? I asked. They all gathered around me and smiled. Selfie time, announced Lila as she snapped a picture. Thanks, this is nothing short of a beauty miracle, I said. You should patent all of these clever inventions. Thanks, but I work for my brother at Palmer Tech, helping to design the next great tech accessories. He really relies on me. He'd be devastated if I ventured out on my own, she said. I could hear the disappointment in her voice, but the deadpan Botox expression was still throwing me off. You should tell him how you feel. I'm sure he'd want you to be happy doing something you love. Not to bring up Brittany again, but life is too short not to go after your dreams. 
I said. Then I explained how I wasted the first decade of my life by pursuing a career in accounting, because my boyfriend and his mother thought it was a good sensible idea, even though all I ever wanted and loved to do was baking. That's easy for you to say, being so young, replied Lila, still unsure about changing her direction in life. I'm 27, and I totally changed the trajectory of my life this year, from being an accountant to opening a bakery. How old are all of you? I asked. They all responded with numbers less than 25. Aren't you a little young to be getting Botox? I asked. It's called preventative maintenance, said Lila. Katerina swears by it. She's so great at pointing out everything that's wrong with you or could go wrong. I think she's on her way back here now. Did you want her to do the same for you? Definitely not. After an entire decade spent listening to my ex-boyfriend's mother's opinions on the very same subject, I'd had enough to last me a lifetime. Making up an excuse about being late to my next appointment, I hastily ran out. Chapter 5 After leaving the box of cupcakes with Lila, I met up with Marcus for lunch at the Little Dog Diner. Their lobster rolls were my favorite. Ruby's spirulina smoothie obsession extended to her lunches at the office, which she invariably preferred to lobster rolls from the diner. It felt like forever since I'd been here, even though, realistically, it had probably only been a week. Well, you really like to bring your cat with you everywhere, huh? Marcus asked as he sat down at the booth and joined us. I'm surprised they allow him in here. We come here all the time, and since he's officially an emotional support animal, he's allowed to go everywhere, I said, holding up the designation tag attached to my purse. Did that make me seem emotionally needy? Or lucky? I was going to explain it further, but the waitress came over at that moment to take our orders. The upside of having lunch with an incredibly good-looking, friendly billionaire who is new in town was that he let me pick our lunch location. The downside was that lobster rolls were messy fare, and after my first bite, half of the roll was in my mouth and the other half was on my shirt. This huge stain completely overshadowed the masterpiece makeup miracle that the pageant contestants disguised me in. If Marcus Palmer looked amazing last night under moonlight, he looked even more so today in the sunlight. It figured that I'd end up with my lunch all over me five minutes into landing a pseudo-date with a supermodel-looking genius. Here, he said, dunking his napkin into his water glass and handing it to me. I think you have something on your shirt. My initial course of action was to pretend that the pinkish-red blob of sauce on my top was part of the design, but sure, let's go ahead and address it. Uh, thanks, I said, trying nonchalantly to dab it away. My amateurish on-the-spot cleaning moves transformed it from a small smudge to an asteroid landing site that spanned the upper right quarter of my shirt, leading into my sleeve. I'll get you another napkin, he said, surveying my handiwork. He threw his arm up and flapped down the waitress. No, it's fine. I was going to throw this shirt out anyway. I responded, even though it was my favorite flowing pastel pink shirt. When the waitress arrived, Lucky had already polished off his lobster roll and was now licking the remains off my shirt. Whatever the opposite of elegant sophistication was, Allowing a cat to lick food remnants off your shirt had to be it. If I didn't need to know more about the pageant, I totally would have made a run for it. I think the cat has the job under control, said the waitress when Marcus asked her for more napkins. I tried to get Lucky to stop, but that only heightened his excitement to dig in more, like I was keeping him away from an incredible kitty treasure. Here, Lucky. Eat mine, I said, setting him down in front of my plate. You're not hungry, asked Marcus. I was starving, but the thought of sitting here one more second, with Lucky licking the food off my shirt and sleeve, while Marcus and the waitress stared at me, was so beyond mortifying. Nah, 
I had one of Ruby's spirulina smoothies this morning. Those always fill me up for a long time. Actually, they always filled up the garbage disposal where I secretly dumped them when Ruby wasn't looking. Ruby is always trying to offer me one of those, but I'm more of a cheese fries and hot dog kind of guy, he said, making me like him even more. A man who enjoyed carbs and cupcakes? What more could a girl want? Thanks again for giving us a ride home last night. That was very kind of you, I said. Wow, I was downright terrible at flirting. The only thing less romantic than having a cat lick food off your shirt was reminding a guy about the other time you were together when you discovered a dead body. Anytime. My chariot is at your disposal for all future crime scene investigations, he said with a flirty smile that made me all tingly inside. It's very sad what happened to Brittany. Any idea who might have killed her? You said you went to high school together. Clover Creek is a small town. You must have been friends. More like frenemies. Yesterday was the first time I'd seen her in ten years, but she seemed really into the pageant that you're sponsoring. Do you think it could have been anyone from there? I asked. I hope not. Lila is still competing in it. But the women all seemed so nice, even Brittany. They've been together pretty much non-stop since pageant rehearsals started last week, he said. Another man who thought Brittany was nice? I wanted to be open-minded, but she seemed like the same old Brittany to me yesterday. Mean-spirited, condescending, and superficial. Lila was warm and friendly, so it was hard to imagine her being very close to Brittany. Your sister, Lila, is wonderful. And I'm not just saying that because she was the only contestant who liked my cupcakes, I said. We Palmers do have a cultured palate for gourmet desserts, he said. Speaking of food, are you sure you don't want another napkin? He pointed to the still wet, massive stain on my shirt. I'm good, thanks, I said, trying to pull my unfortunately short hair over the stain. This was a job for long hair and mine was barely shoulder length. In addition to being an out-of-control wavy mess, it never grew past my collarbone. It was pre-programmed to remain short. Lila told me to tell you she says hi, I said, changing the subject. The more we talked about food, the more I could feel him staring at the huge stain on my shirt. Lila was the right subject. His entire face lit up. Isn't she great? he asked. Yes, she is, I agreed. Not because she was the only one nice enough to eat my cupcakes, but because she was the only one who seemed friendly and wanted to talk to me. Although, to be fair, it was completely possible everyone was secretly smiling on the inside at me, but their Botox refused to allow it to show through. Well, she gushed on and on about how smart you are, all of the pageant contestants were super psyched over their new Palmer Tech smartwatches you gave every girl as a gift. I said, feeling guilty over not researching his company before this lunch. They're amazing watches. I can't believe you invented those. Maybe gushing about how great his products were would cover up for the fact that I really had no idea what they were or what they did. Would you like one? He asked. Oops. Did I overdo it? Did it seem like I was fishing for a free watch? Oh, thanks, but I already have a watch, I said, showing him my wrist. I was still wearing the same Mickey Mouse watch my parents bought me when I was 12. I was never an accessory person. Any jewelry, even a watch, seemed like a frivolous expense when I could use the money for something much more enjoyable. Things like splurging on cheesecakes, lattes, muffins, donuts and anything else infused with sugar were what brought me true happiness. He pulled up his left wrist to show me a silver band with a large but thin etched glass bezel face. But can Mickey Mouse order dinner for you or track your heart rate? The resting digital image was a four-leaf clover. Intrigued, Lucky walked over and started tapping it with his paw, which brought up the time, then Marcus's calendar, then his messages, and finally his photos. It was about to show more, but Lucky chose that moment to switch from tapping to licking, 
at which point it turned off. Apparently, the Palmer Tech smartwatch was not programmed to respond to cat tongues. And it's so easy to use, even a kitten can operate it, he said, giving Lucky a little ruffle under his chin. In that case, I'll put a Palmer Tech smartwatch on the list for kitty stocking stuffers, I said, opening up Lucky's kitty Bjorn so he could hop back in. It looked like he was in a lobster roll food coma from eating so much. A food coma that I was desperately jealous of right about now. Brittany had one of those, but hers was a shiny metallic red with a black bezel glass face. You mean like this? He asked. Tapping on the screen a few times changed both the band and the bezel color. Wow, how did you do that? I asked. It's a special patented chameleon anodized silver compound, he said. It doesn't debut until next year, but all of the pageant contestants received prototypes as a gift this week. It can also camouflage to your skin tone, so you don't even know it's there, he said, demonstrating with another flick of the screens. Wait, does it have GPS tracking? I asked. Definitely. Why? He asked. Does your company keep GPS logs? I asked. We could easily track Brittany's whereabouts this week to figure out who might have killed her. The police probably had her phone GPS, but it was highly unlikely they were going to share it with me. Possibly. We leave it up to each person as to whether or not they want their GPS history made public or kept private, he said. I could tell he already knew what I was getting at as he started tapping his watch. You want me to check Brittany's history? See if it leads us to the killer? Can you do that? I asked. There's nothing this watch cannot do, he said, already tapping and sliding his finger across the watch screen. Chapter 6 Actually, Marcus was wrong. He did find something the watch could not do, which was to activate itself. Apparently, Brittany put the watch on when she received it, but never actually hit the activation switch to turn it on. Knowing Brittany, she probably treated the watch like a bracelet, not a functional piece of equipment. So much for that lead. Hopefully the police had her phone in their custody and could track its GPS history. Marcus offered to introduce me to the pageant staff right after lunch, but considering the huge stain still emblazoned across my upper right side, going to visit an entire panel of people whose sole job was to support an event that judged women by their looks seemed like a bad idea. I took a rain check for the next day. After a quick shower and wardrobe change at home, I set out for Wesley's apartment. He was surprised to see me, mostly because he never told me where he lived. His grandfather totally caved after one cupcake and gave me Wesley's home address. You're not the only one with legendary detective skills, I said, walking in when he stepped back and opened the door wider. His apartment was a typical bachelor pad, crammed with college paraphernalia and furniture that he must have swiped from his childhood bedroom. There was a neon beer sign on the wall, flanked by two Notre Dame football posters that he was probably proud of swiping from his college dorm room. The super large futon couch in the center was surrounded by wicker papa sand chairs and bean bags with a small table in the center that had a collage of drink stains on it. I made a mental note to buy Wesley drink coasters for Christmas. Lucky found this to be the greatest apartment ever. He jumped out of his kitty Bjorn and hopped from one piece of furniture to the next. He was a little freaked out at first by the bean bag when it moved beneath him but soon learned to take a running leap to pounce on it and move it around. What's with the cooler? He asked, pointing to the red metal pail in my right hand. I set it down, clicking the sides to release the top and pulling out two smoothies. One had real spirulina in it, and the other had a chocolate milkshake with green food dye in it. Wesley was extremely critical about my cupcake intake or any sugar-related intake of any kind. Although I didn't have to hide my chocolate milkshake from him, I also didn't want another lecture on the evils of sugar and carbs, 
which tumbled out of his mouth every time the subject came up. These are your favorite, right? I asked, handing him the healthy non-chocolate version. I used Ruby's Vitamixer. Two scoops of spirulina, one scoop of whey, lots of veggies, and some apple slices for sweetness. He took one sip and gave me a thumbs up. Wow, Decker, I never pegged you for a spirulina smoothie drinker. He nodded towards mine, which I was busy slurping down. It was my second chocolate milkshake today, but technically I hadn't eaten any lunch. This was much better than enduring one of his well-meaning but totally unwanted lectures on how I needed to exercise regularly and eat more salads. I figured you're not really the stuffed cupcake type of guy, I said, my normal go-to in visiting people. But Wesley's abs of steel screamed low-fat paleo diet all the way. How are you doing today? I was worried about you. I'm fine. Like I said, we were only dating for a couple months, and I was actually ready to break up with her last night, he said. You were? I asked. Why? Did I sound too snarky when I asked that? I felt like the why was obvious. Wesley was a super nice guy with actual real feelings, and Brittany was anything but nice and completely oblivious to anyone's feelings but her own. She was cheating on me with some other guy, he said. She probably saw his apartment decor and decided to search for a non-frat house dwelling bachelor. How do you know that? I asked. I am a detective, he said. Right. Duh. Did you suspect that she was cheating and followed her? I asked. Surely he kept a log of her comings and goings, and with whom? even if only in his head. That would be a great place to start for this investigation. Not at all. I was following up on some stalker mail she'd been receiving. That's how we met originally. I was assigned to her case. I was worried about her safety when I couldn't get a hold of her earlier this week. I went to her apartment and found her with Tyler Roberts. He explained. Are you sure they were on a date? Tyler is an attorney. He could have been giving her legal advice. I suggested. Legal advice that ends by making out in front of her building? He asked. Oh, it could be a new full-service legal package he's offering to help increase revenue. I said with a wink. The sardonic look on Wesley's face told me that he didn't appreciate my humor. Too soon? I asked. Ignoring me, he walked over to his kitchen at the other end of the room. Can I get you something to drink? He asked, pouring water for himself. No thanks, I said, perusing the open files on his kitchen island. They were all love letters to Brittany. Did you ever find out who the stalker was? I asked. Brittany suspected it was her roommate, Shelby. Shelby was hoping Brittany would move out so she could have the apartment to herself. It was Shelby's master plan to scare Brittany into leaving, because she thought the stalker knew her home address. I was adding my notes to the case file before handing it over to the lead detective tomorrow morning, he said. What made her think it was her roommate Shelby? I asked. Brittany was excellent at her mean girl skills, but deducing evidence and clues to find her a real stalker was so not Brittany. She said Shelby started dressing like her, acting like her, and even changed her hair to look like Brittany's he said. Then how do you know it wasn't her roommate, Shelby, you saw making out with Tyler? I asked. Because I'm a detective and I would have figured that out, he said a little too quickly. I got him. He was in love with Brittany, so much so that he couldn't even think straight. Plus, she made it sound like Shelby weighed considerably more than she did. At least he didn't use the F word to describe Shelby's extra weight. That was where I drew the line. This friendship would have dissolved in a nanosecond if any body-shaming words were uttered. Leave it to Brittany to mention Shelby's weight in a negative light to her boyfriend. So the case is solved. Brittany's roommate, Shelby, was the one that killed Brittany? I asked. Possibly. 
They haven't been able to track Shelby down yet, and I've never met her, so I have no idea what she looks like. Brittany only mentioned her in passing, and her name isn't on the lease. How do you know that? I thought you weren't on the case or the investigation, I asked. He shrugged and said, My dad is still the chief of police, but you didn't hear that from me. Were the two of you exclusive? I asked. It felt a little intrusive asking personal details about his relationship with Brittany. But how else could I help Leslie clear his name if I didn't know more about their relationship? For sure. Or not. I mean, I thought we were. He said. Wait, I just told you that we can't investigate this case any further. There's an outside detective working on it, and I'm sure he'll figure it out. It was like he didn't even know me anymore. So you're taking the day off? I asked. Judging by his workout attire, it didn't seem like he was going into the station anytime soon. And now he seemed to have given up on finding out who the real killer was. More like the month off. I've been put on administrative leave until the case is solved. He said. Perfect! So you'll have plenty of time to help me solve it. I said. I appreciate your unwanted, unsolicited, and unprofessional help, but you're not really qualified in any way to conduct a murder investigation, he said. Geez, could he have added any more insults to that one sentence? I'll have you know, there are plenty of things I'm not qualified to do, but I do them anyway. And do I even have to remind you that I solved your last homicide all on my own? All right, technically it wasn't all on my own. I had help from Ruby, Wesley, and Wesley's grandfather, but only because I insisted that they help me. What about the fact that there's a real killer out there? It's not safe for you to go poking around asking questions, he said. Don't you owe me some self-defense lessons? I asked. Wesley didn't offer to give me self-defense lessons as much as I put him on the spot and told him he should provide them for me. If the purpose of the lessons are so that you can start investigating homicides, then absolutely not, he said. Lucky chose that moment to jump up on Wesley's counter and started licking the remains of whatever was left on the counter from his breakfast earlier that morning. Ew, icky Lucky, spit it out, I demanded. It's fine, it was just some spilled milk from this morning, he said. I grabbed the plate rinsed it in his sink and put it in his dishwasher. I was no longer sad that Wesley never asked me out on a date. I wasn't the cleanest person in the world, but this was beyond bizarre. What fully grown man chooses to live like he's on fraternity row? As if to confirm my thoughts, Lucky stepped on some peanut butter and tried to shake it off his paw, but to no avail. He then stepped on a piece of paper from Wesley's Brittany file and jumped off the kitchen island in a panic when the peanut-buttered paw made the paper stick to his foot. Kitty, no! yelled Wesley, making a grab for him, which only scared Lucky all the more. He ran under one of the Papasan chairs, hiding under the wicker latticework, just out of Wesley's reach. I signaled for Wesley to wait as I gently fished Lucky out. It's okay, little guy. We'll get that icky old peanut butter off your foot, I said, stroking him while cradling him in my arms. I glanced down at the paper and saw Brittany's home address. That had to be a sign from the universe that I should go over and check out Brittany's place right after this. Committing the address to memory, I gently detached the paper from Lucky's foot and handed it back to Wesley. Walking over to the sink, I rinsed his paw with some soapy water to get the peanut butter out that seeped between his paw pads. Then I washed his other three paws just to be safe. It was also safe to say this would be our first and last home visit to Wesley's apartment. It's not old. It's also from breakfast, he said. And the spaghetti sauce on the stove? I asked, pointing towards the big red splotchy blobs caked on his stovetop walls and cabinets. Last week sometime? He said. I carefully placed Lucky back into his kitty Bjorn, not wanting him to touch anything else in the apartment. 
Now I understood why hazmat suits were invented. Chapter 7 After leaving Wesley's apartment, I discovered a weird stripe of green mold on my shirt from when I was leaning against his kitchen island. I headed back home for shower number three of the day and removed another food-stained, dry-clean-only shirt. I also washed the cat. Considering every inch of Lucky's tiny exterior was exposed to who knows what while rolling around Wesley's apartment and jumping on top of the furniture, I gave him a sudsy antibacterial kitty bath just to be safe. I took both of this morning's shirts and Lucky's kitty Bjorn to the dry cleaners before heading out to Brittany's apartment. I was wearing my most durable black cotton t-shirt and dark jeans. As long as I stayed away from anything light-colored, like sour cream, yogurt, or white queso, I felt safe. Lucky protested with growls and unhappy meows at being put inside his cat carrier, instead of being allowed to roam freely in the car. But he was still a little damp from his recent bath, and the temperature outside had dropped to the low 40s. I turned on his cat carrier warmer and jacked up the heat inside the car. It was a good 15-minute drive from the cleaners to Brittany's apartment. Plenty of time for Lucky to fully dry off if he stayed inside his cat carrier. Brittany's apartment was near the wharf, adjacent to the most exclusive country club that catered to the rich and upper crust, the Highland Yacht Club. Not only did each unit boast an oceanfront view, but they also had floor-to-ceiling windows throughout. Originally intended to be sold as condos, the developer filed for bankruptcy before finishing the project, which later became rental apartments after the bank took over. Condos or not, it was still a beautiful building. I tossed Lucky's carrier over my shoulder and grabbed a few four-packs of cupcakes before heading inside the apartment building. Hi there, Joelle, I said, reading her name tag. She smiled back without realizing how I knew her name and judging by the look on her face, apparently thought we were friends. Her eyes were glued to her phone before she looked up again. Can you believe dried apricots have over 300 calories in each fruit chip? Asked Joelle, waving her phone screen at me and pointing to her plastic baggie of dried apricot chips. I just wanted a tiny snack. I wasn't much of a fruit person, fresh or dried but I sensed my concurrence to the outrageousness of her newfound fact was the right response. Yeah, that's crazy, I said, nodding my head in agreement. It's been an entire week of this torturous diet, and I haven't dropped a single pound yet. In fact, I've gained almost 10 pounds, and I'm so hungry all the time. Brittany swore she lost all her weight on the dried gold fast-track diet, she said, thumping her head on her desk in melodramatic defeat. Being a dessert addict, diet was an obscure four-letter word in my dictionary. It didn't matter if the words paleo, keto, or bright line were in front of it. They all described various forms of torture as far as I was concerned. Brittany Westerhide? I asked. Yeah, Brittany from the penthouse level. I'm sure you've seen her. You live here too, right? She asked. No, I don't. I'm actually here to see Brittany's roommate, Shelby Hicks, in the penthouse apartment, I said. I'm so sorry. I've been trying really hard to get to know all of the residents in the building, but it's only my second week, and there are so many faces, so when you said my name, I just assumed we'd met already. She said, looking embarrassed. I read it on your name tag, I said, pointing to her receptionist shirt. Or maybe the correct title was door person? My experience with fancy high-rises was severely limited, but she looked like a gatekeeper of some sort. Oh, duh. Right. She said with a smile. But please, continue. I'd love to hear more about dried gold. I replied, hoping to gain more information on Brittany. If I had any worries about her clamming up, I was dead wrong. This woman liked to talk. A lot. Brittany said she only used dried gold for a single month before dropping 50 pounds, just like that. 
she replied, snapping her fingers. She scrolled on her phone and then showed me a photo of Brittany before and after, with a logo at the bottom that said, Dried Gold. And dried gold only makes dried fruit? I asked. The receptionist held up the bag of dried apricots with the same logo on the bottom. Yes, and apparel. They have a huge yoga pants and tank top line of workout clothes, but I certainly can't afford them. I had to put the dried gold fast track diet on my card, but I figured it was worth it if I could lose 30 pounds in a single month like Brittany. I've been eating only dried gold for the last 10 days, and the scale keeps going up, not down. And now that Brittany's dead, I can't even ask her about it, much less get a refund. Did Brittany sell those to you? I asked, pointing to the bag. Joelle opened up her bottom drawer, revealing her entire month's supply of dried gold products. I saw dried banana chips, dried figs, dried goji berries, dried raisins, dried cranberries, and a ton of others. The drawer was practically overflowing. Yep, dried apricots and everything else that can be dried and sold in a bag. She said, looking with regret at her probably very expensive purchase. How much do each of those cost? I asked. Depends on which weight loss bundles you choose to meet your diet goals, she said. I had no idea what she was talking about. Huh? I asked, crinkling my eyebrows. On a specialized dried gold meal plan, you can lose 30 pounds in 30 days. Or if you like it slow and steady, you can choose one where you only see 2 pounds per week of weight loss. Some dried fruits will increase your energy, others will relax you, and others promote fat burning. So I just bought them all, she said, and previously proved with her overflowing drawer. The accompanying pamphlet revealed countless before and after pictures and everyone looked like a Clover Creek pageant contestant afterwards. No wonder the receptionist decided to splurge on them. This was great advertising, and it had to be considering the prices they were charging. Wow, these are really expensive. $1,200 for one month's supply? I remarked. It's meant to replace all of your meals, so it's basically covering your grocery and eating out bill for the entire month, said Joelle. I had no idea Brittany was selling dried gold, but I guessed it made sense. She was all about image, and if she could sell diet products related to that, it would have been a natural fit. I should have listened to Brittany's roommate, Shelby. She tried to warn me that dried gold was just a big scam. She said, kicking the bottom drawer shut. I almost went into a sugar coma. But isn't it based on natural fruit juices? I asked, briefly considering the benefits of dried gold myself. It looked like a superior alternative to getting more fruits and vegetables than the spirulina smoothies Ruby loved to push into me. Yes, but not if you're marketing it as a weight loss solution, said Joelle. Diet products and warning labels were definitely beyond my area of expertise. After being asked multiple times to create a sugar-free version of my cupcakes, they all tasted like straw. I wanted to make it happen, but encountered too much difficulty in manifesting it. You look fabulous. You don't need to lose any weight, I said. I generally felt that way about everyone. I was very into body positivity, but she was pretty thin and probably felt good about just being her. She had exactly the same thin build as Brittany. I was only doing it because Brittany was my pageant coach and she told me I had to, said Joelle. You're in the pageant? I asked. I didn't remember seeing her this morning at the high school auditorium, but she was definitely pretty enough to compete. Not the Clover Creek one. Brittany said there were others in Maine that I could apply for. She said she'd work it all out so we could be pageant girls together, explained Joelle, crossing her fingers. It sounded like Brittany's pageant coaching business was off to a good start, having already found someone to work with. But I was more interested to hear about Brittany's dried gold business and her roommate Shelby. Do you care if I keep this brochure? I asked, holding up the dried gold price list she handed me. 
Keep it, burn it, I don't care. I'm so done with dried gold. She replied. I thanked her and slid the brochure into my oversized purse, next to the mini cupcake boxes. Oh my gosh, what is that heavenly smell? She asked, closing her eyes and inhaling deeply. I pulled out the bribery cupcakes that I intended to give to Brittany's roommate, Shelby, as an excuse to meet her and ask questions. Are you referring to my chocolate-frosted cookie dough stuffed cupcakes? I pulled open the lid. I didn't even know such a thing existed. Like the cookie dough is still uncooked and stuffed in the middle as filling? She asked, picking one up and examining it. Yes, exactly like that. It's the most popular stuffed cupcake in the shop. It's completely pasteurized, too, so it's entirely safe to eat the cookie dough. And we heat treat it also to kill any bacteria. I said, You're totally welcome to these. I had backup cases underneath it in my purse. She was about to eat it before she stopped herself. But how many calories are in it? Geez, if I had to post my calories and fat content, I doubt I'd have any customers left. I'm not sure. That wasn't a total lie. I'd never taken the time out to figure it out. My days of looking at spreadsheets and numbers were so over. She squinted her eyes and pulled the cupcake back, as if she needed reading glasses. Probably a good 300 calories, right? She asked. Give her or take a few, I said, shrugging my shoulders. More like give, but who was counting? That did it. She sank her teeth into it and took a huge bite out. Mmm, this is pure heaven. Way better than dried fruit. Wasn't anything better than dried fruit? You made these? She asked with a mouthful of cupcake. I nodded yes. You're amazing. Will you teach me? I want to be just like you. A baker whose cupcakes make people smile. I've been looking for a new career. Now that Brittany's gone, maybe I should find another mentor, she said. Yes, of course. I'm fully staffed now, but I'm sure we could work something out. Just come by next week sometime, I said. With less than zero in the budget for another employee, I was so flattered. No one ever said they loved my cupcakes enough to want to be like me. That was new. I'm so sorry. I just went on and on. Thank you so much for listening. I could actually get fired for going off on that tirade. She looked around cautiously, checking to see if anyone witnessed our conversation. I've already been written up twice for chatting with the visitors. My mother always told me I should go into broadcasting. You know, as a host for a talk show or a news anchor or something. But it's so hard to break into that business. You won't report me, will you? She clenched her jaw and held her breath waiting for my response. No, of course not. If anything, I should have been thanking her for the new lead in Brittany's murder. Who did you say you came here to see? She asked, tilting her head to one side while trying to remember. I'm here to see Brittany's roommate, Shelby, in the penthouse apartment. I repeated. Lucky chose that moment to let out a loud kitty roar. I totally forgot to unzip his carrier. He hated being locked inside that thing. Great, she's in the penthouse apartment. You should take these, she said, handing me back the cupcake box. I'm afraid I'll eat the entire box if you leave them here with me. She hit a button under the desk and the elevators opened up behind her. Thanks, I said, heading up with Lucky and his kitty carrier by my side. In keeping with the floor-to-ceiling glass windows of each apartment, the elevator also featured an impressive all-glass enclosure. The view overlooked the Highland Yacht Club next door. It was too cold for anyone to be out on the patio today, but I did see some people on their yachts. As the elevator flew up, the figures became smaller and smaller until they were tiny and recognizable specks. Lucky scratched at his carrier zipper, seeking a better view. I reached in and clipped his collar to the base of the carrier, to prevent any elevator mishaps. He strained to jump out and looked down at his collar with obvious cat disappointment. 
Sorry, little guy, but safety first, I said. Hanging his head out of the carrier as far as he could to look outside, I moved him right up to the window. His little kitty ears pulled back to attention when he spotted some massive hawks circling over the water. Who knew it would be so easy to entertain him? He even looked a little sad when the elevator doors opened and we exited onto the penthouse level. This was a super fancy building. Each unit had a doorbell with a video camera. I always wondered if I should smile, like waiting for a portrait, or just remain neutral looking while standing in front of those things. I chose to smile. Can I help you? asked a voice with a deep southern drawl that came out of the intercom. Hi, I'm Ava from Frosted. I went to high school with Brittany. I just wanted to express my condolences and bring you some cupcakes, I said, holding up the box. The front door flew open and a blonde woman, who could have been a twin to Brittany, stood behind it. You were friends with Brittany? she asked. I hated to lie, so I just sputtered out some random facts. We graduated the same year from Clover Creek High, but I moved away and lived in San Diego for the last decade. Brittany and I reconnected at the county fair recently. All of those facts were technically true. What did you say your name was again? She asked, a hint of familiarity dawning on her face. I traced my memories back, but couldn't recall anyone from Clover Creek High School named Shelby. I was sure I'd remember someone who looked like Brittany's doppelganger. Ava Decker, I own Frosted the only stuffed cupcake shop in the world, I said, opening up the box to reveal more chocolate-frosted cookie dough stuffed cupcakes. She snapped her fingers and pointed at me. Yes, now I remember. You poor thing. I heard all about how your awful fiancé ghosted you at the altar. That was one way to describe me. Not my first choice, but technically correct. I'm also the woman who got framed for killing her boss, she said, grabbing my hand and pulling me inside. The interior was just as beautiful as the exterior and hallway, ultra-modern, chic, and beautifully decorated. All right, that's very accurate. Do I know you? I asked. She shook her head no. No, but Detective Lockwood is a huge fan of yours. Brittany got super jealous whenever he talked about you, she said. That was interesting, especially since he didn't seem to even remember that I existed for the last two months. You know Wesley? I asked. Not really. I overheard him and Brittany talking a few times about you, but I never met him, she said. I'm so glad you're here. This is a sign that we're supposed to be best friends. It is? I asked. Not that I didn't enjoy getting all the answers she spouted so easily, but from a suspect who could also be a murderer, I had to be a little wary. You coming here? Me hearing all about you? And now there's a free room in the apartment! Maybe it's a sign we're supposed to be roommates. Were you looking for a place to live? She asked. I have a house, but thanks for the offer, I said. Then maybe it's a sign I should move out of here and live with you, she suggested. Seeing the terrified look on my face, she laughed and added, I'm kidding. I'm from rural Georgia, where everyone thinks they're descended from witches and bent on perceiving all kinds of omens and signs and karma. Can I get you some tea? Yes, please, and I hope it's okay if Lucky comes in too. I held up Lucky's carrier and his adorable little head was still poking out the top. Oh, he's so cute! She gushed, petting Lucky's face. I've been wondering if I should get a cat or a dog. This is another sign. I should definitely get a kitten. I just love kittens. Achoo! <laughs> but my allergies are just so... Achoo! Terrible! What's his name? Lucky, and I can keep him inside his carrier. I gently pushed Lucky's head back into the carrier and zipped it close, to which he responded with an angry yowl. It's okay. You can let him out. I'll just take an antihistamine, she said. 
In addition to being allergic to pets, I'm also allergic to Mother Nature. It was part of the reason I moved here from Georgia. Y'all have winter six months out of the year, and everything stays frozen. I unclipped Lucky's collar from the safety anchor in his carrier and picked him up. Are you sure? Please, I love animals. Let him run around. He's so itty-bitty. How much damage can a tiny little kitten do? She asked. Clearly, she never owned a kitten before. I was hesitant about putting him down until she started petting him. He's so achoo, adorable, she said, picking him up and nestling him against her face. Who needed cupcakes when you had the world's cutest kitten to get you admission anywhere? Shelby hung up the scarf she was holding on the coat rack behind the door, where more of Brittany's red glitter strings were visible. Upon seeing them shimmering in the sunlight, Lucky immediately jumped out of Shelby's arms and started attacking the red glitter strings. Sorry about that. Are you competing in the pageant too? I asked, urgently trying to pry Lucky away. I loved being just as clean as the next person, but the thought of having to take a fourth shower today was too much. And a shower was the only thing that got the red glitter off the last time. Who, me? A pageant contestant? She asked, laughing without smiling. I can barely manage to put on eyeliner without poking myself in the eye. Wow, it looked like women everywhere could benefit from Lila's eyeliner applicator gadget. Same here, I said, following her into the kitchen, where she lifted the now whistling tea kettle off the stove. She reached into the cupboards and pulled out a fully stocked tea box and gestured for me to choose. I went for the mint tea, which was my all-time favorite. This might sound weird, but you do realize you look almost exactly like Brittany? I asked, unable to restrain myself any longer. It was kind of creepy, especially because Shelby seemed so friendly. Her personality was a polar opposite of Brittany's. Brittany hired me to pose in the before photos for dried gold. I know, it's really dishonest, but I'm drowning in debt from grad school, and I would rather shovel dirt than have to call up my parents and ask for help. But the joke was on me. She didn't have any money to pay me, and I was caught between apartments, so I took that as a sign she could pay me with free rent. She let me move into the second bedroom, which was a much better alternative than moving back home and listening to a lifetime of I told you so's from my family. She explained. Aha! That made more sense. I knew something was slightly off about Brittany's before picture in the pamphlet. No wonder Shelby tried to warn the receptionist not to buy dried gold. Shelby knew it was all a lie. Well, you look fabulous. Brittany was very pretty. On the outside. Lucky was attacking the glass windows and trying to chase his bird friends. He never saw floor-to-ceiling windows, so he was probably wondering why he couldn't simply jump through them, judging by all the kitty thumps on the glass. I might have been worried if he weighed more than four pounds, but he was still pretty tiny. Lucky, stop that, I said, shooing him away with my hands. Oh, please, that cute little angel can do anything he wants, Shelby said with an affectionate lilt in her voice. She watched Lucky doing more somersaults against the glass windows in his feeble attempts to break through. Did you know that Brittany received stalker mail at this apartment? I asked, failing to see how Shelby could have been the culprit. This woman was either putting on an Oscar-worthy performance, or she was a genuinely nice person, one I couldn't imagine ever sending fake ultimatums to her roommate. You mean the one she sent to herself so she could get a date with Officer Lockwood? She asked, rolling her eyes. Are you serious? I said, with eyes as wide as saucers. I was shocked, possibly appalled, but not at all surprised that Brittany would do something like that. She pulled a gone girl by sending those letters to herself as an excuse to file a fake police report so she could date that poor unsuspecting cop. She said. Did you know the police think you sent those letters to Brittany? I said. Yes, another idea she planted in Wesley's head. Shelby said, clenching her jaw from the memory. 
but the joke's on her. She detailed her entire stupid plan in her diary, which the police found this afternoon. Brittany always did like being the center of attention, but to fake a stalking scenario seemed so desperate. She could have just approached Wesley at a bar or pretended to bump into him on the street even. Clover Creek was a small town. It wouldn't have been that hard to do. Brittany always had a flair for the melodramatic and probably enjoyed the whole damsel in distress setup. Shelby seemed so normal. I couldn't believe anyone would knowingly choose to be roommates with Brittany. How did Brittany find you? I asked. Were the two of you friends? From an online ad seeking lookalikes for beauty marketing, she's the one that actually paid for the highlights and extensions so we'd look more alike, she said, pulling out her driver's license and showing me her brunette hair. But it all worked out because my boyfriend loves me as a blonde. That's great, I said. I was pretty sure most guys loved blondes, or maybe it just felt like that when you were a brunette. I'm pretty sure Brittany had no friends. I never saw her with anyone but her pageant coach and Wesley. And as for last night, she left yesterday morning and that was the last I saw of her. The police already searched her room and took her laptop and her diary. She said, pointing to the room past the kitchen. Do you mind if I take a look? I asked. Are you trying to solve the crime by yourself? She asked. Kind of. Wesley is their number one suspect, and I know for sure he didn't do it. I'm worried that the police won't do everything they can to find the real killer, I said. Well, you can cross me off your suspect list. I have an ironclad alibi. I was with my boyfriend all night in Bangor at an association dinner. Two hundred witnesses will confirm it, along with tons of photos and video clips, she said. That did sound pretty ironclad as far as alibis went. Having complete strangers vouch for you was the ultimate alibi confirmation. I do hope they find out who killed Brittany. She wasn't the nicest person or even a halfway decent roommate. But no one deserves to die like that, especially someone so young. Despite the fact that she looked exactly like Brittany, who never cared about anyone but herself, I could hear the concern in her voice. Plus, she loved kittens. Anyone who loved kittens couldn't be a bad person. She nodded and gestured for me to follow her. It looked like Brittany took the larger master bedroom suite. The entire room was in shambles. Her bed was unmade, and unfolded clothes were strewn about everywhere, along with half-eaten food on the dresser and empty shopping bags. Wow, the police really tore this room apart, I said. They actually helped tidy it up. It looks like this most of the time, said Shelby. Cleaning wasn't at the top of her priority list, or any list at all. That explained a lot, like how Brittany could date Wesley for two entire months without being totally grossed out from the mold growing inside his apartment like a petri dish. Unless her aversion to cleaning and addiction to shopping were crimes, there wasn't much to be found in this room. I checked under drawers for anything taped to the bottom and inside her shoeboxes and makeup cases, but found nothing. I sighed. So much for solving this case today. Here, you can take these with you, Shelby said, handing me back my box of cupcakes. Oh, you don't like cupcakes? I asked. The police said she was poisoned by cupcakes, so it's probably a sign I should stay on my diet and stick to fruit and veggies, she said. I actually lost 30 pounds since moving in with Brittany. She doesn't allow any carbs or dairy in the apartment, which were always my worst temptations. It was a sign from the universe that I should be thin. Karma brought me and Brittany together. I wasn't sure if I would classify any of this as the universe is doing, but I could see what she meant. That's great. Congratulations on the weight loss. But I thought she was strangled, I asked. Shelby threw up her hands in defeat. That's what they told me. They searched the kitchen, though, looking for more cupcakes. I thanked Shelby for the tea and for allowing me to poke around. I gave her my card if she thought of anything else and picked up Lucky, who somehow grabbed yet another red glitter ribbon. 
dragging it out of his little kitty claws. I pocketed it in my jeans, but it was too late. Catching a glimpse of our reflection in the old glass elevator, I saw we were both covered once again in red glitter. Chapter 8 After leaving the wharf area, I took off for the medical examiner's office. I was hoping the same person who spoke to me at the crime scene would be there. If Brittany were truly poisoned, he would know. The coroner's office was a small one-story brick building on the edge of town, near the main hospital, and directly across the street from a funeral parlor, which made sense. I'd never been to a coroner's office before, but I imagined they wouldn't want a little kitten running around contaminating evidence. I clipped Lucky into the bottom of his carrier, but left the top unzipped so he could look around. He was excited at first, until he realized he couldn't jump out and released an exasperated kitty yowl. Sorry, little guy. We'll pick up your kitty Bjorn from the dry cleaners tomorrow afternoon, I said, giving him a kitty treat. If Shelby were leery about eating my cupcakes, I expected the medical examiner would be too, not to mention the ick factor of eating inside a morgue. I left the cupcakes in the car, locked it up, and headed to the front glass double doors. There was no receptionist at the front desk, so I ventured into the back. Hello? I called out. Luckily, the same medical examiner I saw at the crime scene last night came out from the back. He was dressed in scrubs and a white jacket. Can I help you? He asked, removing his gloves and placing them in the hazardous medical waste bin. Yes, do you remember me? I was the one that found Brittany Westerhide's body last night, I said. Oh, right, he replied with a smile. Like I said, you couldn't have saved her. She was dead long before you got there. It would have been too late to perform CPR or even call 911 for help. Right, but I heard that. I was suddenly cut off by bright, shining lights before I could finish my sentence. Are we live? asked Tessa, tapping her microphone before getting the thumbs up from the cameraman. Hello and welcome to 10 Minutes with Tessa. We're live here at the Clover Creek Coroner's Office with Ava Decker, whose killer cupcakes poisoned Brittany Westerhide. Tell us, Ava, why did you do it? Tessa popped her microphone in front of my face. Tessa was fast. I literally just parked the car a few minutes ago and got here. When I didn't answer, Tessa pulled the mic back and continued her accusations. Is this because Brittany was dating Wesley? A man whom you developed a huge crush on? You couldn't bear to see him with anyone but you? Asked Tessa, throwing the mic in front of my face again. No, that's not true. Officer Lockwood and I are just friends. I never had a crush on him. He's free to date whomever he chooses. I managed to stammer out. Is that why you were at his house earlier today? Asked Tessa. Have you been following me? I asked. Interesting. Are you evading the question? She asked. Brittany was strangled, not poisoned, right? I said, turning to the coroner for his confirmation. No, er, uh, yes. Technically, a trace of poison was found in the cupcakes and her stomach contents. But that's not what killed her, he said, looking visibly annoyed. Leave it to Tessa to have that effect on people. Got impatient, did ya? Couldn't wait for your poison cupcakes to kick in. Is that why you strangled her? Asked Tessa, dropping the mic in front of my face for an answer again. Look here. This is a morgue, not a TV studio. You both have to leave. The M.E. said, ushering us out, which was more than fine by me. As long as Tessa remained there... It was obvious he wouldn't share any extra information, especially now that he knew I was the one that supplied Brittany with the poisoned cupcakes. Did no one imagine how easy it was to douse previously purchased cupcakes with traces of poison? Despite being ousted from the medical examiner's office, Tessa kept going full steam at me with more accusations. Did you get the dosage wrong on your toxic killer cupcakes? 
asked Tessa. First of all, please stop calling them killer cupcakes. Second, why would you assume that I poisoned them? I asked. So much for not being a suspect. The police report. Well, there went any hope that they didn't think I was a suspect. No one's contacted me. I'm sure I'd be under arrest if that were really the case. Or maybe you strangled Brittany after your killer cupcakes failed to do the job because you wanted Officer Wesley Lockwood all to yourself? Asked Tessa. I heard you shared a victory talk with him right after it happened at the crime scene. Cut to commercial! Hollered her cameraman. Ignoring Tessa, I googled the news and found an article that validated Trey's amounts of antifreeze were found in the cupcake sitting next to Brittany, but ultimately weren't what killed her. They would have given her an upset stomach and nausea, but no more, based on the minimal amount of poison contained in each one. And we're back in three, two, said the cameraman, counting down with his fingers. And we're back to the jilted broad, Ava Decker, the prime suspect in the murder of Brittany Westerhide. Ava, is there anything you want to share with our viewers? She asked. The first few times that Tessa launched a surprise attack on me with her camera, I was taken completely off guard and fumbled by trying to defend myself from her accusation that I coldly murdered my former boss. But now that I was a seasoned victim, I knew better. Do you really want to be wrong about two murders in a row? I asked. Based on your track record, I think it's safe to say whomever you claim the murderer is cannot possibly be the murderer. Win for me. Now it was Tessa's turn to look flustered, but she recovered quickly. Great way to throw the suspicion off yourself. That's exactly something a real killer would say. I did not murder anyone and if there was any poison found in those cupcakes, it was put there after I sold them to Brittany. I said directly into the camera, not to Tessa. Doing a double eye roll, I headed to my car, or rather, to my parents' Hyundai Santa Fe. In a few more days, they'd return from my honeymoon world cruise that Ben insisted we splurge on. Too bad his credit card was spared the splurge instead of mine. I dropped Lucky's cat carrier into the passenger seat and buckled him in. The carrier featured a seat belt strap to hold it in place. It was probably overkill, but I preferred to err on the side of caution. I sped off before Tessa could follow me again. With all of her camera equipment and lighting, Tessa couldn't move as quickly as I did. I peeked in my rear view mirror and saw her trying to do just that, despite the odds. I hit the gas and put more distance between us. Being on a local rural road, there wasn't another exit for at least five more miles, so I had to make some headway if I hoped to escape her clasping talons. As if sensing my hysteria, Lucky hopped up and down frantically in his kitty carrier, fighting the leash that tethered him to the bottom of it. He started gnawing at the leash with his itty-bitty teeth. Lucky, just relax. We'll be back home any minute, and you'll be free to roam wherever you want, little guy. I said with a loving glance to prove my point. When I looked back at the road, a white-tailed mama deer ran out in front of the car, chasing a tiny baby deer. Upon seeing me, she stopped dead in the middle of the road. Now I understood where that expression came from. She looked just as surprised as I was. I slammed on the brakes and when the deer didn't even try to get out of the road, I swerved to the right to avoid her and careened straight into a field of potatoes. If you've never driven through a potato field, I can confirm it's not all that great on your car. First of all, since it was spring, the potatoes were in season, fully ripe and ready to be picked. Being the hugest they would ever become made for a very bumpy ride. Second, the amount of water required to sustain potato growth was pretty significant, which resulted in a very muddy terrain. By the time my parents' SUV came to a halt, it sank a good footer deeper into the potato field. Any attempts to move the car forwards or backwards simply turned the mud into quicksand. For once, I was glad that someone was following me. I needed some help getting out of here. 
My phone dislodged from its holder on the front dash, and the screen cracked into a spider web of broken glass. Lucky was too afraid to meow. His kitty eyes dilated until they were as huge as his kitty wet food cans. He backed up as far as he could inside the carrier. Aw, Lucky, it's okay, little guy. We're safe now, I said. This was probably my punishment from the universe for speeding. The immature part of me wanted to blame Tessa, but the truth was she knew where I lived. She would have ended up there whether or not she remained on my tail. I unlatched the carrier from the passenger seat and slung Lucky over my shoulder. Heading out to the road to flag down Tessa, I also looked for the deer that was wandering around. When I stepped out of the car, my foot immediately sank into the soft, watery mud. It was right then that I knew I had to take yet another shower today. That would make a total of four showers in one day. At this rate, I might as well just stay in the shower until midnight to avoid any more soiling events. I sloshed through the mud, thankful for my height at 5 feet 11 inches. If I were any shorter, I'd be up to my thighs in a mud bath. With a silent thank you to the universe that Lucky's kitty Bjorn was still at the cleaners and he was safely strapped in his kitty carrier and seat belted, I made a mental note to purchase a second one that I could keep permanently installed in the car, like a baby seat. Sometimes I let Lucky roam the dashboard while I drove. Looking at the shattered remains of my phone, I almost cried at the thought of what could have happened to him. Back on the road, I saw the mama deer and her baby safely on the other side, fully unharmed. The SUV could be fixed, but the deer could not. I knew I made the right call. I heard and saw Van in the distance approaching, and I waved my arms in the air. But Tessa was on her cell phone in the passenger seat, and the driver appeared to be too. Hey! I yelled, jumping up and down. There was no one else on the road in either direction. I had maybe three seconds before they blew past and didn't even see me. Tessa! I hollered at the van as it whizzed by, but still nothing. I guessed that was one way to get rid of Tessa. Drive myself off the road and then jump up and down asking for her help. Chapter 9 I hiked back to the medical examiner's office, who mercifully let me in when he saw the mud-covered state I was in. In exchange for not probing him with any more questions, he let me use the phone and wait in the lobby. Fortunately, I had Ruby's cell number memorized, and it was a Sunday, so I knew she wasn't working. Lucky finally calmed down long enough to resume playing with the red glitter ribbon I stashed in my front pocket earlier when we left Shelby's apartment. At this point, a shower was inevitable, so why bother trying to keep us both clean? Don't worry, little guy. Auntie Ruby will be here to rescue us any minute, I said when I heard his little kitty stomach growling. Or maybe that was mine. My afternoon chocolate milkshakes felt like a millennia ago. Plus all of the walking to get back to the medical examiner's office with a cat carrier, a purse, and 20 pounds of caked on mud had to burn a ton of calories. As if on cue, I heard Ruby's car pulling up a few minutes later. When the medical examiner's door opened, Lucky hopped out of my lap and crawled up Ruby's leg until he was safely ensconced in her arms. Oh, Lucky, did you miss me? She asked, giving him a warm hug to her chest before looking over at me. She put Lucky down and gave me the I'm so glad you're still alive, Hardison family hug. It wasn't a whole lot different from a regular hearty Hardison hug, but it came with four pats at the end, versus the standard two. It's okay, I'm alive, I said, hugging her back. I was so worried. I can't believe you totaled your parents' car. And whoa, you weren't kidding when you said you were muddy, she said the minute she saw all the mud plastered on me and now on her after her overzealous signature hug. Don't worry. The plus side of getting stranded in a medical examiner's office is plenty of plastic wrap, I said, pulling out a huge sheet of it that the coroner was nice enough to let me have. 
I opened the car door and placed it down as a protective layer on the driver and passenger seats, as well as the floorboard areas, before we both stepped inside. You are such an animal lover. All this for Bambi? She asked. They were so cute. If I weren't so busy crashing my parents' car into a potato field, I so would have taken a picture for you. I said with a smile at the memory. Taking pictures while driving wouldn't have resulted in an accident, right? As she drove me home, I caught her up on my day and relayed my meeting with the other pageant contestants, my food disaster lunch with Marcus, my mortification over Wesley's apparent aversion to basic domestic hygiene and home cleaning supplies, my meeting with Brittany's doppelganger roommate, Shelby, and the dried gold scam Brittany was running on her receptionist, Joelle. In the end, I told her how Tessa cornered me, and I learned the cupcakes I gave Brittany were somehow poisoned. Did you hear me? I asked when Ruby didn't respond. Oh, I heard you, said Ruby. What happened to letting the police do their job? Frost had opened at noon tomorrow, so I had to get everything I wanted to investigate about the murder in today. It's not like I'm stopping them from doing their job. I'm just a concerned citizen, I said. And you're the one who set me up with Marcus to ask him about the other pageant contestant suspects. I set you up with Marcus for a lunch date, during which you promised not to ask him anything about the murder, she said. At this point, I do have to figure out who the real killer is now that both Wesley and I are prime suspects, I said. Uh-huh said Ruby, coming to a rolling stop in front of my house. All right, are you ready for shower number four? I asked Lucky. Four in one day? asked Ruby. I took my normal morning shower, then after spilling lunch on myself, I smelled like lobster rolls without the benefit of actually eating them, so that was shower number two. I told Ruby while doing a countdown on my fingers. Her eyes grew wider by the minute. Then I was covered in some weird green slimy mold after visiting Wesley's apartment, which justified shower number three. And now, I need to wash off the potato field mud in more Brittany ribbon glitter. I said, holding up Lucky, who was also covered in it. Lucky reached out and put a paw on Ruby's face, imprinting her cheek with red glitter to match the other glittered paw prints he left on her when he jumped into her arms at the medical examiner's office. And look, now you're covered in it too, I said, as Ruby assessed the damage in her visor mirror. The last time we were covered in glitter was in high school, when it was still trendy to paint your entire body with it. It's not too late to skip the shower, pick up some glow sticks and go straight to an all-night rave, I said. Chapter 10 the nice part about driving your parents' car was that they were responsible enough to buy AAA coverage, so one phone call took care of everything. I could pick up the Hyundai Santa Fe next week from Clover Creek Collision Auto Repair Shop. Until then, the frosted cupcake truck was my only mode of transportation. The truck was still parked at the county fairgrounds. Between finding Brittany's body, getting a ride home from Marcus, and all the investigating I'd done yesterday, I completely forgot about it. I hoped I didn't have a ticket. Here you go, said Ruby, handing me one of her signature spirulina smoothies the minute I stepped inside her car the next morning. After pretending to like one of them, I was doomed to endure them forever. We all knew I was too wimpy to come clean and tell her what I really thought about spirulina smoothies. Instead of admitting that they made me nearly gag at just the thought of them, I simply smiled and told her I'd eaten a huge breakfast already. Yes, I had all of that plus a spirulina smoothie, I said, patting my stomach to illustrate how full I felt. The real truth? I was starving. While running late this morning, I only managed to feed Lucky and not myself. Ruby gave me a suspicious look when my stomach growled, so I quickly changed the subject. Thanks for giving Lucky and me a ride to the frosted cupcake truck, which is now officially my only mode of transportation, I said. 
My parents' second car was a good two hours away in a long-term parking lot in Portland, close to the location from where their world cruise departed. Why don't you drive that fancy-looking sports car sitting in your garage? It came with the house, didn't it? Asked Ruby. You mean the one where the doors open up to the sky like a spaceship? I asked. I would never understand why that was considered a premium feature. Is there another secret luxury car hiding out in your garage? She asked. No, but you know that I have zero clue how to drive a manual transmission? I said. We always had automatic gear shifts growing up, and my parents were never into sports cars of any kind, which were pretty much the only cars that still had stick shifts in the U.S. Not a frequent European traveler, learning how to drive a stick never reached the top of my priority list. Besides, I'd feel silly driving such an expensive car around Clover Creek. There was a lot of kitty scratching and frustrated groans coming from the back seat. Is Lucky making all that noise? Asked Ruby, peeking into the back seat. He's not used to being confined in the car. He prefers roaming around on the dashboard and hopping back and forth between the front and back at will. I said, unzipping the carrier slightly and dropping in some kitty treats to try and appease him. Safety first, little man. I said, with a gentle pat on the carrier lid. Lucky responded with another angry yowl. Can't blame you after yesterday, Ruby said to me as she turned towards the back. Just ten more minutes. We're almost there, Lucky. More scratching ensued from inside the carrier. Ruby changed the radio station to a classical one that was playing Mozart. I gave her a weird look. What? It works on human babies, she said. It could have been the music, the treats, or because Lucky was just bored but he gave up trying to escape and stopped yowling. I gave Ruby a high five and made a note of the station she tuned into. It looked like my future consisted of car rides that featured baby Mozart on the radio. Back to your car. If you can't drive it, just sell it. I bet it's worth a ton of money, she said. What if I could, but I can't find the title. I've looked everywhere in that house and at the bakery. It wasn't listed on the official paperwork I received from Francine's lawyer. I replied. I'd only recently gotten the Swiss boarding school off my back after claiming the house and the bakery were theirs. If they knew about the sports car, they'd probably renew their lawsuit all over again. I would have checked with Francine's lawyer, Wendy, but she was dead. What about checking with Wendy? Said Ruby before stopping herself. Yikes! I can't believe I forgot that Wendy Roberts is dead. But what about her brother, Tyler? They shared the law practice together. I'm sure they have the record somewhere. Possibly. Wendy faked my entire inheritance as part of a bigger scam to frame me for my boss's murder, so it was more likely that all the original documents and paperwork were now sitting in a landfill somewhere. The car must have been overlooked in the process. That's a great idea. I said, but not for the reason that Ruby mentioned. I couldn't care less about an overpriced sports car. Tyler Roberts was the very person that Brittany was supposedly cheating on Wesley with. I totally forgot to ask Shelby if she knew Tyler. Alibi or not, he had to know something about her death, or at the very least have a hunch who might have wanted to kill her. You know, cars depreciate in value the minute they're driven off the lot and exponentially after that. The sooner you sell it, the better the price if you want to reap the full value, said Ruby, spoken like a true insurance expert. Five hours later, my new cupcake bakery assistant and I had the entire display case flush with fresh desserts before I flipped the closed sign to open. I grabbed a four-pack of salted caramel vanilla cupcakes and left my assistant in charge as I headed out to Tyler Roberts' law office. It was a quick five-minute walk. Pretty much all businesses were located in Town Square, the closest thing Clover Creek had to a downtown. I'd been extra lucky to inherit such a prime location in Town Square. It was very close to the fountain, which was a main attraction for sitting down and lounging. I went a couple doors down from Frosted and picked up my dry cleaning, 
which included Lucky's beloved kitty Bjorn. I hung the dry cleaning in the frosted cupcake truck, which I'd be driving us home in tonight. Saturday's warm spring weather had all but disappeared. Maine was back to its normal wet and cold April weather. It was also pretty windy out, so being buttoned up inside my coat was Lucky's favorite spot. I regularly bought all of my coats two sizes too big so that I could button them up around Lucky. He peeked out, not wanting to miss a single thing. I looked longingly at Claire's ice cream sandwich shop where a huge line extended out the door despite the crisp weather. I'd have to stop there on my way back. Her double salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwiches were my favorite. It was already noon, and I worried that Tyler might take off for lunch soon. The Roberts Law Offices were completely unchanged from the last time I was here. The building was an older, colonial style, with a narrow entrance that led to a small foyer area. No receptionist. Four doors radiated from the main hallway. One door led to Wendy Roberts' office, which looked completely untouched since she died. Another to her brother's office the third to the bathroom, and the fourth to the conference room. All of the doors except Wendy's office were closed, so I knocked on Tyler's door. At least I remembered it as Tyler's office door the last time I'd been here. I heard giggling and some office supplies falling on the ground, which resulted in more giggling. One minute! Called out a high-pitched voice that sounded a lot like Shelby's. What was Brittany's roommate doing here? It's Ava Decker. I'm looking for Tyler Roberts. I called out. The door flew open and a disheveled Shelby appeared. Her face flushed like she'd been working out. Or rather, making out. As evidenced by Tyler buttoning up his shirt behind her at the desk. Ava, what are you achoo, doing here? asked Shelby, with a warm smile between sneezes. I was about to ask her the same thing, but since she beat me to it, I answered first. I came by to ask Tyler about some legal paperwork that his sister, Wendy, worked on for me a couple months ago. I said, Oh, sure. I didn't know Tyler had an appointment. She said, sneezing again. His lucky with you? She looked behind me for a cat carrier. I forgot about her allergies. Not knowing she would be here, it wasn't my fault that I brought Lucky along. As if on cue, Lucky pulled himself out of his kitty Bjorn and jumped into Shelby's arms, thereby activating her allergies even more. Do you carry him around in your coat? That is so cute. You are so adorable she said, snuggling up to Lucky. I should really put you down, but you're just so choo, cuddly and lovable. Oblivious to the allergy attack he was causing, Lucky did his usual kitty neck snuggle any time he met someone he liked. Do you have an allergy pill? I asked, reaching out for Lucky. I can take him back to the bakery and return another time to talk to Tyler if that helps. No, please. I really want a kitten. I'm actually on my way to see an allergy doctor to ask if there's a shot I can get. Tyler's all yours, but only for legal advice. He's completely off the market otherwise, she said with a wink. You're dating Tyler, I asked, stating the obvious. That made more sense. When Wesley thought he saw Brittany cheating on him, it was really Shelby. I couldn't blame him. Even up close, they were practically clones of each other. I told you I went to an association dinner with him in Bangor the night Brittany was murdered, she said. Tyler was the keynote speaker for the main bar association's annual meeting. She did say boyfriend in Bangor association dinner, but she never said her boyfriend was Tyler Roberts. It all made sense now. Wesley thought he was seeing Brittany making out with Tyler but it was really Shelby. Tyler was never brought in for questioning because both he and Shelby were in Bangor all night, and if he were the keynote speaker, that was the most ironclad of all alibis. And let me guess, you've been together for two months? I asked, 
since it directly coincided with when Shelby moved in with Brittany. Yes, we were just celebrating our two-month anniversary. Tyler helped Brittany and me work out the contract for the dried gold promo, and Tyler and I have been together every day since then, she said, looking at him with stars practically shooting from her eyes. Tyler was now fully dressed and presentable. He answered by placing a loving arm around her shoulder and pulling her in closer. Aw, they were so cute together. I never met him before. He had thick, wavy brown hair and brown eyes. He looked like he stepped right out of an Ivy League college brochure. Like his sister, Wendy, he was a little on the short side and definitely had to look up at me to say hello. But he was just perfect for Shelby, who was a petite five foot three inches. I'm so sorry about your sister, I said, feeling horrible for never reaching out to him after everything that happened. Wendy did try to scam me initially, but eventually decided to do what was right and confess. Only she never got a chance. Don't worry, I don't blame you for anything. It sounds like you were the victim in that whole inheritance scam. But I'm glad you got to keep everything. I heard an anonymous donation was received by the Swiss boarding school to whom the estate was originally supposed to go, prompting them to drop the entire lawsuit, he said. That's actually what I was here to see you about, I said. That's my cue to Achoo! leave, said Shelby, kissing Tyler on the cheek goodbye and handing Lucky back to me. After Shelby left, Tyler invited me to sit in his office. I explained the missing paperwork for the mystery sports car in my garage and why I wanted to sell it. He promised me that he'd take a look through Wendy's papers and computer files. He purposely left her office as it was, just for purposes like this. I gave him my card. I decided to hold on to the cupcakes since his sister was poisoned by them. It felt a little tacky to provide them as a gift, even though I wasn't the one who poisoned them. They'd been doused after the fact, which was probably exactly what happened to the ones that I gave to Brittany. I was about to leave until I thought of one more question. Your office was in contact with the Swiss boarding school? Do you happen to know anything about the anonymous donor? Or possibly any way I could send the donor a thank you card? I asked. I still didn't believe Tessa's theory that Ben was the one who made the donation on my behalf, but she'd been so persistent that now I wasn't sure. Why stick me with all of our wedding credit card debt and then make a multi-million dollar donation on my behalf? It didn't add up. Organizations like that are pretty close-lipped on their anonymous benefactors, but I can confirm that the school's administrator did refer to the donor as a she, he said. As for the thank you card, I can definitely send one to them on your behalf. They might forward it on, or they might not. A she? Well, that was either Ben doing a really great job of covering his tracks, or, as usual, Tessa not getting the full story. I started to pull out my phone to text her, until I remembered it was broken. If I simply waited, Tessa and her camera would eventually find me, provided I didn't actually require any roadside assistance. I was also dying to give Wesley the update on Shelby and Tyler, but without a phone, it had to wait. Not a chance I could return to his place without a level 4 hazmat suit. Chapter 11 After leaving Tyler's office, I popped into Claire's ice cream shop for a double salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwich that I shared with Lucky. Claire's was across the street from Frosted, and Ruby's office was by the fountain, so I headed over there afterwards. Ruby fell in love with the idea of relocating to New York after graduation, but when her dad retired early and left her the family insurance business, she stayed local. If Ruby couldn't go to New York, she decided to bring New York to her. She started by completely renovating the Hardison Insurance Office from a single-floor cottage to a four-story glass-and-steel vertical monolith. It was very cosmopolitan. The all-glass elevator was like the one in Brittany and Shelby's apartment building, and she also installed an indoor waterfall. By now, I knew everyone at the front desk by name. 
They waved me in as soon as I walked through the doors. Ruby's office was on the fourth floor, the penthouse, as she liked to call it. I was just about to make a spirulina smoothie for lunch. Did you want one? She asked. Geez, how many spirulina smoothies could she drink before she turned into one? Didn't you just have one for breakfast? I asked, half joking, half serious. Right after I dropped you off, I stopped at my parents' house. My dad made your favorite brownie batter chocolate chip pancakes with that Madagascar vanilla ice cream brand you like, she said. I left you a text to come over. Even though I had just inhaled an entire ice cream sandwich, I was hungry all over again just thinking about Mr. Hardison's amazing pancakes. And the best part was, he didn't make small wimpy plates of two or three pancakes, but created actual stacks of pancakes, totaling at least ten or more. They were like the Eiffel Tower of pancake goodness, and nothing short of life-changing. I heard a squeaky wincing sound. It was coming from me. I let out a huge sigh of disappointment and pulled out my broken iPhone with its cracked screen. Brownie batter chocolate chip pancakes was all I could utter. Ruby placed a hand on my shoulder. Oops, I totally forgot you didn't have a working phone. Let's go to the mall. There's an Apple store in Fashion Plaza. You can pick up a new iPhone and I can grab a new laptop for the office. She said as she dropped all of her spirulina smoothie items into the Vitamixer. And anything else we see that needs to come home with us? I added. I wasn't a shopaholic or anything, and technically my credit cards were still maxed out from all the wedding expenses, but I did have a wad of cash from the weekend county fair burning a hole in my purse. I could just kick myself for not letting Ruby gift me with wedding cancellation insurance. At the time, I thought it would be bad luck to even consider needing it, but from now on, I was buying every insurance option available to me for every occasion, even a funeral. You just never knew. Exactly, said Ruby with a wink after throwing back her smoothie and grabbing her keys. And will your dad pull a Groundhog Day and redo a pancake breakfast for us tomorrow? I asked, biting my lower lip. For sure, said Ruby. I'll text him now. Two hours and two thousand dollars later, I had a working phone. This time I signed up for Apple Care Insurance. When I activated my phone, there were three voicemails waiting for me. Anything good? asked Ruby as I listened to them. I don't know. I can barely hear them over all the kitty yelling coming from the back, I said. We were on our way back to town square, which meant Lucky was safely zipped up in his kitty carrier, which was securely seat-belted into the back seat. He could see nothing but the roof of the car. Lucky did not care a single iota about kitty car safety. He was all about kitty fun time in the car, which meant hopping to and fro while watching the road from the dashboard. Hold on said Ruby, changing the satellite radio station from the Top 40 to the Baby Mozart channel. A couple minutes later, the yowling stopped, and I replayed my voicemails. The first one was from Wesley, chastising me for poking around in the case. He was a total liar. He'd only know that information if he himself were not staying out of the case. The second one was from Marcus, confirming that we were still on for a behind-the-scenes pageant staff dinner tonight. I could only hope I would not be spilling any food on myself. The third was from Ben, asking if we could talk because he was in town. Just the thought of having to see him again, much less speak with him, filled me with anger, sadness, and dread all at the same time. Did you give Ben my new number? I asked. I already changed it five times to avoid his calls, but he kept getting it and calling. Couldn't he just take a hint? Ruby threw her mouth open into a big O. Oh. As if, she said. You and I both know exactly who gave him your number. Tessa. I had to blame Ruby for always telling me to believe there was good in everyone. Every time Tessa did something mean, she'd turn around and do something nice. It was very confusing. And whenever Tessa did something nice, 
Ruby would sweep in and tell me to give her another chance. With friends like Tessa, who needs enemies? I asked, already contemplating whether to change my number again or not. Please do not change your number again. Maybe Tessa's doing you a favor. Maybe Ben wants to pay off your wedding debt and just needs to know where to wire the money? Asked Ruby, trying yet again to put a silver lining on Tessa's shady moves. I seriously doubt that's what he wants, I said. In the ten years I dated Ben, the only person he ever voluntarily coughed up money for was his mother. Otherwise, he was more of an everyman-for-himself type when it came to finances. Then what does he want? asked Ruby. Apparently, he's in town and wants to talk, I said. He can't drive 15 minutes down the street to attend his own wedding, but he can hop on a plane and fly all the way across the country? She asked. I could tell she was still sore about her lost airline miles, even though she claimed she wasn't. Every time I offered to pay her back for them, she said it was no big deal, but I think that was only because she knew how much Frosted was struggling. Do you think Tessa flew him out here? I asked, already dialing her number. Well, if it isn't the Clover Creek version of Sonic the Hedgehog, said Tessa when she answered. Try Crash Bandicoot, I said. There were no car accidents reported yesterday, and I would have seen if there were, said Tessa, assuming she was calling my bluff. It was a one-person accident, unless you count the unharmed deer. I crashed my car into the potato field to avoid hitting Bambi's mother and was trying to flag you down for help, but you and your cameraman were both too busy looking at your phones to even notice me, I said. Oh, she said, clearly still processing the new information. Really? Yes, you almost hit me while I was jumping up and down, waving my arms all around to get your attention from the shoulder of the road. I said. Yeah, well, you shouldn't have been going so fast in the first place. She said, absolving herself of all guilt. Thanks for your sage advice, Tessa. I wasn't sure what I was expecting. Possibly a sorry, maybe even an, are you okay? But not a blame reversal where the whole thing was my fault. Is that all you were calling for? To try and guilt me into feeling bad about your reckless driving? She asked. Well, if it were, I clearly failed. I was calling to find out if you're the one that keeps giving Ben my new phone number. I said. Well, how else can he apologize to you? She asked. I groaned into the phone. I was trying to do you a favor. You deserve to know why you were abandoned at your own wedding. Girl power! She said, like that last catchphrase explained everything. Girl power would be listening to me when I told you that I had zero interest in ever speaking to Ben again. Why do you think I moved all the way to the opposite end of the country? I asked. Ava, I am your friend, she said, to which I scoffed. You may think you're moving on, but you're clearly not. Brittany managed to edge in on Wesley because you still need closure with a man who broke your heart in front of the entire world, and in the worst way possible, by sending his mother to make a big joke out of it. You deserve better. Now I was confused. She sounded like she cared, but I knew she was just out for ratings. As if reading my thoughts, she added, And yes, if I'm able to get some more viewers in the process, then so be it. Us girls need to stick together. Don't you want me to be a successful TV news journalist? I'm sure you'd do the same if the situation were reversed. If someone left you at the altar... I would comfort you with your favorite cupcakes, a Hallmark movie, and some hot cocoa with extra marshmallows. Not a surprise attack with your ex in tow. What were you thinking by flying him out here? I asked. I didn't even know your show had that kind of budget. We don't. I didn't fly him out here. He flew himself, said Tessa. I wasn't sure whether to be more angry that he had the money to fly out here when he could have sent me all that cash to help pay down some of the wedding bills, or that he was here. 
No chance you'll let me film your reunion meeting? She asked. I think we both know the answer to that one. I said. Well, it's a good thing I know how to track you down. She said. Yeah, like last night where I practically jumped in front of your van to get your attention while you just drove by? I asked. Chapter 12 If Ben were really in town, then he was probably trying to find me, and I still wasn't ready to talk to him. I had one huge advantage. In our entire ten years of dating, Ben never once came to Maine. Each time I asked him to fly back with me for Easter, Thanksgiving, or Christmas, he always refused. Ben's mother required Ben to spend all holidays with his real family, which translated to her. Until we were officially married, she told me I was just another random girl dating her son. While it did hurt my feelings at the time, I now had the upper hand. Ben had no clue about Clover Creek or where I liked to go. I asked my baking assistant to close up Frosted for me before heading home so I could get ready for my dinner with Marcus. Ruby took Lucky with her back to her office. I planned to meet up with them after dinner. Not only was Marcus perfectly on time, but he had a huge bouquet of roses in his hand. I couldn't remember the last time I'd gotten roses or any flowers. Ben only bought flowers for his mother. He said that was their special thing, so if he also gave flowers to me, it would take away the exclusivity from his mother. Instead, he said our time together was what really mattered. Not that spending quality time together wasn't important, but a girl liked getting flowers once in a while. Wow, thanks. I haven't gotten roses since high school, I said, taking the flowers out of his hands and inhaling their fresh scent of... Was that plastic? Oh, sorry for the confusion. Those are Lila's flowers for the pageant, he said. Never before had dropping food on myself seemed immensely more appealing than right now. Could a huge hole simply open up and swallow me? Was it too much to ask for a sinkhole to suddenly appear beneath my feet? Oh, right. Duh, of course, I said, handing them back to Marcus. They have glitter on them, and they're plastic. Lila asked me to pick them up for her when she forgot them, and since we're on our way to the pageant appreciation dinner, which is where she's at right now, he explained, placing them inside the car. Having Marcus's driver witness everything only made this moment that much worse. We briefly locked eyes in the rearview mirror, but he quickly looked away. I went to hug Lucky until I remembered he was with Ruby. It figured I was without my emotional support animal when I actually needed him. We drove the rest of the way in silence, while I pretended that I had to answer some urgent cupcake bakery emails, as if there really were such a thing. By the time we made it to the fancy Italian restaurant on the wharf, I'd completed about twenty breathing exercises in my effort to remove the embarrassing red blush from my face. All of the contestant judges are flying in from Miss America headquarters tomorrow morning, but I thought you'd want to meet the local Clover Creek staff, helping out behind the scenes. Tonight is the pageant appreciation dinner for all the contestants and staff, said Marcus, popping out of the car and extending his hand out to help me exit. I thought the judges would be local, I asked. I honestly knew less than nothing about pageants, but it seemed a little extreme to have officials from Miss America headquarters, wherever that was, fly into tiny little Clover Creek. Although nothing about this pageant was normal, from choosing to hold it here or having a tech billionaire sponsor it, especially after one of the contestants was killed the week of the pageant. Pageant judges can be from anywhere, as long as they're certified by the official governing pageant body. Since this was last minute and it's our first one, they offered to help us out by supplying the judges, he said. There went my theory that Brittany paid off one of the pageant judges to throw the contest in her favor. There was no way she'd know who they were going to send. She could certainly never coordinate such a plot 
without some sort of paper trail if they weren't local. Plus, it looked like her entire budget went to clothes and makeup. I doubted there was a lot left over for bribery. There was a private room set up in the back with a buffet and a beautiful view of the water. This is a great venue for an appreciation dinner, I said to Marcus. The full moon glimmering off the ocean didn't hurt either. No wonder getting a reservation at Bencotos was so difficult. The only thing ruining it was the ultra-strong perfume smell that breezed through the front doors. I recognized the pervasive scent from when I crashed the pageant rehearsals the other day at the auditorium. As soon as Marcus took off to find Lila, I felt long, pointy nails grabbing onto my bicep and pulling me back. Are you the baker that has been illegally slipping cupcakes to my pageant girls? asked a short, blonde woman in a thick Russian accent. It was Katerina, the pageant coach. I recognized her from the talent rehearsals yesterday. Honesty was the backbone of my being, but for some reason, being in Katerina's presence scared me into wanting to lie. It's better than dried gold, right? I asked, trying to deflect her anger at me, since I knew that was something she hated. That's debatable she said, sniffing her nose at me in contempt. I could feel the wheels turning in her brain while she did a small walk around me, assessing every physical shortcoming I possessed, which was a lot. You're one of those mean girls I hear so much about in America. Wait, what? Nothing about me eating one too many cupcakes or needing to learn how to properly apply eyeliner? This was worse. Way worse. I was not a mean girl. Brittany was a mean girl. I was never once in my life described as a mean girl. I was the nice girl. I was trying to be nice, I said. Since when did providing free cupcakes constitute being the mean girl? By providing fat-laden sugary products to women before they parade across the stage in bikinis in a competition they've been dreaming about winning, possibly their entire lives? She asked. Do you stop off at bodybuilder competitions and fitness races and give them pre-competition cupcakes too? Maybe they can hire you as their personal pastry chef for the American Ninja Show? All right, when she put it that way... I could see her point. I can also make sugar-free spirulina smoothies, I offered weakly. Giving out green liquefied veggies could be my other go-to icebreaker gift when it came to chatting up pageant contestants. Her disdainful look started to soften, and her pointy nails even retracted a little. That would be an improvement. Who are you and why are you here anyway? Despite being a good seven inches shorter than me, I got the feeling she was looking down on me, not the other way around. Marcus reappeared and stepped in. Ava is my date and also a very well-meaning person who wasn't trying to ruin anyone's chances of winning the pageant, but to share the joys of eating her amazingly scrumptious stuffed cupcake creations. I glanced over and gave him a grateful smile. Prince Charming's real name? was Marcus Palmer, and he slayed dragons known as pageant coaches. You know what they say about good intentions and the road to you know where. Maybe think next time before you just go dropping your cupcakes off willy-nilly to anyone and everyone, Katerina said. Look what happened when Brittany tried to eat them. Why did my cupcakes keep getting associated with murder scenes? although it could have been a great segue into finding out what Katerina knew and if she had any motive to murder Brittany. Yes, that was awful. Do you know anyone who might have wanted to hurt Brittany? I asked. How would I know anything? I'm their coach, not their bestie. She asked, looking borderline annoyed or bored. Yes, I heard wonderful things about your pageant coaching abilities. Brittany said she was learning a lot from you, I said, trying to reel her back with a compliment and find out what she knew about Brittany's murder. According to Shelby, Katerina and Wesley were the only people Brittany ever talked to. 
The only thing she picked up was how to disobey me, she said. If she had listened to me, she wouldn't have sneaked off to eat an entire box of cupcakes by herself, and she might still be alive. I was referring to your mentoring with her so that she could replace you, I said. Geez, she was really hung up on those cupcakes. Katerina's entire expression changed from annoyed to surprised. Replace me? Ha! Huh. She could never replace me. Is that what she told you? She said you were quitting after the show and returning to Russia, I replied. I could have sworn that's what Brittany told me. But then again, who knew? She was always making stuff up. Or maybe it was a secret and I just blew Katarina's cover in front of her boss. Was Marcus her boss? I assumed owning the pageant made you the boss of everyone associated with the production. First of all, I am from Kazakhstan, not Russia. Second, I am not quitting. I don't know why Brittany would say such a thing, she said. All attempts to assuage her annoyance were a total failure. I also realized I knew less than nothing about Eastern European geography. Hearing her say Kazakhstan only made me want to reply with Gesundheit. So you weren't training her to be a pageant coach like you? I asked. I'm sure there was more than one pageant coach in the entire universe. Why couldn't we all be pageant coaches and support the up-and-coming ones? I couldn't believe I was even thinking this, but what about girl power? Even someone like Tessa believed in helping other women. A little misguided, but still, her heart seemed to be in the right place. As if... She couldn't even listen to my simple directions as a contestant. How could she ever coach others? She asked. She had an excellent point. It sounded like the whole coaching mentorship was either a Brittany delusion or a flat-out lie. Katarina excused herself and beelined straight to the table with all of the contestants. She seemed to be reviewing their dinner contents. If Katarina saw even one-fourth of all of the carbs I was planning to enjoy, she'd probably point me out as an example of what not to do. I made a mental note to stay as far away as possible from wherever she was sitting. My ego couldn't handle it. Shall we sit? I asked, partly out of hunger, partly out of pain and suffering from the heels that I chose to wear tonight. I was a ballet flats girl when it came to footwear but something about Marcus made me want to put a little more effort into my appearance, and I was now wearing the world's cutest but most uncomfortable Dorsey pumps. In my defense, it wasn't every day I met a man that was still taller than me with my four-inch heels on. I might never get this opportunity to wear them on a date again. Actually, can you go upstairs and check the women's bathroom? Asked Marcus, holding up Lila's plastic glittery red roses. I promised Lila I'd get these to her right away. I've looked everywhere and can't find her. Her smartwatch says she's right here in this exact spot. But since it's a three-level building, I suspect she's upstairs in the ladies' room. Ugh. I got red again, just thinking about my silly assumption that the flowers were for me. Hiding out in the bathroom sounded like a great idea. I gave him the thumbs up and headed upstairs and towards the back. I'd never been here before, but I saw a small sign that indicated the restrooms were located on the third level. I took the stairs but stopped short on the second floor when I heard Lila's voice. She was under the stairs on a video call with another woman. It looked official and important, so I stayed off to the side, not wanting to interrupt her. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but it sounded like a business deal for her eyeliner doohickey with a major cosmetics company. I agree. These will completely revolutionize the makeup industry. They could be a huge industry disruptor, said Lila, holding up her gadget. Lila Palmer, on behalf of Sterling Cosmetics, I can confirm that we're all very excited about buying your invention and any other ones that you'd like to showcase to us, said the woman on the Palmer Tech smartwatch screen on the other side. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how much this means to me. 
and thank you again for accommodating my pageant rehearsal schedule, said Lila, before tapping her watch a few times. When Lila got up, she was surprised to see me. Hey, Ava, did you hear all of that? Just the very end. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but congratulations. It sounds like you're moving ahead with your dream career. I said, Thanks, but I honestly had no idea Sterling could get back to me so soon, and I haven't had a chance to tell Marcus. She said, Don't worry. Your secret's safe with me. I said, But you should tell him soon. I know he'll be super excited to celebrate that huge win with you. She stepped out from under the stairs and grabbed my hands. I will. I'm just waiting for the right time. Family is very important to him, and I was going to tell him, but ever since Brittany's death, he's been super freaked out about monitoring my GPS location every five minutes. She held up her Palmer smartwatch. He calls when my heart rate gets too high from climbing stairs or doing cardio because he's worried something might be wrong. Wow! Marcus wasn't kidding. That watch really did track and monitor everything. I patted her hand and repeated, But I bet the most important thing to Marcus is that his family is happy. And if creating your own makeup gadget doohickey empire will do that, then he'll be all for it. Lila laughed. Gadget doohickey? Sorry, I didn't mean to belittle your very clever and magical design. I just wasn't sure what to call it. I said, glad that she was laughing and not angry. That's actually perfect. We couldn't think of a name for the company, so I'm going to throw that one into the mix. She said, pulling up her smartwatch and tapping something. Oh no, that's a terrible name. Give me more time, I'll think of something better. I said, putting my hand on her watch to stop her from making that awful name official. Ladies? Marcus's deep voice from behind the stairwell scared us both, and we let out small yelps of surprise. He hopped up the rest of the steps to the top. I didn't mean to startle you. I was just worried when it took you so long to get back. Looking picture perfect doesn't happen in a millisecond. We were still powdering our noses, I said, even though I never powdered my nose once in my life. Well, you both look beautiful, he said motioning towards Lila's glittery red roses that were still in my possession. I immediately handed them over to Lila. Thanks for these. I have to run downstairs for pictures, she said, giving her brother a kiss on the cheek and flashing me a wink before darting off. Marcus held out his arm for me to take as we followed her. I was never so happy to see red roses disappear. Are we ready to interrogate our potential suspects? He asked. Suspects? I asked, doing a double take. I came here to secretly scope the crowd for Brittany's killer, but as far as Marcus knew, I was just being friendly and interested in learning more about beauty pageants. Ruby told me all about your secret investigation, said Marcus, rubbing his hands together like an evil scientist. She did, I replied. That didn't sound like Ruby. Yes, and I'm under strict orders to prevent you from doing so, he said. All right, that did sound like Ruby. There went my night of secret sleuthing into the pageant staff. Don't worry, I'm on Team Decker. Let's solve this thing together. Are you serious? Why would you want to help? I asked. I know Ruby lectured you to remind me to let the police handle it. She most certainly did. But this is the first pageant I've ever sponsored. I don't want it to go down as some tawdry event with a mystery killer at large. Plus, we don't know if someone is purposely tracking pageant contestants, in which case my sister Elila could be in danger. And according to Ruby, you seem to have a knack for solving murders, and I'm supposed to be a genius. So I think this is a sign we're meant to solve this together, he said, holding out his arm for me to take. That was quite the opposite reaction I got from Wesley and Ruby. I had zero responses ready for someone who wanted to help. I was usually in the business of evasive and defensive tactics when it came to the subject of me investigating a murder. Marcus was right. 
This was a sign we should join forces and figure this thing out together. What a nice change to have a willing participant, and not an investigation partner I had to coerce and threaten into helping me. I took his hand and smiled. Let's get going, Watson. Watson? he asked. Well, I'm obviously Sherlock, since I've already solved more murders between the two of us, I said. But you've only solved one, he said. And how many have you solved? I asked. Touché. Lead on, dear Sherlock, he said, sweeping his arm out towards the stairs. We descended to the lower level veranda, which had a gorgeous view of the ocean. Who knew there were romantic spots in Clover Creek, Maine? Marcus proceeded to walk me through the entire 20 person pageant staff. Who knew it took that many people to put on a small town pageant? I met the office administrators, the lighting and stage technicians, the project coordinators, the event planner, everyone but the 50 different local vendors that were sponsoring the event. I didn't even know there were 50 different small businesses in Clover Creek. Now I understood why an actual billionaire had to sponsor this pageant in order to make it happen. Well, what do you think? He asked when we made our way to the buffet, which was good because I was now starving. This is a way bigger production than I could ever imagine, I said. No, I meant, do you think any of them could be the killer? He whispered, checking around to see if anyone were listening or watching us, which they weren't. Recalling Brittany's acidic personality and the way she loved to dole out mean girl advice, it was a definite possibility that everyone here had already experienced some sort of negative run-in with her. But they'd all been hired recently, three weeks at most. Not enough time to build up enough hatred to actually want to murder Brittany. Having known her practically my entire life, I wasn't even at that point yet. Probably not. While no one sounded too sad to see Brittany go, they also didn't seem particularly gleeful about it either. I said, There are other reasons to kill someone, but all of these people were complete strangers to Brittany until three weeks ago. Marcus stroked his chin, surveying the crowd as he pondered my conclusion. I couldn't help but smile as a warm flush of appreciation surged through me. It was nice to be taken seriously for once. Wesley was usually reprimanding me for asking investigative questions while Ruby often warned me that I would get killed myself. You know what we should do? I said, moving in conspiratorially towards Marcus. He raised an eyebrow, prompting me to continue. We should make a murder board of all of our suspects like they do on TV. I did that for the last investigation and it really helped, I said. Never mind that I mistakenly crossed the real killer off the board, but he was there at one point. Yes, let's go back to my place. I have a huge whiteboard in my office, he said. I'll find some to-go boxes and we can take this food with us. My stomach groaned from inhaling the rich garlicky buffet food wafting through the room. Great idea, I said, and he took off to hunt down a server. I couldn't believe I actually found someone who encouraged my sleuthing rather than poo-pooing it like Wesley and Ruby. As nerdy as it was, I was pretty psyched about creating a murder board for our date. Wait, was this a date? Or was he simply trying to do a favor for Ruby's friend? Or was he way more intrigued about solving a murder and that's why he invited me back to his place? I was so overthinking this. I was also so over waiting to eat. Would it be weird if I tried to sneak in a few spoonfuls of pasta before we packaged them up? Technically, if no one saw, it didn't really happen. And by no one, I was really only worried about Marcus. The nice part about being 5 foot 11 was no one could sneak up on you and you could easily monitor people's comings and goings. I glanced over at the bar where Marcus went to get the to-go boxes. Everyone else was already busy, sitting, talking, and eating on the other side of the room. Was there anything better than a creamy penny a la vodka smothered with fresh parmesan? I thought not.
I piled another spoonful onto my plate and took a second huge bite while the waitress handed the food boxes to Marcus. I grabbed a piece of garlic bread to top it off, which I couldn't believe I almost missed. There was nothing I loved more than fresh garlic bread, second only to the buttery garlic knots sitting beside them. I scooped up a few knots and took the thickest piece of garlic bread I could find, dipping it into the rich creamy vodka sauce before taking a big bite. I heard a small moan of appreciation and realized it was me as I let the vodka sauce melt into my grateful taste buds. My private gustatory moment was interrupted by a bright camera light beaming on me and blinding me. You're live at Clover Creek's pageant appreciation dinner, hosted by billionaire tech genius Marcus Palmer. But before you get excited about the pageant, we're here for something even juicier. The real reason Ava Decker, owner of Frosted Cupcake Bakery, was left at the altar by her fiancé Ben back in San Diego, California, said Tessa. I tried to chew faster, but Tessa's introductions were typically short. I still had a ginormous mouthful of food when she threw the mic in front of my face. When I didn't answer right away, due to my intensive chewing, Tessa took back the mic. Well, someone really likes the pasta buffet, huh? She said with a laugh before passing the mic to Ben. He was standing behind her the whole time, discreetly out of my view. I almost choked on my food when I saw him. Not only did he look exactly the same, but my heart plummeted to the bottom of my chest with the same shame and embarrassment I experienced when his mother told me he wasn't coming. This was so unfair. I already lived through this cruel humiliation once. Why did I have to do it twice? And worse still, on live TV? Let's go ahead and hear from Ben. Ben, why did you stand up the woman you'd been dating for ten years at the altar on your wedding day? Ava, I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened. He said, tucking his hands into his pants pockets and looking from me to the floor. Unbelievable. Not that I wanted an explanation, especially not this way, but it was well over three months and he still had no idea what to say. Even Tessa seemed annoyed. She took back the mic and decided to speak for him. What Ben refuses to say is that he never showed up because he won the lottery that morning and didn't want to share it with you. Isn't that right, Ben? Prompted Tessa, handing the mic back to him. No, not exactly. My mother gave me the lottery ticket as a wedding gift, and that was the last day to claim it. She said she went to the church and asked you to wait until I got back, but you said you'd waited long enough already and never wanted me to call you again, he said, throwing up his hands like none of it was his fault. So the truth comes out. Ava is no jilted bride after all. She was the one who ran out on Ben. He was only trying to secure a financially prosperous future for her, Tessa said, looking at Ben with pitiful eyes like he was the true victim. I knew his mother hated me, but I couldn't believe she lied about what she said at the church. A major life-changing lie. What was even more impressive was that no one bothered to tell Ben the truth. Or maybe they did, and he was too busy spending his new fortune to care. I finally managed to gulp down my food and could feel the color flushing my face again. But this time it wasn't embarrassment. It was raging anger. Like way beyond belief, mad, furious anger. Why are you telling me this on national TV? I asked, finally able to swallow the last bites of my overindulgent penny and garlic bread. Actually, I'm only a local show, but good thinking. This is juicy enough to get syndicated nationally, said Tessa with a smile, like we were friends. Girl power. Only because you won't return any of my calls. And Tessa said she'd help me find you if I agreed to let her film us. And I needed to ask you something. Ben replied. Ben is probably fishing for a thank you, am I right? He's such a great guy. He took part of his fortune and donated it to the Swiss boarding school on your behalf so you could keep your illegally inherited mansion and bakery after your boss got murdered, said Tessa, 
placing an empathetic hand on Ben's shoulder. Ben shook his head no and replied, I never donated any money to a Swiss boarding school, he said. Tessa winked at him and said, Don't worry, we all secretly know what a great guy you really are, Mr. Anonymous Donor. This is a private party and you weren't invited, so I'd like you both to leave before I call security, said Marcus, placing himself in front of the camera and me. Unfazed by Marcus's rescue attempt, Tessa continued her anti-Ava pro-Ben tirade. Now I understand why Ava was in such a hurry to leave. She was seeking greener pastures. Why settle for a millionaire when you could go after a billionaire? Can you say gold digger? She's not a gold digger. Ava Decker is a good person who helps people who don't deserve it and is too polite and ladylike to respond to your outrageous accusations, said Marcus in a deeper voice than I'd ever heard before. I don't think I ever liked Marcus more than in that moment. I looked over at him with the most thankful expression I could muster. She is not a gold digger, said Lila, walking over to join Marcus in defending me. The other contestants joined in too, forming a mini barricade between Tessa and me. I never guessed I'd be thrust into a position where beauty pageant contestants would literally jump in to defend me. Chapter 13 While the pageant posse were staunchly endorsing me against Tessa, Marcus and I snuck out the back door via the kitchen. We stopped off at my favorite pizza place, Malnati's. It was a far cry from the rich, creamy vodka sauce I'd tried to inhale earlier, but at least the pizza didn't come with any unwanted company. I sent Lila a million thank you emojis, and Marcus was polite enough not to bring up the Ben topic after we left, which was perfectly fine by me. Are you sure Tessa won't be able to find us at your place? I have a private security gate and enclosure around my home, and that doesn't deter her in the least, I said. Maybe I should have just called it a night and headed back to Ruby's early. No one can find this place without latitude and longitude coordinates, said Marcus and he was right. First of all, it wasn't a house. It was a tree. Second, it wasn't above or below ground. It was in the ocean. After passing through a massively large pine tree with a secret door and a rather long underground tunnel, we finally entered Marcus's house, if you could even call it that. I nearly called his place eclectic, but I didn't think that was the right word for an underground lair built inside the ocean. Marcus's place was straight out of a James Bond movie from the 1970s. Welcome to my home, said Marcus, flicking on the lights. I briefly wondered if I were inside an underground aquarium or a very elaborate staged light installation. The massive room included a huge sunken living room, open kitchen, and sitting room that were all together but broken up by their different levels. The entire space was encased in a thick, at least I hoped it was, fortified glass bubble. We were literally inside the ocean, surrounded by sharks, jellyfish, octopuses, lobsters, sea lettuce, and kelp beds. This is the coolest place I've ever seen, I said, not waiting for Marcus. I kicked off my shoes, which were killing my feet, and ran over to the window to get a closer look. If this were a 3D hologram show, it was state-of-the-art, and the big stingray flying in front of me was kicking up sand from the ocean floor, looking as real as they came. Do you like it? he asked. It was custom-built from my design. Of course he designed and built it. What else can you do with a billion dollars burning a hole in your pocket? I love it! It's amazing! I can honestly say I've never seen anything like it, I replied, walking around in undisguised astonishment. There were a few bright yellow fish, who looked like Nemo, zipping in and out of anemones, and crabs sidestepping slowly. Is this what your place in Silicon Valley was like? Not at all. 
I've always loved the ocean and been fascinated by marine life. If the smartwatch hadn't taken off, I probably would have gone back to school to study marine biology or taken a job on a boat and traveled around the world, he said. This was way better than the New England State Aquarium school trip we took in junior high. Even though San Diego was a city on the ocean, I never really explored it by learning how to scuba dive like I should have. We were always too busy attending one of Ben's mother's boring country club events. I always wanted a treehouse or a secret underground cave when I was a kid, but my aunt had to raise me and Lila in a tiny two-bedroom apartment, so having a secret space was never more than a dream, he said. Until now. The grand tour he gave me was actually pretty short. Another level was built underneath this one, which housed his bedroom, and the entire floor was glass, so the fish could swim right up to you. The level above us was his home office, and the entire roof was made of domed glass. Don't you worry that a hungry great white shark could crash through the glass and eat you for dinner? I asked. Or that a big storm could smash this secret lair into tiny pieces? Marcus chuckled. Those are both valid concerns and distinct possibilities, but I added a couple safeguards to prevent that from ever happening. He walked over to the glass wall and pounded it with his fist in his shoulder. This is triple insulated with the toughest glass on the planet. It's actually ten times stronger than steel and was designed to withstand earthquakes. Even if one layer broke, there are two other layers encasing it. I also installed sensors throughout the glass, to alert me of any compromised areas. The curved glass makes it stronger than steel when the water pressure increases. I have a team of structural engineers on staff who monitor the integrity of this every day to ensure there are no issues. Those all sounded like valid safety precautions, but I was still a little nervous. As if sensing my discomfort, Marcus reached into his closet and pulled out a life jacket. You're welcome to wear one of these if it makes you feel better. No, that would be silly, I said. Or would it? Thirty minutes later, we polished off the pizza and almost completed the murder board. All right, so we know Wesley didn't do it because he's your friend. Is that the alibi we're going with? Asked Marcus. He's a cop, I said. Marcus gave me the so what look. He's an honest, good cop. Plus, I know his grandmother personally, and she would never allow him to kill anyone. I insisted. Too bad she didn't teach him how to clean his own apartment. We'll meet up with him together tomorrow, and you can see for yourself that he's a great guy. It's a date, he said. Those tingly feelings came over me again, but I pushed them away. I was so wrong about Wesley and knew even less about Marcus. Moving on to suspect number two, Brittany's roommate Shelby, who was seen on social media in Bangor at a dinner event with suspect number three, her boyfriend Tyler, said Marcus, pointing to their names on the murder board. Technically, Tyler's not really a suspect. Wesley only thought Tyler was because Shelby and Brittany looked so much alike, and he thought Brittany was cheating on him when it was really Shelby. She was making out with her own devoted and loyal boyfriend Tyler. I said, with a sudden pang of guilt, because I really should have called Wesley to give him the update. If Shelby's a suspect, wouldn't Tyler also be one just by association? Asked Marcus. Shelby's only a suspect because she was Brittany's roommate. There was not any bad blood between them. If anything, Shelby wanted to keep Brittany alive, because Brittany was paying the rent. I said, I brought him up to speed with the whole dried gold doppelganger debacle. That's odd. Brittany was our scholarship recipient based solely on need, said Marcus. Scholarship? I thought those were only for school, I asked. Maybe scholarship is the wrong word, but I tried to make sure that any woman who wanted to participate in the pageant could, regardless of their income. Pageants are expensive, so this scholarship covered their entire wardrobe, hair, makeup, and beauty supplies, as well as anything else that was approved by the pageant coach, said Marcus. 
the pageant coach who loved to point out everyone's flaws, and the person I wanted to avoid most in the world. Katerina was annoyed that Brittany didn't follow her advice religiously, but surely that's not enough to warrant murdering someone, I said. But what about her whole pageant coach mentorship with Katerina that Brittany lied about? He said. I haven't seen Brittany in over a decade. She was probably caught up in that competitive high school reunion thing where you try to outdo people by telling them how impressive and successful your life currently is. I said. I do that a lot too, Marcus said with a chuckle. As the man who was recently featured on the cover of Forbes, he was pretty much the de facto winner in all reunions, and I doubted he had to embellish anything to sound impressive. Why don't you talk to the pageant association and see what you can dig up on Katerina? Maybe find out how new pageant coaches are trained and hired? In the meantime, since I already know Shelby, I will find out what Brittany did for money. I doubt selling dried gold was her only source of income if she offered to cover the entire rent in that fancy high-rise by herself. Brittany didn't choose the economical studio route. She wanted to live in the penthouse apartment. That had to cost a pretty penny. Sure thing. We should also add Joelle and any other dried gold customers to the murder board, said Marcus, already writing it down. She has the motivation. Brittany scammed Joelle out of an entire month's worth of bogus diet products, and you have no idea what her alibi is. He was totally spot on. How could I have missed that? I immediately assumed someone at the Dried Gold Corporation might be a suspect, and they probably had this scam going on all over the world. Maybe. I make bad purchasing decisions all the time, but I've never wanted to murder the person who sold it to me. I said. I totally regretted buying the hot pink dress I was currently sporting. It accentuated all of my curves, and not in the good way. It seemed like a good idea at the time, as a standing-only outfit. I really needed to do a sit test before buying any new outfit, preferably after eating a deep-dish pizza from El Nottis, so I could see it in action under real-world conditions. Even if they totally duped you into believing it worked when they knew it didn't? He asked, pointing to the dried gold fake before and after pictures of Shelby and Brittany. All right, we'll leave Joelle and Katerina up on the board. I'll swing by Shelby's tomorrow. I have her on my list to find out what Brittany was doing for her day job and ask Joelle about her alibi. I said, Hopefully my parents' Hyundai Santa Fe would be out of the shop by then. Driving the cupcake truck required skills that I didn't possess. I barely managed to get to and from the county fair, and that was only because Ruby came along as navigator. It seemed too narrow when I was inside serving cupcakes and way too large when I tried to make right turns while driving it. Then we have two very large, ambiguous groups. The other pageant contestants and staff, and everyone Brittany went to high school with, said Marcus dropping his pen to point toward the bottom of the board. I can confirm that everyone we went to high school with has moved on, and according to Shelby, Brittany didn't have any friends, so we can cross them off the list. I said, Ruby and I went through the entire class yearbook and couldn't find anyone that Brittany tormented worse than Ruby. Marcus didn't have any other follow-up questions, so he crossed them off the list with a different colored dry erase marker. So that leaves only the pageant contestants and the staff, he said. We've eliminated all of the contestants with their GPS trackers, I said, looking over at his smartwatch. And we crossed off all the pageant staff tonight. And thanks again for saving me from that awful Channel 5 surprise camera. I'm so sorry they crashed your event, I said. While I was busy feeling sorry for myself... I totally forgot that the private dinner was Marcus's hosted affair, on his dime. Not to mention the fact that he was stuck eating pizza out of a box, instead of that fancy melt-in-your-mouth, freshly made pasta and garlic bread. Oh, please, I've had enough fancy events to last me a lifetime. Deep dish pizza's my favorite, he said. I have no idea what happened between you and your ex, but confronting you like that on a live local news show wasn't cool at all. That was right. 
Ben sucked. Has anyone ever told you that you're a really great guy? I asked. Thanks. Marcus shrugged and his cheeks turned red. Hey, did you want some dessert? I grabbed a couple double-salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwiches from Claire's ice cream shop earlier today. They're in the freezer. No way! That just happens to be one of my favorite ice cream sandwich flavors from Claire's. I said, following him down the stairs to the kitchen level. I didn't add that I already had one today for lunch. This was a special occasion. I'd just been publicly humiliated for the second time by my ex. Who wouldn't need a little comfort ice cream after that? Marcus handed me a sandwich before grabbing one for himself. Here's to solving this case and bringing the real killer to justice, I said, holding my sandwich up for a toast. Marcus tapped my sandwich and we both dug in. It's getting pretty late, I said, yawning even though it was barely 9 p.m. But Lucky and I were doing a sleepover at Ruby's parents' house, so we could be on time for pancake towers in the morning. I didn't want to be rude and come crashing through their front door at midnight. Of course, I'll take you back. But before you go, I have something I want to give you, he said, crouching down to retrieve it from one of his bottom kitchen drawers. He stood up with a small red box that had a bow on the top. You didn't have to get me anything, I said, especially since I got him nothing. Or maybe this was a thank you for the free cupcakes from the night we met. But then again, he did give Ruby and me a ride home and was helping me with the investigation, not to mention saving me from Tessa and Ben. So all in all, this gift put me way down in terms of friendly gift exchanges and helping equality, but that couldn't stop me from tearing it open. It was a Palmer Tech smartwatch. I still had on my Mickey Mouse watch, and while I appreciated this one, it looked like I needed to take a class just to learn how to operate it. Thanks, but this might be too fancy for me, I said, unsure of whether to accept it or not. I noticed when we were out to lunch, Mickey Mouse said it was noon even though it was really 1.30, so I suspect Mickey is more like jewelry. This watch could double as a mini computer for you said Marcus, already popping it out of the box and placing it on the opposite wrist from Mickey. I pre-programmed it for you with all your favorite places to go, he said. You can order a double-salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwich from Claire's, ready for pickup, or a deep-dish pizza with the works from Malnati's, delivered right to your front door. And you can even see who's outside your front door without even being at home. He swiped and tapped all the different screens for me. It really was pretty easy. Let me guess. Ruby told you all my favorites and helped you to program it with my front gate intercom? I asked, even though I already knew the answer. Possibly, he said. I hope you're not angry. A screensaver of Lucky popped up on the watch face. Not at all. It's very sweet and I can't wait to start using it. A look of relief washed over Marcus. He grabbed the watch again. I almost forgot. Ruby programmed it with your spirulina smoothie ingredients so that you can auto-order them from the stop and shop whenever you run low. Oh, goody. Chapter 14 Two seconds after stepping into the kitchen, Ruby's dad enveloped me in one of the famous Hardison family bear hugs. Good morning, Mr. Hardison. I said once he allowed me to come up for air. Ava, we're so happy that you're back home. Ruby is in a much better mood since you moved back to Clover Creek, he said. If Ruby were Miss Sunshine, who only saw silver linings, Ruby's dad was that multiplied by infinity. Not that I was complaining. It always felt nice to be around Ruby's dad. He was constantly smiling and happy. But more importantly, you made the best breakfasts in the world. The best part about Mr. Hardison's special pancakes was his amazing way of flipping them. While I loved the decadent pancake tower, with syrup overflowing and running down the sides, the show that accompanied them was the most entertaining. That's where all the magic happened. He was a superhero with a dynamic wrist that could flip the pancakes up into the air 
over his shoulder, and even catch them behind his back. I was pretty sure he practiced for hours when we were kids for our sheer entertainment, and it still worked, even as adults. He never failed to mesmerize us. Mr. Hardison, I can honestly say, I've been counting the minutes until breakfast this morning. I confessed, sitting at their kitchen island and watching him do his pancake thing. I almost couldn't fall asleep. It was like waiting for Santa on Christmas morning. You, my dear, are welcome here any time for pancakes, he said, tapping my nose with his finger. When he failed to acknowledge Lucky, the jealous kitty trotted over to him on the other side of the island. He looked down and tapped Lucky on his cute kitty nose. And you too, Lucky. He went to the fridge and pulled out a small plate of smoked salmon, which he chopped into little kitty bite-sized pieces. I know what you want, and I doubt that it's pancakes, my carnivorous little buddy, he said, placing the plate down on the counter in front of Lucky. I didn't know it was possible to purr and eat at the same time, but Lucky was doing it. Ruby and her mother came into the kitchen through the back sliding door from what I guessed was their morning run. Oh, Ruby, I'm so glad you brought Ava over this time, said Ruby's mother as she floated towards me. Like mother, like daughter, they were both picture perfect in spite of just completing a five-mile run. Hello, Mrs. Hardison, I said, eagerly leaping up to hug her. I wanted to get a jump on the Hardison bear hug before it crushed me. Taking a big inhale, I was more prepared for it this time. Ruby's parents were probably the nicest people on the planet. I never once heard them yell at Ruby or each other. If they weren't smiling, they were thinking about smiling. I truly believe they were the most pleasant couple living on the planet, always serene and calm. Someone got in a little late last night, said Ruby, elbowing me at the table. It wasn't that late. You and Lucky fell asleep watching yet another romance movie on the Hallmark Channel, so I slipped in quietly to avoid waking you, I said. They both looked so comfortable on the couch spooning, I didn't want to disturb them. Although I couldn't have wakened Lucky even if I tried. That little guy slept like a log. Nothing managed to wake him up once he decided it was nap time. I want to hear all about this late night date said Ruby's mom, pulling up a chair. Ruby tells me you're dating Clover Creek's newest and only billionaire. I wouldn't say we're dating, I said, playing with my silverware. It was your third time out with him, right? Asked Ruby's mom. I wouldn't classify finding a dead body as a date, I said, recalling our failed fireworks outing at the county fair. Ruby's mom did a double take and looked at Ruby. I thought you said they went to lunch at the Little Dog Diner the other day. Oh, yeah, that date, I said. I wouldn't really classify my lobster roll fashion faux pas disaster at the diner as a date either, but I also didn't want to relive that, so I simply said, it was super short, basically no more than an opportunity for me to find out more about the Clover Creek pageant. You would make a great Miss Clover Creek, said Ruby's mother. Wouldn't she, dear? Oh, yes, she and Ruby both would. They'd be shoo-ins to win the Miss Clover Creek pageant, said Mr. Hardison. In addition to being Mr. and Mrs. Sunshine, Ruby's parents were always praising us for something, from our misshapen snowman building efforts to our college applications. According to these two, there was nothing Ruby and I weren't already super talented and overly qualified to go pursue. They were like parent cheerleaders on steroids. I liked it. The ego boost helped me to get over more than a few tough high school moments. I threw up my arms in a big X. Oh no, that's most definitely not something I'm interested in. I wanted to find out if there was anyone in the pageant who might have killed Brittany. So sad what happened to that girl. Were you very close to her? I remember all of you cheerleading and going out to parties, said Ruby's mother. Now I remembered why Ruby's parents were so happy. They remained blissfully unaware of any strife or conflicts in the world. 
they had zero idea about how Brittany tortured us through high school. Yes, we were, I said, nodding my head in agreement with Ruby's mother. That's why it's really important for Ruby and me to help the police figure out who killed her. Well, you're both very smart. I'm sure you'll get to the bottom of it soon, said Ruby's mother, patting my hand. All right, girls, enjoy your pancake towers. I'm off to Pilates. No wonder the Hardisons were always in such great shape. They did back-to-back -back workouts. After gleefully devouring my entire pancake tower and thanking Ruby's dad repeatedly, I took a rideshare back to my place. I wanted to shower and get ready for the day while Ruby did the same. An hour later, Ruby was honking outside my door. It looked like my parents would return from the cruise before their car was repaired. According to the Collision Auto Repair Shop, the potato field did a real number on the undercarriage. It would take another two weeks before they finished. Until then, I hoped Ruby wouldn't get too annoyed at having to chauffeur me around town. My cupcake driving phobia was still alive and kicking, but my wallet couldn't afford too many more ride shares. Are you ready to go, little guy? I asked, kneeling so Lucky could hop into his kitty carrier. He placed one paw inside and promptly hopped out before trying to jump inside my shirt. The kitty Bjorn was on, but I buttoned my coat pretty tightly so he couldn't access it. No, no, little man. Safety first. You'll have to travel in your kitty carrier so I can secure you in the back seat. I said, trying to reason with the cat, like he might actually understand me. I had to pry him off me and he hooked his little kitty claws into my collar flap. I finally got him off and gently placed him inside his carrier with some kitty treats that he proceeded to ignore. Instead, he hopped out again and crawled his way up my leg, trying to get into my jacket from underneath the hem. But I was too smart for him. I was quite familiar with this signature lucky move. Wearing my windbreaker with drawstrings that I pulled tight on the bottom, I essentially cut off any further access. This time he decided to hook his claws into my pant belt loops. When I tried to wiggle him off, he roared an angry kitty yowl. Where was the baby Mozart station when I needed it most? Lucky, you are not, nor will you ever again roam freely in the car. It's too dangerous and you could be seriously hurt or worse. Like an insolent little brat, he kept arching his back and trying to twist out of my arms each time I attempted to place him inside the kitty carrier. Now it was my turn to scream an angry kitty yowl. Why won't you get into your kitty carrier? It's so soft and plush. And I put some yummy kitty treats in there for you. Ruby honked again. Looks like someone will have to stay at home if they don't want to get inside their kitty carrier. I said giving Lucky my sternest schoolteacher face. I walked out the front door and shut it, locking Lucky inside. That's when the real kitty roaring began, along with the maniacal scratching at the front door. I gave Ruby the one-minute signal and walked back inside. Does someone want to get inside their kitty carrier now? I asked. Lucky let out an annoyed groan, but hopped into the carrier. I crouched down, zipped it shut, and headed outside again. It was extra windy, at almost hurricane speeds. My already unruly hair was tangling up and slapping me in the face. I pulled my hood up and hopped into Ruby's car before leaning into the back and strapping Lucky in. Quick, I said. Turn on the Mozart channel. I held my breath in anticipation while the annoyed kitty groaned slowly subsided. Eventually, I let out a huge sigh of relief. After a few more moments of non-movement, I looked over at Ruby, whose arms were crossed. What's wrong? I asked. It wasn't even 9 a.m., and I'd already angered both Lucky and Ruby? What's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. How could you sit through an entire breakfast with me and not tell me about your running with Tessa? She asked. What? And ruin your dad's amazing pancake tower? I mocked. How did you find out anyway? You're viral. She said, flashing me her phone to a video clip of last night, captioned, 
Runaway Bride is really a gold digger. My days of caring what other people think are so over, especially people like Tessa and Ben, I replied. But don't you think you owe him an explanation after he donated all that money to the Swiss boarding school so you could keep the bakery and the house? Asked Ruby, who finally started the drive into town. Ben said he didn't donate the money, and Tyler said the donor was a woman. I answered. Ben wasn't a terrible person, just completely clueless when it came to spontaneously helping me with anything. Everything he ever did for me happened after I point-blank asked him for it. Then what do you think he did with all his lottery winnings? She asked. I knew for sure he did not reimburse me for the credit card debt I ended up with when he ditched our wedding. Who cares? Probably spent it on his mother and himself at singles bars. Ruby shot me a weird look. You think the two of them went bar hopping together? Trust me, to keep Ben away from me, she'd have gone to Mars to make it happen. I said with the utmost certainty. Don't you even care that his mother blatantly lied about her announcement at the church? Asked Ruby. Clearly she was way more upset about that than I was. At this point, nothing Ben's mother could do surprised me. Not after she brought along another woman on her last date and tried to set her up with Ben right in front of me. Half of the people there were Ben's friends. It's highly unlikely no one told him the truth. He clearly chose to believe his mother over logic. I said, since it was classic Ben. Someone needs to set him and the rest of America straight with the real truth, said Ruby. Don't bother. He's so not worth it. I said, and I really meant it this time. Normally I'd have a fit over making sure the world knew the right story, but since deleting my entire social media presence, I became less and less concerned with what other people thought. His mother actually did me a favor. If I'd married Ben, I would still be living in San Diego, wasting my life at the world's most boring accounting job. Don't worry, I already fixed it said Ruby, stopping in front of Frosted. What do you mean you already fixed it? I asked, suddenly on high panic alert. I called Tessa and told her the truth. Or rather, I played back the wedding video footage of the truth for her, said Ruby, practically beaming with pride. I gasped. No, you didn't. I did, she said with a wider smile. Why would you do that? And why did you keep that awful footage of the worst day of my life? I asked. How could she not know that all I wanted to do was forget Ben, San Diego, and anything to do with his mother? Because it's not fair. And I tried to delete it, but I'm not really cloud savvy. It's still in the cloud and I can't get rid of it without the help of the IT department. I know how private you are, so I didn't ask them and honestly... I completely forgot that I even had it until today, she explained. As your best friend, it's my job to make it fair. Are you sure that's not a job for the universe? I'm pretty sure the universe outsources that job to karma, I said. I hopped out of her car, unstrapped Lucky's carrier, and turned to find Frosted teeming with tons of people, including Tessa and Ben. It looks like karma came out to visit me this morning. For a millisecond, I considered running back to Ruby's car to hide inside it. But it was time I stood up for myself. More importantly, Ruby was already gone. Taking a big breath, I held my head high and walked right up to Ben. He was about to say something but stopped when he heard the growling coming from Lucky's kitty carrier. Lacking the Mozart music, Lucky must have remembered that he was stuck inside the carrier and started scraping at the mesh rooftop trying to escape. Is that a cat? Asked Ben, backing up. He wasn't much of a pet person. It's lucky, I said. Hold on, little man. I'm going to put you inside the bakery while I talk to people. I stepped inside Frosted where my assistant was already in the back, baking. I waved to her, dropped to the ground, and set Lucky free. He scrambled up the ramp into the kitty tunnels I installed next to the ceiling for him. They were vented for air, 
but only allow Lucky to enter and leave at points on the floor so he couldn't hurt himself. I closed the door behind me and stepped outside onto the front sidewalk. Really? I asked, looking from Ben to Tessa. You'll want to hear what he has to say, said Tessa. When I pointed to the camera and lights, she leaned over and whispered, And my rent is due, so I know you'll want to help a bestie out. Girl power! Fine, whatever. Let's get this over with. So you really didn't donate the money to the Swiss boarding school? I asked Ben. Ben was still the cute boyish surfer I fell in love with when I was 18, even dressed in jeans and a casual coat. I wasn't angry anymore, just sad. Sad that he wasn't more of a man and couldn't stand up to his mom. Sad that he didn't love me enough to want to fight for us. And it wasn't just me. He looked kind of sad as well. He threw his palms up and shrugged his shoulders. I have no idea what you're talking about. Tessa stepped in. If you didn't use your money to help Ava, what did you do with it? Not much. I obviously bought my mother a new house, he said. And a private island in Hawaii for you and your friends to party for the last three months? Asked Tessa, throwing the mic back in front of Ben. Isn't that right? I was depressed and upset after Ava walked out on me in our wedding, he said. What else was I supposed to do? And now that you know Ava didn't walk out on you, do you still want to marry her? Asked Tessa. No, I, I mean, yes. I mean, I don't know, he said, running his hands through his hair, his telltale nervous tick. Mother said I shouldn't be so quick to marry someone who could walk out on me so easily. That's why she said what she did, Ava, said Ben, redirecting his attention to me and away from Tessa. She said it was a test that you failed. Naturally, his mother would say that, and Ben would believe her. She always had an answer for everything. Kind of like the question, which is more important, money or love? I countered. Obviously love, said Ben. Leaving your bride at the altar to cash in a lottery ticket is a blaringly loud indication of what matters most to you, I said. And it ain't love. Is your cat doing cartwheels? Asked Ben, pointing to the frosted storefront window. Kind of. They're more like slow motion kitty somersaults, I said. Tessa threw her mic in front of Ben blocking his view of Lucky in the process. Isn't the real reason why you left Ava at the altar because if you cashed the winning lottery ticket after the wedding, Ava would be legally entitled to half of it since California is a community property state? Asked Tessa. Whereas by listening to your mother, and yes, I checked with her this morning to hear her side of the story, you ran out to cash it before the wedding so you could claim all of it as your own? I was going to share it with Ava, but Mother said... Ben tried to reply. Do you do everything your mother tells you to do, Ben? Asked Tessa. No. She told me I had every right to ask for the engagement ring back, and I didn't. She said if Ava were an honorable person, she'd return it on her own. But she never did, and I was totally fine with it. He said, like it was a benevolent favor. That's very generous of you, said Tessa with an eye roll. I didn't return the ring after you left me at the altar because I had to sell it to help pay for all the wedding expenses you left me owing, I said, the proceeds of which barely cracked a dent into the nearly six-figure debt I just made another payment to this morning. I think we've heard enough from our flaky San Diego groom, said Tessa. So for those girls who really are gold diggers, looks like this lottery-winning millionaire is fresh on the market. That is for anyone who can get past the mommy gates, said Tessa. You're watching 10 Minutes with Tessa. See you tomorrow for another exciting episode. Can we talk? Asked Ben when the camera lights shut off. There was still a crowd gathering, hanging on his every word. In private? He added. 
My girl Ava has heard all she needs to hear from you, haven't you, Ava? Asked Tessa, slinging a protective arm around my shoulder. Ruby gave me the whole 411. Us girls need to stick together. Am I right or am I right? I wasn't sure what girl posse I inadvertently joined, but Ruby's rom-com theory that everyone had a heart of gold deep down inside them was the only rationale I could find for her collusion with Tessa. However, Tessa was right about one thing. There was nothing more I needed to hear from Ben. With both of us thinking we were jilted at the altar, debating the topic any further sounded about as appealing as learning about his last three months, partying on his own private Hawaiian island. Tess is right. Thanks for flying out here to share your half of the story. I wish you and your mom the best of luck, and hope you're both happy. I said, and I sincerely meant it. I had no regrets and zero guilt. Goodbye, Ava, said Ben. Goodbye, Ben, I said. I nearly bit my tongue, trying not to ask him to pay off the wedding debt he stuck me with. I knew he would do it if I asked him, but at the same time, I didn't want to. It reminded me that I wanted someone who simply did things on their own initiative because they wanted to make me happy. Like Marcus and his smartwatch gift. I didn't ask for one. I didn't even want one. But after he saw that my watch wasn't working, he wanted to make my life better by giving me one that did work. I wanted that kind of guy, because I deserved that kind. As Ben walked away, the crowd of eavesdroppers clapped their approval and cheered for us both. I gave them a weak smile and a wave before slipping inside Frosted. I wasn't quick enough. Tessa followed me and tried to high-five me. When I didn't respond, she got visibly annoyed, looking out the window at the camera that was still rolling. Don't leave me hanging! I'm part of your girl posse now with Ruby, said Tessa with a smile. Remember, girl power? You know what Ruby's and my favorite girl power activity is? I asked, leaning conspiratorially closer to Tessa, whose eyes widened in anticipation of my answer. Solving Brittany's murder together? She asked. Baking stuffed cupcakes for Frosted before opening at noon, I answered heading to the kitchen in the back of the bakery and signaling for Tessa to follow me. Chapter 15 While Tessa had less than zero interest in doing physical labor, she did promise to help me find out who actually donated the money to the Swiss boarding school. I had no faith whatsoever in her skills to do that, but it was at least one thing I could cross off my to-do list for the time being. I wouldn't even know where to start with an international search. It was possible the TV stations had some contacts in their sister offices located in Geneva. After Tessa took off, I found Ruby and Lucky inside the bakery waiting for me. Lucky was balancing on the top of the cupcake display. He liked to slide down it, then jump back up to the top and repeat the entire process over and over again. I was going to help you, but it looks like you took care of all that on your own, Ruby said, pulling out mixing bowls. Admit it, getting some closure felt good, right? Where did you go? I asked, ignoring her question. With all the craziness in that huge Channel 5 news truck, there was nowhere to park, so I took your spot in the back, she said, pulling out flour, sugar, and eggs. Now, are we ready for some girl posse baking time? She winked and hip-bumped me. She'd clearly overheard my conversation with Tessa. Actually, could you make us some spirulina smoothies? I asked Ruby. Her entire face lit up. Are you going to start carrying those now at Frosted? She asked. Maybe someday, I said. Not a chance. Not even if pigs could fly. I was thinking I'd take some over to the pageant contestants as a thank you for standing up to Tessa on my behalf last night. Maybe Ruby was right about the girl posse, even though I knew she was totally joking. It was nice to have supportive female friends. I should really look into expanding my circle of women.
maybe even start a book club at the bakery or something like that. An hour later, I was fully equipped with spirulina smoothies to go and some rogue cupcakes for Lila. After losing a small fight to get Lucky back into his kitty carrier, I asked my bakery assistant to watch him while I took off for the pageant rehearsals. She agreed, but Lucky foiled my plans when he darted out the door between my legs, hopping into the cupcake truck and prancing around as if he were proud of himself. This is not safe, Lucky. You can come with me, but you'll have to be safely secured inside your kitty carrier. I explained, despite knowing he couldn't understand anything I was saying. I ran back inside the bakery to tell my assistant Lucky was coming with me after all, and grabbed his kitty carrier. There were not only angry kitty growls, but Lucky ran to the topmost shelf in the cupcake truck. No way are you riding up there! I said, looking at the knife rack on the wall next to him. It was securely attached to the wall and behind a glass case, but still. It was a truck, not a house. Everything would sail off in every direction if something happened. I pressed the baby Mozart app on my phone for Lucky and placed it inside the kitty carrier, along with some fresh salmon from the fridge. That got his attention. He hopped down and got straight into the carrier. Good boy, I said, zipping up the carrier and crossing my fingers. This would get easier next time. I finally understood the meaning of the phrase, herding cats. After safely strapping his carrier into the passenger seat, I took off for Clover Creek High School. When I got to the Clover Creek High Auditorium, not only did I receive an overwhelming round of applause from the contestants, but also a thankful and hearty response for my spirulina smoothies. This is perfect, said one of the contestants. At only 20 calories per serving and mostly celery juice, this drink practically cancels itself out. She smiled before taking another sip. I just wanted to thank all of you for coming to my defense yesterday. That was the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me, I said starting to tear up. Feeling the need to comfort me, Lucky reached out of his kitty Bjorn and placed a paw on my cheek. Oh, you brought back that cute little kitty, cooed one of the contestants before reaching out to Lucky. Climbing out of the kitty Bjorn, he leapt into her arms. She gladly accepted his kitty attention and added, Who needs a boyfriend when you have this little guy? Don't worry, we've all dated men we'd like to forget about, too, said another contestant. Not me, said Lila, digging into a cupcake and ignoring her spirulina smoothie. Marcus is so overprotective. He does full background checks on everyone I want to date. So far, no one has passed his approval. Men don't even get an opportunity to be a jerk. She sounded sad about that. I'd give anything to have an older protective brother looking out for me. Who knows? I might have never dated Ben at all if that were the case. I picked up Lila's untouched spirulina smoothie and replaced it with one of my secretly disguised chocolate malted milkshakes. I think you might like this one better. Trust me, I said with a wink. She eyed it suspiciously and sniffed it before taking a tiny sip. Oh my gosh, yes, this is way better, she said, sucking it down gratefully. The other girls looked over, wondering if they were missing something. I dumped her spirulina smoothie in the trash. This one had a little too much cayenne pepper in it, I said. Yes, too much cayenne, said Lila with a small giggle. Do any of you know what Brittany did for a living? I asked the group. She was here on scholarship and kept talking about some master plan to make it big with those dried gold weight loss products she was always trying to sell, said one of the contestants. Did you buy any from her? I asked. They could also be angry customers. As if. Those were just candy disguised as fruit. No one in their right mind would ever eat them in place of a meal said another contestant. 
Everyone nodded in agreement. Plus, our pageant coach forbade us from eating dried fruit. She said it rotted your teeth and packed on the pounds, said Lila. Did she know that Brittany was selling it? I asked. I'm not sure, but when she saw a brochure for it lying around, she launched into a long lecture of all the evils dried fruit embodied for us, said Lila. She'll be here any minute for pageant readiness inspections. Did you want to talk to her? Asked Lila. The master genius in pointing out all of your physical flaws? I asked, to which everyone nodded their heads yes. After narrowly escaping a blowing crush to my already fragile ego, at least in my imagination, Lucky and I headed over to Shelby's, where I told Wesley to meet me. Joelle greeted me at the front desk, or rather, another mini Brittany greeted me. If not for the Joelle name tag, I would have sworn she was Brittany. I love what you've done with your hair, I said, as if this were a creepy horror movie of wicked Brittany doppelgangers. She flipped it around. Thanks. I just needed a change after that whole dried gold fiasco. You must realize you look exactly like Brittany, right? I said, pointing out the obvious. I thought maybe you were Shelby for a second. Shelby's actually the one who recommended the hairstyle change, she said, playing with her curly blonde extensions. Clearly it's a popular look. If Brittany weren't already dead, I'm sure she'd totally murder Joelle for copying her signature quaff. What the? said a male voice I knew all too well behind me. I flipped around and pulled Wesley nearer so he could see Joelle up close. I considered it a good icebreaker to prepare him for his meeting with Shelby. Wesley, I'd like you to meet Joelle. She and Brittany share the same hairdresser, I said. Joelle's eyes lit up and she popped right out of her chair. We already know each other. I've been here before when you came to pick Brittany up. You're Brittany's boyfriend, Wesley. To his credit, Wesley recovered pretty quickly and simply nodded his head. But that wasn't enough for Joelle. She came around the desk and hugged him. Judging by the look on Wesley's face, that didn't happen often. I'm so sorry about your loss. I know you and Brittany were only dating for a little while, but please, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Thanks, Joelle, but I'm okay, said Wesley. I wondered if I sensed a spark between them, or just the surprise that Joelle had to be a little crazy for wanting to look exactly like the person she supposedly hated. You look... different than normal. Thanks, I needed a change, said Joelle. She went behind the reception desk and came back with a scrap of paper, which she slid into Wesley's pocket as she whispered something into his ear. I suspected it was her phone number. Joelle looked at me, suddenly self-conscious of my presence. I'm sorry, are you two dating? She asked. Nope, he's all yours, I said. Who was I to stop true love? Clearly Wesley had a type, and it wasn't me. Hey, do you know anyone else that purchased dried gold from Brittany? I'm just wondering if anyone actually achieved positive results. Are you considering buying it? Because I'm selling it now, she said, handing me a dried gold rep card. But I thought you said it was a sham and didn't work, I replied. Geez, what happened to her total adoration of my cupcakes and deciding to become a baker? I called to complain to the main line since Brittany was no longer available and they offered me her old job. Unfortunately, it didn't come with any referrals. Apparently, I was her only customer, she said with a huff. But they said some of their top sales reps make six-figure salaries, and I need a new job, like an actual career, you know? There are a ton of things you could do besides selling a product you hate, I said. For instance, becoming a baker like me. So you're saying I should aim higher and become a beauty pageant coach, like Brittany was training to do? She asked, looking hopeful again. 
That wasn't what I was saying or thinking at all, but I realized the pointlessness of this conversation. Sure. Hey, where were you when she was killed? That was so long ago. I can't even remember what I had for dinner last night, she said with a nervous giggle. I expected it was probably dried gold. If I spent all my rent money, that's what I'd be eating, sugary calories or not. Joelle was looking more and more like the killer. She clearly wanted to take over Brittany's life, including her boyfriend, and conveniently forgot what she was doing the night of Brittany's murder. We're actually here to see Shelby. She's expecting us if you want to call ahead first, I said. Go on up, she said, waving us toward the elevator. I trust Wesley. He's a cop. She winked at him and gave him another wave as he entered the elevator. Hurry up, Decker, Wesley said while holding the doors open for me. Chapter 16 Wesley did a double take, just like I knew he would when he saw Shelby in person. Shelby showed him pictures of her and Tyler together. I guess I should have my detective status revoked, he said, sitting down on the couch defeatedly. I saw you with Tyler and just assumed Brittany was cheating on me. It was never intended to be permanent. I was supposed to dye my hair back after the photo shoot, but Tyler loved my new look so much, he begged me to keep it, which was fine by me. I'm a very dark brunette, she said, pointing to her roots. No offense, but Brittany always told me you were kind of large, said Wesley, looking Shelby up and down. Did the dried gold actually work? Ha! That stuff is a total scam. I have Brittany to thank for my new, slimmer figure. She was so strict about what is and isn't allowed in the apartment that the only thing to eat here was rabbit food. You know, salads. And presto, two months later I dropped 30 pounds. She said, twirling around to show off her attractively trim figure. This is amazing. Hugh and Joel are both dead ringers for Brittany, said Wesley. It's a popular look. This could be the start of a new fad, said Shelby. Gosh, I hoped not. It's nice to finally meet you, said Shelby, handing Wesley a cup of coffee. We weren't besties or anything, but I could tell Brittany genuinely liked you. Her huge crush on you began when she saw your photo after you were officially made a detective. She talked about you all the time. She even made up that whole stalker thing just to get to know you. Shelby tried to pour me a cup of coffee, but I declined. I was more of a latte girl, but right now I had no free hands. Lucky was doing crazy kitty parkour all over her furniture. I was afraid something might break. You're not sneezing. I observed. The last two times she was around Lucky, Shelby had a non-stop allergy attack session. Perfect! That means the allergy shot is working! She said, pointing to the band-aid on her left shoulder. It's a sign I should get a cat, right? Totally! I said. Shelby seems like a great person. Any cat would be happy to have her for a kitty mommy. Right, Wesley? When he didn't answer, I looked over and found him still gaping in shock. Wesley, are you okay? I asked. He was usually so smooth and on an even keel. I guessed he liked Brittany even more than he let on. I feel so dumb. I'm the cop. The detective, even. I had no idea she filed a bogus stalker complaint or that her roommate looked so identical to her, he said. Don't feel bad about that. How could you know she had a fake artificially created twin? Brittany was super secretive about hiding me from everyone. And I'm pretty sure all of those dried gold before and after pictures must violate some sort of FDA rules, said Shelby. And there's that, too. I thought her dried gold products were totally on the up and up, he said. It's okay. You were in love with her. And love makes us do dumb things, I said, as evidenced by my last decade, 
which I spent dutifully obeying Ben's wishes and trying to please his hateful mother. Do you know if Brittany had any other jobs? Was dry gold her sole source of income? I looked at both Wesley and Shelby, hoping one of them might know the answer. Oh yeah, her parents left her a big trust fund when they died, said Shelby. Aha! That explained why Brittany had zero income listed on her scholarship application. She didn't need to work. She was independently wealthy. She assured me that dried gold was doing great, and often referred to it as her retirement plan, said Wesley. I'm pretty sure her retirement plan was more like a stay-at-home MRS job, said Shelby. What's that? asked Wesley. Was he really so clueless? MRS? As in, she wanted to become Mrs. Wesley Lockwood? I said, watching the realization dawn on his face. Chapter 17 Instead of meeting up at Marcus's place for our afternoon debriefing, I suggested that we reconvene at the dog park. This was Lucky's home away from home. He was already playing fetch with some of the other dogs. It made me a little nervous when they wrestled and rolled around, but all of the dogs were extra gentle with Lucky, even if he did enjoy pouncing and jumping on them with reckless, crazy kitty abandon. Clover Creek had two main dog parks. One was for large dogs, and one was for small breeds, like purse-sized dogs. Lucky preferred the large dog park. He seemed clueless about how tiny he was. I blamed it on my height. Having a 5'11 mom probably made all the big dogs seem small in comparison. You bring your cat to a dog park? Asked Marcus, watching Lucky roll around and playfully wrestle with a Doberman. Those are his best friends out there, I said, tossing a small red ball. A Rottweiler caught it and swallowed it. That was one unfortunate consequence of having large dogs as your friend. Any ideas about what should be retrieved as a toy and what should be eaten as a snack often clashed. I pulled out one of my backup red balls for when this happened, which was actually quite often, and tossed it in the other direction towards a Dalmatian. They were a more discerning breed that disliked eating rubber. I think Joelle is our killer, I said, turning back to Marcus. She went all single white female on Brittany and looks exactly like her, taking over her job as a dried gold sales rep and even flirting with Wesley right in front of me. You think Joelle killed Brittany so she could take over her identity? Asked Marcus. Definitely. It was a good thing she decided against that whole Baker career, or I could have been next in line. For sure, and she has no alibi, I said. But what about Katerina? Did you find out anything more as to whether she's quitting her job as a pageant coach or as a mentor of how to become one? Kind of. Official beauty pageant coach work for the national organization is seasonal, so most of them accept private clients during the off-season when they aren't assigned to a city pageant. To become one, you don't even need pageant contestant experience, although it's helpful. All you need is a high school diploma, a clean criminal record, and a recommendation from a current coach, said Marcus. Just like I thought, Brittany made the whole coaching mentor thing up. According to her roommate Shelby, Brittany's only career goals were to become Mrs. Wesley Lockwood and quit working. If she really wanted that recommendation from Katerina, she wouldn't have continually defied and argued with her all the time, I said. This is fun. So our killer is Joelle said Marcus, putting his hand up to give me a high five. Should we call the police and tell them? I returned his high five. We need some real evidence before we can do that, and I know just the person who can help us, I said while dialing Wesley. I know who did it, Joelle, I said before even giving Wesley a chance to say hello. You mean the Joelle that I'm out on a date with right now? asked Wesley. Wesley, she's a murderer! 
You're not safe, I whispered. I'm pretty sure I'm more qualified than you to determine who is or isn't a murderer, said Wesley. Oh, right. Just like you figured out Brittany was stalking herself and selling shady diet products. Can she hear this conversation? I asked. No, she's in the bathroom. What kind of a jerk picks up a phone call in the middle of a date? He asked. Don't you find it a little odd that she wants to be just like Brittany? She practically took over her entire life, including dating you, I said. And she has no alibi for the time of the murder. What do you think I'm doing now? He asked. Oh, you agree with me, and you're fake dating her to get evidence that she is, in fact, the true murderer. I asked. I gotta go, he said and hung up. I gave Marcus a thumbs up. Wesley is on board. Now all we need to do is get her phone GPS so we can track her historical activity and demand a confession. Already on it, said Marcus, doing something with his phone. If she has a Palmer Tech smartwatch and public history, we'll be able to track her. Chapter 18 I couldn't believe I solved yet another murder. Marcus confirmed that not only was Joelle in the same vicinity where Brittany got killed, but she'd also been stalking Wesley for the last few days. If he hadn't come into the apartment building this morning, it looked like Joelle would have gotten his number one way or another. Marcus showed me how to use the voice record feature on the smartwatch he gave me, so I was all set. Why are you still investigating? Why can't you just go to the police with what you have now? Asked Ruby. She arrived to babysit Lucky while I went to the Clover Creek pageant with Marcus. Wesley is worried that it won't be enough. It's all still circumstantial, I said. Didn't they arrest you with even less to go on? She asked. Yes, and look how that turned out for them. Wesley said it was embarrassing for the police that I solved my own murder investigation, so they're being extra careful these days before making an arrest. I explained. If only they'd implemented that rule before I returned to Clover Creek. Explain to me again why you think you can magically squeeze out a confession from Joelle, said Ruby. Easy. I offered to introduce Joelle to the other pageant contestants. They're all in on it. They're going to pretend that they don't like Katarina and are looking for a new coach to work with them in the off-season. That was exactly what Brittany intended to do. And the one thing I know about Joelle is that she will do anything Brittany-related, I said. Even repeating my plan out loud, I couldn't help feeling like a genius. What could possibly go wrong? So you're a career counselor now, asked Ruby. No, I've instructed them all to complain to her and say how much they hated Brittany, which, let's be real, shouldn't be too big of a stretch. Then they'll go on to explain how they're choosing a new pageant coach for future contests. And I think she'll confess if only to gain their trust and win them as clients. I said. That's a terrible idea that has zero chance of succeeding, said Ruby. Well, thanks for the vote of confidence, I said. I'm just saying, maybe you should stick to baking cupcakes and leave the detective work to, oh, I don't know, the police maybe, she said. The police who haven't solved this crime yet? I asked. I'd be fearing for your life if you weren't surrounded by tons of people at a public event and didn't have a Palmer Tech smartwatch on so I could track your every move, she replied. I popped up from the couch and tried to say goodbye to Lucky, but he was already leaping through the cat tunnels on the living room walls and chasing the electric mouse I installed inside. Thanks again for watching Lucky. There are fresh-baked kitty snacks in the treat bowl in the kitchen, and I stocked the fridge with all your favorite munchies and drinks. I said. You do realize you're the only pet parent in the world whose cat requires constant 24-7 supervision, right? Answered Ruby, turning on the TV and flipping to the Hallmark Channel. Maybe the world would be a better place if everyone provided babysitters for their pets 24-7. I countered. 
Marcus looked extremely handsome in a tux. But then again, he also looked fantastic in a t-shirt and jeans. The entire auditorium was packed. I had no idea a local beauty pageant could be so popular. But then again, having our very first local pageant was a huge deal for Clover Creek. The pageant was pretty much over. They announced a 30-minute intermission while the judges tallied up their scores. This was the perfect opportunity to introduce Joelle to all the contestants. Good luck, said Marcus. Don't worry, you totally got this. I gave him a thumbs up and we headed over to Wesley and Joelle in the corner of the auditorium. Are you having fun? I asked Joelle. Yes! I heard Brittany talking about the pageant non-stop, but I can't believe I'm really here, she said, squeezing Wesley's hand. Thanks so much for inviting me. I introduced both Joelle and Wesley to Marcus. Marcus talked briefly to Wesley over the speakerphone when we concocted this plan together, but he hadn't physically met him in person yet. They were both extremely handsome, but Marcus was barely a hair taller than Wesley. Not that it mattered. As long as a guy was my height or taller, I was happy. When will an app that helps tall girls find suitable dates that don't make them feel like giants be invented? It could turn out to be a very popular one. I tried dating shorter men before, but I just felt like Attila the Hun next to them. And I'd heard enough attack of the 50-foot woman jokes to last me a lifetime. I have one of your watches, said Joelle, holding it up. I almost blurted out that we already knew after tracking her GPS history. Yes, that's one of our earlier models, but I can upgrade the operating system manually for you and give it some newer features said Marcus, already reaching for a watch. Really? That would be amazing, said Joelle, eagerly taking it off. Marcus started doing his thing, tapping away at her screen. Once it was upgraded, he started explaining all the hidden features, which must have been new to Joelle, judging by all the oohs and ahs coming from her. Why don't we continue this tutorial later? I know the contestants would love to meet you now if you're free. They're super excited to know you are willing to step in and help them get ready for the off-season, I said. But mostly, we all just want to wrench a confession out of you. Thanks, Ava. This is great. It's my dream job. I so owe you for this, she said, throwing her arms around me in a big hug. Again, what happened to her dream job as a baker? Joelle got excited about whatever someone threw her way. Too bad Brittany made such a big show of bragging about how great her life was. She might still be alive if she hadn't jumped on Joelle's radar. We made our way backstage. Most of the audience was out in the lobby, grabbing drinks or snacks, so it was easy to navigate our way up the stairs and head toward the back. Even though I knew Joelle was guilty, I suddenly felt bad about proving it. It wasn't like Brittany was the greatest person ever and Joelle seemed genuinely nice. A little misguided in her Britney fascination, but still, not a bad person. Aside from being a murderer, that is. Hey everyone, this is my friend, Joelle, and I told her you're all looking for an off-season pageant coach, which she is, so maybe you could get to know her and figure out if she's a good match. I announced to everyone once Joelle and I were backstage. On cue, everyone pretended to be surprised and excited. I pointed to my Palmer Tech smartwatch, reminding everyone to start recording so we could get our confession on tape. When Joelle caught me flashing my watch to everyone, she gave me a weird look. You're surrounded by fellow Palmer Tech smartwatch buddies. We all have one, I said, holding mine up. Chapter 19 Ice-cold hands with dagger-like nails dug into my bicep and dragged me back. I couldn't decide which was worse, the nails or the strong odor of perfume that lingered everywhere Katerina went. You again? said Katerina. You're not on staff. You're not a contestant. Why are you always here? She made an excellent point. 
I guessed pageant groupies weren't really a thing. She was going to overhear their conversation anyway, so I decided to fess up or at least tell her as much as I could without Joelle figuring out what we were doing. I brought Joelle backstage to meet the girls during the intermission while the judges tabulate their scores. Joelle was Brittany's protege, and she was training her to become a pageant coach, just like you, I said. Ha, Brittany mentoring someone? All right, I've had enough laughs for one day. Get out, she said, snapping her fingers and pointing toward the door. But what about Joelle? I said, looking over at her on the other side of the stage. I will take care of her. Now you, shoo, she said, pushing me away with a decisive shove. I waved my arms as I tried to get Joelle's attention. Tonight's confession plan was a bust, but that was okay. Ruby was right. It was a total long shot that Joelle would simply confess on the spot. I had a final look at Katerina, beelining straight to Joelle's spot on the other side of the stage. Katerina caught me and gave me the stink eye, while again pointing towards the stairs and demanding my prompt departure. When I emerged back in the crowds with Marcus and Wesley, they looked excited until I gave them the thumbs-down signal. Marcus and Wesley both handed me drinks. I got you a wine spritzer, said Marcus. But I got you sparkling water since you don't drink alcohol, said Wesley, cutting in front of Marcus. That was odd. I never had men fight over me, if that's what this was. If I had a time machine, I'd stop time at once and make an emergency call to Ruby to ask her what to do. Men were always falling over themselves to get her attention. Wesley's correct. I haven't had any alcohol since I left San Diego. I said, taking sparkling water from Wesley, whose chest seemed to puff up at that moment. But thank you for the wine spritzer. That was very thoughtful of you. I placed a hand on Marcus's arm. I'm so sorry. Are you a recovering alcoholic? Asked Marcus. Oh, no, not at all, I said, but I could see how it might look like that. I never really liked the taste of it, and honestly, I don't even miss it. Sounds like a great reason to avoid it to me, he said. I relayed my failure to them due to Katarina's unexpected appearance and brought them up to speed before I changed the subject. While we waited for Joelle, we huddled together awkwardly, going through my favorite drinks. To his credit, Marcus didn't pout or glower over his alcohol faux pas. Instead, he seemed extra dedicated to finding out all my favorites. What did I love to drink when I first woke up in the morning? Hello, lavender vanilla lattes. What did I prefer to drink with my meals? Hello, sparkling water and seltzers. What did I prefer to drink with dessert? Hello, Mexican mocha lattes or salted vanilla caramel lattes. Or, let's be real, any flavored latte out there. And what did I enjoy drinking just for fun? Hello, root beer floats. Unfortunately, Wesley interjected that I also loved spirulina smoothies, since he had no clue that I was actually drinking a chocolate milkshake. About 15 minutes later, I told Marcus and Wesley every single liquid beverage I liked, loved, and hated, while waiting for Joelle to reappear. The auditorium lights flashed, as a signal for people to return to their seats. That's odd. Joelle should have been back by now, I said, looking for her at our seats. Katerina kicked me out so fast, my head was still spinning. I couldn't imagine Katerina would have let Joelle linger any longer than a millisecond. The Clover Creek High Auditorium was big, but not Metropolitan Opera House big. No one entered or exited the stage the entire time. She's probably back at her seats waiting for us, said Wesley. Where does her smartwatch say she is? I asked Marcus. Are you referring to the smartwatch I had her take off so I could upgrade it and show her the new features? He asked, holding it up. You both took off so fast I didn't get a chance to return it to her, so I just pocketed it for later. All right, 
We'll do this the old-fashioned way. You text her on her phone and wait for her back at our seats. I said to Wesley. You sneak backstage and look for her on either side. Maybe she found a way to stick with the contestants somehow. I said to Marcus. Although I was banned from the stage by Katerina, as the pageant sponsor, Marcus should have been allowed to move around freely wherever he wanted. I'll hit the ladies' rooms and see if I can find her there. We'll all reconvene here in ten minutes? They each nodded yes and took off. The main bathroom out in the lobby was empty after the lights flashed. All but a few people were heading back to their seats. There was another bathroom for performers, but it was backstage. However, I was willing to chance it, since I figured Katerina would be too busy getting the girls lined up to go back on stage to notice me. I was right. Everyone was gathered around Marcus, who seemed to be making some sort of good luck speech to all the girls. There was still no sign of Joelle. The performer bathroom was located in the far back. I dashed inside and checked both stalls, which were empty. There was red glitter all over everything, so I knew I was in the right place. That awful perfume hit me like a Mack truck. I backed out of the bathroom and noticed the perfume smell wafting up towards the rafters. I saw Katerina and Joelle arguing near the lights. Or rather, I smelled Katerina's obtrusive perfume and followed the scent and spotted them. Without thinking, I began to climb my way up to the top, fearing Joelle was going to finish off the last of her competition, Katerina, by pushing her off the planks above the stage to her imminent death. Stop! You don't want to do this! I hollered at Joelle, but I was still only halfway up. I had to pause and catch my breath. I wasn't afraid of heights, but not so keen on cardio, which was never a problem until times like this. Who knew the stage lights were so high up? I hit the record button on my smartwatch, which showed my heart rate going through the roof. Help me, said Joelle. Help her kill Katerina? I was already considered a potential suspect in enough murders, and so was she. Why would she kill another person just to become a pageant coach? She didn't even decide she wanted to be one until yesterday. It's not worth it. Just come down and we'll talk about it. I continued my ascent up the ladder, glad that I decided to wear ballet flats instead of heels. I can't, said Joelle. I get it. Pageant coaching looks fun, I said. I didn't think that at all. But clearly, people were willing to kill for it, so there must be something appealing about it. You got a little carried away with your new career choice. We'll explain it to the police. They'll understand. I had to stop talking. Climbing up a massive 30-foot ladder was hard enough without the added task of yelling. Don't come any closer, said Katerina. Seriously, lady? I was trying to help you. I could argue with her when I made it to the top. I was too winded to even respond. I popped my head up above the plank and saw Joelle with her hands in the air and Katerina holding a gun. You are so annoying. Why are you always here? I thought I told you to leave, said Katerina, pointing the gun at me. Wow, my amateur sleuth card would surely be revoked. I got this all wrong. What are you doing? I asked, but I already knew the answer. It was so obvious. It was Katerina's catchphrase. Eliminate the competition by any means necessary. Getting rid of the competition? Ah, oh, there's hope for you yet. Too bad you're both doomed to plummet to your deaths before you get the chance to improve yourselves, she said motioning for me to stand next to Joelle. Being next to Joelle felt like a California earthquake. There was a lot of shaking. I threaded my hand through hers and whispered, Don't worry, I have a plan. Even though it was a total lie, I figured something would come to me soon. We each clung to the ropes on either side of us. Why did they make these things so scary and dangerous? 
Someone should really call OSHA to complain about auditorium lighting setups. Jump, or I'll shoot, said Katerina. Joelle whimpered as she hid behind me. I don't want to die. You're not going to die. She can't shoot us. Isn't that right, Katerina? Everyone will hear the gunshot and then find you up here. I said... Katerina pulled out a silencer and screwed that on top of the gun nozzle. I didn't see that one coming. Seeing the defeated look on my face, Katerina explained, I'm new to this murder thing, but I'm a quick study. The strangling was sloppy and rushed. This is what the real professionals use. I don't want to be a pageant coach anymore, said Joelle. Maybe I can still join you at the bakery and learn how to make cupcakes. Unless, of course, you're dead. And I'm dead. No one's dying here today, I said to Joelle. I'll jump, but first I just need to know why you killed Brittany. If you thought she was a terrible contestant, then she'd obviously make an awful coach, too. Why kill her? You could never be a pageant contestant. You need to eliminate all threats, no matter how large or small. Brittany was simply a small threat that needed to be eliminated. She said, Now you know, so jump off and take the dumb blonde with you. But why did you poison the cupcakes if you intended to just strangle her? I asked. I wanted to make her and all the other pageant girls sick. I never meant to kill them just to teach them a lesson about not eating sugar. But when I saw she never meant to share them with everyone and planned to eat the entire box herself, I just snapped. She said, I didn't intend to kill her. I just wanted her out of the pageant because she was always so annoying. I couldn't blame her. Brittany did a good job of bringing out your inner killer. I hit the phone dial on my watch and called Marcus. Did you catch all that? Yep, and Wesley's already called the police. They're on their way, said Marcus. Katerina's face might have looked surprised, but I suspected she had some Botox done recently. What did you do? Chapter 20 Normally, the first thing Tessa did whenever she found me was to ask a crazy accusatory or embarrassing question, and then stick a mic in my face. But this time, Lucky beat her to it, and he started licking the mic. We were right outside the park, and had just finished our first puppy agility class. Lucky actually did much better than I thought he would. I'd been stalking the agility instructor woman for weeks now, trying to convince her to allow a cat into her class. 10,000 cupcakes later, she finally caved. I asked Tessa to meet me here right after agility class ended. In addition to the cupcake bribes, I also told her that I could get her business showcased on TV. Thanks to Tessa and her whole girl power kick she was adhering to lately. To her credit, Tessa did a great job mixing both enthusiasm and interest into her interview with the Agility Center staff. She really was great on camera, which I always struggled with, even when I wasn't being accused of murder. Frosted also got a nice bump for all the doggy cupcakes I brought for a post-class celebration. And all dogs are welcome at Frosted, asked Tessa, pushing the mic in front of me. This time, I didn't mind. Not at all. All cats and dogs are welcome at Frosted. We have plenty of dog-friendly cupcakes for your furry friends to enjoy whenever you visit, I said. It was like the dogs were doing all the work for me. Each one devoured their individual canine cupcakes in a single gulp. The cameraman fanned the lens over them. And that's a wrap, the cameraman announced, flicking the bright lights off. Thanks for covering the agility class on your news segment for this week, I said to Tessa after we left the Doggy Agility Training Center. As long as you come through on your end with the Britney Killer Discovery exclusive, she said. Not a problem, I said as I spotted Joelle heading our way. 
The Doggy Agility Training Center was right next to an outdoor food court, which was where I told Joelle to meet us. The warm spring weather had returned, and plenty of people were milling around on the outer part of the mall, which was normally closed during the winter. Whoa, was Brittany not really dead? Asked Tessa, seeing Joelle wave to me from the parking lot as she headed toward us. That's not Brittany, that's Joelle, another member of our girl posse. I said. Girl posse? Asked Tessa, looking confused. You know, the one where we help each other. I reminded her. Oh, right. Why is she part of our girl posse? Asked Tessa. She's going to give you an entire behind-the-scenes exclusive on Katerina's arrest and everything Brittany was up to with Wesley and Dried Gold. In exchange, you're going to mentor her and teach her how to become a news channel broadcaster like yourself, I said. After a couple light suggestions, Joelle was all over the idea of becoming a newscaster for her next career pursuit. I am, Tessa asked, sensing the competition. Well, you are the best, I said, appealing to her ego. Yes, I am, said Tessa, beaming with pride. After introducing Tessa and Joelle to each other, I gently set Lucky down on the ground and attached his harness and leash. All right, little guy, are we ready for our afternoon stroll through the mall? I asked him. Lucky tried to bark, but it came out more like a cute little kitty yelp. Tugging on the leash at full speed ahead, I had to follow. Hey, wait! Called out Tessa, running to catch up with us. I almost forgot. I found out the name of that anonymous Swiss boarding school donor, said Tessa. No way! Who was it? I asked. Despite giving her that as an assignment, I didn't actually expect her to follow up or find out anything. It was simply a ploy to get her out of my way so I could continue investigating Brittany's killer. I'm really embarrassed that I thought it was Ben. I just figured when he won the lottery that his guilt over leaving you at the altar would have been enough to make him want to help you out. But you were right. It came from a woman. Her name is Sakara Decker. I looked her up. She's your cousin that went missing back when you were in high school, right? It looks like she's still alive and clearly doing quite well. The donation to the school? Total over five million dollars! Chapter 21 I checked with the authorities on the Amber Alert that went out when Sakara first went missing in high school. They confirmed that it was still an open, unsolved case, but Wesley promised me that he'd look into it some more. I thought about calling my parents, but we had so many false or dead-end leads in the last decade, I didn't want to tell them until I had something concrete. I didn't want to get my hopes up either, so I did what I'd been doing for the last ten years since Sakara disappeared. I forged on. Initially, all life had ceased to exist for an entire year while we looked for her, but then we all sort of just made peace with it and moved on. We had to. Until a new lead came up, and then it was like we were holding our breasts all over again. I didn't want to go through that again. If something turned up, that would be the happiest day ever. But if something didn't, then I was okay with that too. With all of the drama from last night's pageant, they had to reschedule the announcement of the winner to tonight. Instead of going back to the auditorium, however... Marcus rented the Blueberry Bay County Fairgrounds near the wharf and hired the same fireworks team to put on a show right after the winner was announced. He also invited all the food vendors back, which was great for local businesses. He even included tons of kid-friendly entertainment. The best part was, I could wear a pair of jeans and a frosted t-shirt, not some fancy dress. The line for my cupcakes was out of control. My baking assistant and I couldn't keep up with all the orders. I had to call Ruby to come help us out in the truck just an hour after opening. Ten more minutes, and we'd be completely sold out of cupcake inventory, which was fine by me. 
I didn't want to miss the fireworks show the second time around. Was that the last of the cupcakes? Asked Ruby, opening up the mini fridge under the counter. Yep, sold out again. I said. If I could convince Marcus to host a county festival every weekend, I might finally be able to pay off most of my wedding debt. My baking assistant offered to close up the truck and drive it back to Frosted, where her car was parked. I thanked her and gave her a nice cash bonus before heading out to the lawn area. I leashed Lucky up this time to avoid any more red string mishaps. Marcus saved us a spot right near the stage before they announced the pageant winner. He jumped up and waved enthusiastically in our direction when he saw us. The stage was decked out in red glitter, so Lucky was totally mesmerized by it. Right next to the water, it was a choice location, and the loudspeakers were dispersed throughout the grassy area. Here, I said, handing him a small frosted bag. I brought you something. Thanks, but you didn't have to bring anything, he said. I could tell he was happy all the same to get a gift. It's nothing big, and it's really more from Lucky than from me, I said. He reached in and pulled out a gray t-shirt with the frosted logo and a big cupcake on it. He immediately stripped off his shirt, revealing his smooth skin and, of course, perfect-looking abs. Why wasn't I blessed with Palmer genetics? That was really what he should be selling, his amazing metabolism. It allowed him to look like he ate only spirulina smoothies, not cheese fries and hot dogs. He slipped it on and asked, Thanks, I love it. How do I look? Incredibly handsome, but you didn't have to put it on right now, I said. Of course I did. Lucky wants me to wear it. Don't you, little guy? Asked Marcus, leaning down to give him a little scratch under the chin. Lucky leapt up onto Marcus's shoulder, but I quickly pulled him off. Oh, no, you don't. That shirt has to replace the last one you shredded. Ruby and I settled onto the ultra-plush blanket that Marcus laid out for us while he went on stage to announce the winner of the pageant. You're so into him, said Ruby once we were alone. I am not. We're just friends, and that shirt was simply to replace the one that Lucky ruined, I said. And that's it? asked Ruby. Shh, I said, hushing Ruby. He's about to announce the winner. And the winner is Lila Palmer, my very talented and very beautiful sister, he said, clapping his applause with the audience. Ruby and I jumped up and started cheering for Lila. I had no idea if that were the right response, but I was more than excited that she had won, and so was Lucky. Even though he had no clue why we were so animated, he also started jumping up and down, even doing somersaults. Lila's pageant speech was nothing short of spectacular. She not only managed to eloquently thank her brother, the entire city of Clover Creek and all of Blueberry Bay, but she also praised me for helping to solve Brittany's murder. And you can get plenty of her artisan stuffed cupcakes from her bakery, Frosted, she said, pointing to her brother's t-shirt, since he was still standing on stage. But I have a confession. I lied to all of you during the interview portion of the pageants. Lila admitted to a room full of surprised gasps. Everyone appeared worried and upset. Even Marcus looked rattled. Lila looked at me and smiled while giving me the thumbs up. Someone very special told me that I should be honest, and I lied when I said I wanted to help my brother create the next generation of Palmer Tech smartwatches. The truth is, my brother is one of the smartest guys ever. He doesn't need me to help at all. But more importantly, I want to create my own gadgets. Makeup gadget doohickeys, she said. I was so proud of her for coming clean and telling Marcus what she really wanted to do, and only now remembered that I completely forgot to send her a whole list of new and better names for her inventions. And while I love everyone I met while participating in the pageants, this will be my last one. 
From now on, I'm dedicating all my time to creating everyday makeup appliances that help women look and feel their best, regardless of their dexterity and skills when it comes to artistic beauty applications. She said. The audience appeared confused, and who could blame them after that stellar company name of Gadget Doohickeys? I had no idea you wanted to create makeup devices, said Marcus, turning to face Lila. Yeah, it's been a secret pet project of mine. I have a ton of new devices that I plan to patent, she said, looking like she was holding her breath until Marcus responded. Then you can do it at Palmer Tech if you like. We can turn Palmer into anything you want. It doesn't just have to be smartwatches, he said. But only if that's what you'd like to do. You're also welcome to start your own company, which I will fully fund, and you can call it Doohickey Gadgets or whatever. No, I prefer to start a beauty division at Palmer Tech, she said. Done, said Marcus, opening his arms up to hug Lila, who jumped into them on cue. Gadget doohickeys? asked Ruby. That has you written all over it. Don't worry, I'm already making a list of alternative names for her brand. I said, thumbing some notes down on my phone. But now that she was officially putting her inventions under the brand of Palmer Tech, surely someone in their marketing team would spare her from using that terrible name. A text came through from Tessa. Can you get me an exclusive on the Gadget Doohickey product launch? Girl posse power! I texted her back. Sure, but we're changing the name. Tessa. To what? Me. I'll get back to you on that. The fireworks went off at that exact moment. Lila and Marcus joined us back on the lawn, where everyone got to experience a Hardison-style family bear hug. This has been Fudge and Felonies, Frosted Misfortunes Book 2, written by Lisa Seifert, narrated by Trista Shea. Copyright 2020 by Lisa Seifert. Production copyright by Lisa Seifert.